Enlightenment. The common sense of the 18th century, its grasp of the obvious facts of human suffering, and of the obvious demands of human nature, acted on the world like a bath of moral cleansing. Alfred North Whitehead Public lectures on language, mind, and human nature, I have been asked some mighty strange questions. Which is the best language? A clams and oysters conscious. When will I be able to upload my mind to the Internet? Is obesity a form of violence? But the most arresting question I have ever fielded followed a talk in which I explained the commonplace among scientists that mental life consists of patterns of activity in the tissues of the brain. A student in the audience raised her hand and asked me, Why should I live? The student's ingenuous tone made it clear that she was neither suicidal nor sarcastic but genuinely curious about how to find meaning and purpose if traditional religious beliefs about an immortal soul are undermined by our best science. My policy is that there is no such thing as a stupid question, and to the surprise of the student, the audience, and most of all myself, I mustered a reasonably creditable answer. What I recall saying, embellished, to be sure, by the distortions of memory in L'Esprit de l'Escalier, the wit of the staircase, went something like this. In the very act of asking that question, you are seeking reasons for your convictions, and so you are committed to reason as the means to discover and justify what is important to you. And there are so many reasons to live. As a sentient being, you have the potential to flourish. You can refine your faculty of reason itself by learning and debating. You can seek explanations of the natural world through science, and insight into the human condition through the arts and humanities. You can make the most of your capacity for pleasure and satisfaction, which allowed your ancestors to thrive and thereby allowed you to exist. You can appreciate the beauty and richness of the natural and cultural world. As the heir to billions of years of life perpetuating itself, you can perpetuate life in turn. You have been endowed with a sense of sympathy, the ability to like, love, respect, help, and show kindness, and you can enjoy the gift of mutual benevolence with friends, family, and colleagues. And because reason tells you that none of this is particular to you, you have the responsibility to provide to others what you expect for yourself. You can foster the welfare of other sentient beings by enhancing life, health, knowledge, freedom, abundance, safety, beauty, and peace. History shows that when we sympathize with others and apply our ingenuity to improving the human condition, we can make progress in doing so, and you can help to continue that progress. Explaining the meaning of life is not in the usual job description of a professor of cognitive science, and I would not have had the gall to take up her question if the answer depended on my arcane technical knowledge or my dubious personal wisdom. But I knew I was channeling a body of beliefs and values that had taken shape more than two centuries before me and that are now more relevant than ever, the ideals of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment principle that we can apply reason and sympathy to enhance human flourishing may seem obvious, trite, old-fashioned. I wrote this book because I have come to realize that it is not. More than ever, the ideals of reason, science, humanism, and progress need a wholehearted defense. We take its gifts for granted. Newborns who will live more than eight decades, markets overflowing with food, clean water that appears with a flick of a finger and waste that disappears with another, pills that erase a painful infection, sons who are not sent off to war, daughters who can walk the streets in safety, critics of the powerful who are not jailed or shot, the world's knowledge and culture available in a shirt pocket. But these are human accomplishments, not cosmic birthrights. In the memories of many readers of this book, and in the experience of those in less fortunate parts of the world, war, scarcity, disease, ignorance, and lethal menace are a natural part of existence. We know that countries can slide back into these primitive conditions, and so we ignore the achievements of the Enlightenment at our peril.
In the years since I took the young woman's question, I have often been reminded of the need to restate the ideals of the Enlightenment, also called humanism, the open society, and cosmopolitan or classical liberalism. It's not just that questions like hers regularly appear in my inbox. Dear Professor Pinker, what advice do you have for someone who has taken ideas in your books and science to heart, and sees himself as a collection of atoms? A machine with a limited scope of intelligence, sprung out of selfish genes, inhabiting space-time. It's also that an obliviousness to the scope of human progress can lead to symptoms that are worse than existential angst. It can make people cynical about the Enlightenment-inspired institutions that are securing this progress, such as liberal democracy and organizations of international cooperation, and turn them toward atavistic alternatives. The ideals of the Enlightenment are products of human reason, but they always struggle with other strands of human nature, loyalty to tribe, deference to authority, magical thinking, the blaming of misfortune on evildoers. The second decade of the 21st century has seen the rise of political movements that depict their countries as being pulled into a hellish dystopia by malign factions that can be resisted only by a strong leader who wrenches the country backward to make it, great again. These movements have been abetted by a narrative shared by many of their fiercest opponents, in which the institutions of modernity have failed and every aspect of life is in deepening crisis the two sides in macabre agreement that wrecking those institutions will make the world a better place. Harder to find is a positive vision that sees the world's problems against a background of progress that it seeks to build upon by solving those problems in their turn. If you still are unsure whether the ideals of Enlightenment humanism need a vigorous defense, consider the diagnosis of Shiraz Ma, an analyst of radical Islamist movements. The West is shy of its values, it doesn't speak up for classical liberalism, he says. We are unsure of them. They make us feel uneasy. Contrast that with the Islamic State, which, knows exactly what it stands for, a certainty that is, incredibly seductive, and he should know, having once been a regional director of the jihadist group Hesputahir.1. Reflecting on liberal ideals in 1960, not long after they had withstood their greatest trial, the economist Friedrich Hayek observed, if old truths are to retain their hold on men's minds, they must be restated in the language and concepts of successive generations, inadvertently proving his point with the expression men's minds. What at one time are their most effective expressions gradually become so worn with use that they cease to carry a definite meaning. The underlying ideas may be as valid as ever, but the words, even when they refer to problems that are still with us, no longer convey the same conviction. 2. This book is my attempt to restate the ideals of the Enlightenment in the language and concepts of the 21st century. I will first lay out a framework for understanding the human condition informed by modern science, who we are, where we came from, what our challenges are, and how we can meet them. The bulk of the book is devoted to defending those ideals in a distinctively 21st century way, with data. This evidence-based take on the Enlightenment project reveals that it was not a naive hope. The Enlightenment has worked, perhaps the greatest story seldom told. And because this triumph is so unsung, the underlying ideals of reason, science, and humanism are unappreciated as well. Far from being an insipid consensus, these ideals are treated by today's intellectuals with indifference, skepticism, and sometimes contempt. When properly appreciated, I will suggest, the ideals of the Enlightenment are in fact stirring, inspiring, noble, a reason to live. Chapter 1. Dare to Understand. What is Enlightenment? In a 1784 essay with that question as its title, Immanuel Kant answered that it consists of humankind's emergence from its self-incurred immaturity, its lazy and cowardly submission to the dogmas and formulas of religious or political authority. Point one. Enlightenment's motto, he proclaimed, is dare to understand. 
and its foundational demand is freedom of thought and speech. One age cannot conclude a pact that would prevent succeeding ages from extending their insights, increasing their knowledge, and purging their errors. That would be a crime against human nature, whose proper destiny lies precisely in such progress. 2. A 21st century statement of the same idea may be found in the physicist David Deutsch's Defense of Enlightenment, The Beginning of Infinity. Deutsch argues that if we dare to understand, progress is possible in all fields, scientific, political, and moral. Optimism, in the sense that I have advocated, is the theory that all failures, all evils, are due to insufficient knowledge. Problems are inevitable, because our knowledge will always be infinitely far from complete. Some problems are hard, but it is a mistake to confuse hard problems with problems unlikely to be solved. Problems are soluble, and each particular evil is a problem that can be solved. An optimistic civilization is open and not afraid to innovate, and is based on traditions of criticism. Its institutions keep improving, and the most important knowledge that they embody is knowledge of how to detect and eliminate errors. Point three. What is the Enlightenment? 4. There is no official answer, because the era named by Kant's essay was never demarcated by opening and closing ceremonies like the Olympics, nor are its tenets stipulated in an oath or creed. The Enlightenment is conventionally placed in the last two-thirds of the 18th century, though it flowed out of the scientific revolution and the age of reason in the 17th century and spilled into the heyday of classical liberalism of the first half of the 19th. Provoked by challenges to conventional wisdom from science and exploration, mindful of the bloodshed of recent wars of religion, and abetted by the easy movement of ideas and people, the thinkers of the Enlightenment sought a new understanding of the human condition. The era was a cornucopia of ideas, some of them contradictory, but four themes tie them together, reason, science, humanism, and progress. Foremost is reason. Reason is non-negotiable. As soon as you show up to discuss the question of what we should live for or any other question, as long as you insist that your answers, whatever they are, are reasonable or justified or true and that therefore other people ought to believe them too, then you have committed yourself to reason, and to holding your beliefs accountable to objective standards. Point five. If there's anything the Enlightenment thinkers had in common, it was an insistence that we energetically apply the standard of reason to understanding our world, and not fall back on generators of delusion like faith, dogma, revelation, authority, charisma, mysticism, divination, visions, gut feelings, or the hermeneutic parsing of sacred texts. It was reason that led most of the Enlightenment thinkers to repudiate a belief in an anthropomorphic God who took an interest in human affairs. Point six. The application of reason revealed that reports of miracles were dubious, that the authors of holy books were all too human, that natural events unfolded with no regard to human welfare, and that different cultures believed in mutually incompatible deities, none of them less likely than the others to be products of the imagination. As Montesquieu wrote, if triangles had a god they would give him three sides. For all that, not all of the Enlightenment thinkers were atheists. Some were deists as opposed to theists they thought that God set the universe in motion and then stepped back, allowing it to unfold according to the laws of nature. Others were pantheists, who used, God, as a synonym for the laws of nature. But few appealed to the law-giving, miracle-conjuring, sun-begetting God of Scripture. Many writers today confuse the Enlightenment endorsement of reason with the implausible claim that humans are perfectly rational agents. Nothing could be further from historical reality. Thinkers such as Kant, Baruch Spinoza, Thomas Hobbes, David Hume, and Adam Smith were inquisitive psychologists and all too aware of our irrational passions and foibles. They insisted that it was only by calling out the common sources of folly that we could hope to overcome them. The deliberate application of reason was necessary precisely because our common habits of thought are not particularly reasonable. 
That leads to the second ideal, science, the refining of reason to understand the world. The scientific revolution was revolutionary in a way that is hard to appreciate today, now that its discoveries have become second nature to most of us. The historian David Wooden reminds us of the understanding of an educated Englishman on the eve of the revolution in 1600. He believes witches can summon up storms that sink ships at sea. He believes in werewolves, although there happen not to be any in England, he knows they are to be found in Belgium. He believes Circe really did turn Odysseus's crew into pigs. He believes mice are spontaneously generated in piles of straw. He believes in contemporary magicians. He has seen a unicorn's horn, but not a unicorn. He believes that a murdered body will bleed in the presence of the murderer. He believes that there is an ointment which, if rubbed on a dagger which has caused a wound, will cure the wound. He believes that the shape, color and texture of a plant can be a clue to how it will work as a medicine because God designed nature to be interpreted by mankind. He believes that it is possible to turn base metal into gold, although he doubts that anyone knows how to do it. He believes that nature abhors a vacuum. He believes the rainbow is a sign from God and that comets portend evil. He believes that dreams predict the future, if we know how to interpret them. He believes, of course, that the earth stands still and the sun and stars turn around the earth once every 24 hours. Point seven. A century and a third later, an educated descendant of this Englishman would believe none of these things. It was an escape not just from ignorance but from terror. The sociologist Robert Scott notes that in the Middle Ages, the belief that an external force controlled daily life contributed to a kind of collective paranoia. Rainstorms, thunder, lightning, wind gusts, solar or lunar eclipses, cold snaps, heat waves, dry spells, and earthquakes alike were considered signs and signals of God's displeasure. As a result, the hobgoblins of fear inhabited every realm of life. The sea became a satanic realm, and forests were populated with beasts of prey, ogres, witches, demons, and very real thieves and cutthroats. After dark, too, the world was filled with omens portending dangers of every sort, comets, meteors, shooting stars, lunar eclipses, the howls of wild animals. Point eight. To the Enlightenment thinkers the escape from ignorance and superstition showed how mistaken our conventional wisdom could be, and how the methods of science, skepticism, fallibilism, open debate, and empirical testing are a paradigm of how to achieve reliable knowledge. That knowledge includes an understanding of ourselves. The need for a science of man was a theme that tied together Enlightenment thinkers who disagreed about much else including Montesquieu, Hume, Smith, Kant, Nicolas de Condorcet, Denis Diderot, Jean-Baptiste d'Alembert, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Jean-Baptiste Vico. Their belief that there was such a thing as universal human nature, and that it could be studied scientifically, made them precocious practitioners of sciences that would be named only centuries later. Point nine. They were cognitive neuroscientists, who tried to explain thought, emotion, and psychopathology in terms of physical mechanisms of the brain. They were revolutionary psychologists, who sought to characterize life in a state of nature and to identify the animal instincts that are infused into our bosoms. They were social psychologists, who wrote of the moral sentiments that draw us together, the selfish passions that divide us, and the foibles of short-sightedness that confound our best laid plans. And they were cultural anthropologists, who mined the accounts of travelers and explorers for data both on human universals and on the diversity of customs and mores across the world's cultures. The idea of a universal human nature brings us to a third theme, humanism. The thinkers of the Age of Reason and the Enlightenment saw an urgent need for a secular foundation for morality, because they were haunted by a historical memory of centuries of religious carnage, the Crusades, the Inquisition, witch hunts, the European wars of religion. 
They laid that foundation in what we now call humanism, which privileges the well-being of individual men, women, and children over the glory of the tribe, race, nation, or religion. It is individuals, not groups, who are sentient, who feel pleasure and pain, fulfillment and anguish. Whether it is framed as the goal of providing the greatest happiness for the greatest number or as a categorical imperative to treat people as ends rather than means, it was the universal capacity of a person to suffer and flourish, they said, that called on our moral concern. Fortunately, human nature prepares us to answer that call. That is because we are endowed with the sentiment of sympathy, which they also called benevolence, pity, and commiseration. Given that we are equipped with the capacity to sympathize with others, nothing can prevent the circle of sympathy from expanding from the family and tribe to embrace all of humankind, particularly as reason goads us into realizing that there can be nothing uniquely deserving about ourselves or any of the groups to which we belong. Point one zero. We are forced into cosmopolitanism, accepting our citizenship in the world. Point one one. A humanistic sensibility impelled the Enlightenment thinkers to condemn not just religious violence but also the secular cruelties of their age, including slavery, despotism, executions for frivolous offenses such as shoplifting and poaching, and sadistic punishments such as flogging, amputation, impalement, disembowelment, breaking on the wheel, and burning at the stake. The Enlightenment is sometimes called the Humanitarian Revolution, because it led to the abolition of barbaric practices that had been commonplace across civilizations for millennia. Point one two. If the abolition of slavery and cruel punishment is not progress, nothing is, which brings us to the fourth Enlightenment ideal. With our understanding of the world advanced by science and our circle of sympathy expanded through reason and cosmopolitanism, humanity could make intellectual and moral progress. It need not resign itself to the miseries and irrationalities of the present, nor try to turn back the clock to a lost golden age. The Enlightenment belief in progress should not be confused with the 19th century romantic belief in mystical forces, laws, dialectics, struggles, unfoldings, destinies, ages of man, and evolutionary forces that propel mankind ever upward toward utopia. Point one three. As Kant's remark about, increasing knowledge and purging errors, indicates, it was more prosaic, a combination of reason and humanism. If we keep track of how our laws and manners are doing, think up ways to improve them, try them out, and keep the ones that make people better off, we can gradually make the world a better place. Science itself creeps forward through this cycle of theory and experiment, and its ceaseless headway, superimposed on local setbacks and reversals, shows how progress is possible. The ideal of progress also should not be confused with the 20th century movement to re-engineer society for the convenience of technocrats and planners, which the political scientist James Scott calls authoritarian high modernism. Point one four. The movement denied the existence of human nature, with its messy needs for beauty, nature, tradition, and social intimacy. Point one five. Starting from a clean tablecloth. The modernists designed urban renewal projects that replaced vibrant neighborhoods with freeways, high-rises, windswept plazas, and brutalist architecture. Mankind will be reborn, they theorized, and live in an ordered relation to the whole. 16. Though these developments were sometimes linked to the word progress, the usage was ironic. Progress, unguided by humanism is not progress. Rather than trying to shape human nature, the Enlightenment hope for progress was concentrated on human institutions. Human-made systems like governments, laws, schools, markets, and international bodies are a natural target for the application of reason to human betterment. In this way of thinking, government is not a divine fiat to reign, a synonym for society, or an avatar of the national, religious, or racial soul. 
it is a human invention, tacitly agreed to in a social contract, designed to enhance the welfare of citizens by coordinating their behavior and discouraging selfish acts that may be tempting to every individual but leave everyone worse off. As the most famous product of the Enlightenment, the Declaration of Independence, put it, in order to secure the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, governments are instituted among people, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Among the powers of government is meeting out punishment, and writers such as Montesquieu, Cesare Beccaria, and the American founders thought afresh about the government's license to harm its citizens. 17. Criminal punishment, they argued, is not a mandate to implement cosmic justice but part of an incentive structure that discourages antisocial acts without causing more suffering than it deters. The reason the punishment should fit the crime, for example, is not to balance some mystical scale of justice but to ensure that a wrongdoer stops at a minor crime rather than escalating to a more harmful one. Cruel punishments, whether or not they are in some sense, deserved, are no more effective at deterring harm than moderate but surer punishments, and they desensitize spectators and brutalize the society that implements them. The Enlightenment also saw the first rational analysis of prosperity. Its starting point was not how wealth is distributed but the prior question of how wealth comes to exist in the first place. 18. Smith, building on French, Dutch, and Scottish influences, noted that an abundance of useful stuff cannot be conjured into existence by a farmer or craftsman working in isolation. It depends on a network of specialists, each of whom learns how to make something as efficiently as possible, and who combine and exchange the fruits of their ingenuity, skill, and labor. In a famous example, Smith calculated that a pin maker working alone could make at most one pin a day, whereas in a workshop in which one man draws out the wire, another straights it, a third cuts it, a fourth points it, a fifth grinds it at the top for receiving the head, each could make almost 5,000. Specialization works only in a market that allows the specialists to exchange their goods and services, and Smith explained that economic activity was a form of mutually beneficial cooperation, a positive sum game. In today's lingo, each gets back something that is more valuable to him than what he gives up. Through voluntary exchange, people benefit others by benefiting themselves, as he wrote, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. We address ourselves, not to their humanity but to their self-love. Smith was not saying that people are ruthlessly selfish, or that they ought to be, he was one of history's keenest commentators on human sympathy. He only said that in a market, whatever tendency people have to care for their families and themselves can work to the good of all. Exchange can make an entire society not just richer but nicer, because in an effective market it is cheaper to buy things than to steal them, and other people are more valuable to you alive than dead. As the economist Ludwig von Mises put it centuries later, if the tailor goes to war against the baker, he must henceforth bake his own bread. Many Enlightenment thinkers, including Montesquieu, Kant, Voltaire, Diderot, and the Abbey de Saint-Pierre, endorsed the ideal of du commerce, gentle commerce. 19. The American founders, George Washington, James Madison, and especially Alexander Hamilton, designed the institutions of the young nation to nurture it. This brings us to another Enlightenment ideal, peace. War was so common in history that it was natural to see it as a permanent part of the human condition and to think peace could come only in a messianic age. But now war was no longer thought of as a divine punishment to be endured and deplored, or a glorious contest to be won and celebrated, but a practical problem to be mitigated and someday solved. In Perpetual Peace, Kant laid out measures that would discourage leaders from dragging their countries into war. 20. 
Together with international commerce, he recommended representative republics what we would call democracies mutual transparency, norms against conquest and internal interference, freedom of travel and immigration, and a federation of states that would adjudicate disputes between them. For all the prescience of the founders, framers, and philosophers, this is not a book of enlightened oratory. The Enlightenment thinkers were men and women of their age, the 18th century. Some were racists, sexists, anti-Semites, slaveholders, or dualists. Some of the questions they worried about are almost incomprehensible to us, and they came up with plenty of daffy ideas together with the brilliant ones. More to the point, they were born too soon to appreciate some of the keystones of our modern understanding of reality. They of all people would have been the first to concede this. If you extol reason, then what matters is the integrity of the thoughts, not the personalities of the thinkers. And if you're committed to progress, you can't very well claim to have it all figured out. It takes nothing away from the Enlightenment thinkers to identify some critical ideas about the human condition and the nature of progress that we know and they didn't. Those ideas, I suggest, are entropy, evolution, and information. Chapter 2. Entro. Evo. Info. The first keystone in understanding the human condition is the concept of entropy or disorder, which emerged from 19th century physics and was defined in its current form by the physicist Ludwig Boltzmann. Point 1. The second law of thermodynamics states that in an isolated system, one that is not interacting with its environment, entropy never decreases. The first law is that energy is conserved. The third, that a temperature of absolute zero is unreachable. Closed systems inexorably become less structured, less organized, less able to accomplish interesting and useful outcomes, until they slide into an equilibrium of gray, tepid, homogeneous monotony and stay there. In its original formulation the second law referred to the process in which usable energy in the form of a difference in temperature between two bodies is inevitably dissipated as heat flows from the warmer to the cooler body. As the musical team Flanders and Swan explained, you can't pass heat from the cooler to the hotter, try it if you like but you far better not a. A cup of coffee, unless it is placed on a plugged-in hot plate, will cool down. When the coal feeding a steam engine is used up, the cooled off steam on one side of the piston can no longer budge it because the warmed up steam and air on the other side are pushing back just as hard. Once it was appreciated that heat is not an invisible fluid but the energy in moving molecules, and that a difference in temperature between two bodies consists of a difference in the average speeds of those molecules, a more general, statistical version of the concept of entropy in the second law took shape. Now order could be characterized in terms of the set of all microscopically distinct states of a system, in the original example involving heat, the possible speeds and positions of all the molecules in the two bodies. Of all these states, the ones that we find useful from a bird's eye view, such as one body being hotter than the other, which translates into the average speed of the molecules in one body being higher than the average speed in the other, make up a tiny fraction of the possibilities, while all the disorderly or useless states the ones without a temperature difference, in which the average speeds in the two bodies are the same, make up the vast majority. It follows that any perturbation of the system, whether it is a random jiggling of its parts or a whack from the outside, will, by the laws of probability, nudge the system toward disorder or uselessness, not because nature strives for disorder, but because there are so many more ways of being disorderly than of being orderly. If you walk away from a sandcastle, it won't be there tomorrow, because as the wind, waves, seagulls, and small children push the grains of sand around, they're more likely to arrange them into one of the vast number of configurations that don't look like a castle than into the tiny few that do. I'll often refer to the statistical version of the second law, which does not apply specifically to temperature differences evening out but to order dissipating, as the law of entropy. How is entropy relevant to human affairs? 
Life and happiness depend on an infinitesimal sliver of orderly arrangements a matter amid the astronomical number of possibilities. Our bodies are improbable assemblies of molecules, and they maintain that order with the help of other improbabilities. The few substances that can nourish us, the few materials in the few shapes that can clothe us, shelter us, and move things around to our liking. Far more of the arrangements of matter found on Earth are of no worldly use to us, so when things change without a human agent directing the change, they are likely to change for the worse. The law of entropy is widely acknowledged in everyday life in sayings such as, things fall apart, rust never sleeps, shit happens, whatever can go wrong will go wrong, and, from the Texas lawmaker Sam Rayburn, any jackass can kick down a barn, but it takes a carpenter to build one. Scientists appreciate that the second law is far more than an explanation of everyday nuisances. It is a foundation of our understanding of the universe and our place in it. In 1928 the physicist Arthur Eddington wrote, The law that entropy always increases, holds, I think, the supreme position among the laws of nature. If someone points out to you that your pet theory of the universe is in disagreement with Maxwell's equations, then so much the worse for Maxwell's equations. If it is found to be contradicted by observation, well, these experimentalists do bungle things sometimes. But if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. Point two. In his famous 1959 Reed Lectures, published as The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution, the scientist and novelist C. P. Snow commented on the disdain for science among educated Britons in his day. A good many times I have been present at gatherings of people who, by the standards of the traditional culture, are thought highly educated and who have with considerable gusto been expressing their incredulity at the illiteracy of scientists. Once or twice I have been provoked and have asked the company how many of them could describe the second law of thermodynamics. The response was cold, it was also negative. Yet I was asking something which is about the scientific equivalent of, have you read a work of Shakespeare's? 3. The chemist Peter Atkins alludes to the second law in the title of his book Four Laws That Drive the Universe. And closer to home, the evolutionary psychologists John Tooby, Leda Cosmides, and Clark Barrett entitled a recent paper on the foundations of the science of mind, the second law of thermodynamics is the first law of psychology. 4. Why the awe for the second law? From an Olympian vantage point, it defines the fate of the universe and the ultimate purpose of life, mind, and human striving to deploy energy and knowledge to fight back the tide of entropy and carve out refuges of beneficial order. From a terrestrial vantage point we can get more specific, but before we get to familiar ground I need to lay out the other two foundational ideas. At first glance the law of entropy would seem to allow for only a discouraging history and a depressing future. The universe began in a state of low entropy, the Big Bang, with its unfathomably dense concentration of energy. From there everything went downhill, with the universe dispersing, as it will continue to do, into a thin gruel of particles evenly and sparsely distributed through space. In reality, of course, the universe as we find it is not a featureless gruel. It is enlivened with galaxies, planets, mountains, clouds, snowflakes, and an efflorescence of flora and fauna, including us. One reason the cosmos is filled with so much interesting stuff is a set of processes called self-organization, which allow circumscribed zones of order to emerge. Point five. When energy is poured into a system, and the system dissipates that energy in its slide toward entropy, it can become poised in an orderly, indeed beautiful, configuration, a sphere, spiral, starburst, whirlpool, ripple, crystal, or fractal. The fact that we find these configurations beautiful, incidentally, suggests that beauty may not just be in the eye of the beholder. 
The brain's aesthetic response may be a receptiveness to the counterentropic patterns that can spring forth from nature. But there is another kind of orderliness in nature that also must be explained. Not the elegant symmetries and rhythms in the physical world, but the functional design in the living world. Living things are made of organs that have heterogeneous parts which are uncannily shaped and arranged to do things that keep the organism alive that is, continuing to absorb energy to resist entropy. Point six. The customary illustration of biological design is the eye, but I will make the point with my second favorite sense organ. The human ear contains an elastic drumhead that vibrates in response to the slightest puff of air, a bony lever that multiplies the vibration's force, a piston that impresses the vibration into the fluid in a long tunnel conveniently coiled to fit inside the wall of the skull, a tapering membrane that runs down the length of the tunnel and physically separates the waveform into its harmonics, and an array of cells with tiny hairs that are flexed back and forth by the vibrating membrane, sending a train of electrical impulses to the brain. It is impossible to explain why these membranes and bones and fluids and hairs are arranged in that improbable way without noting that this configuration allows the brain to register patterned sound. Even the fleshy outer ear, asymmetrical top to bottom and front to back, and crinkled with ridges and valleys, is shaped in a way that sculpts the incoming sound to inform the brain whether the soundmaker is above or below, in front or behind. Organisms are replete with improbable configurations of flesh-like eyes, ears, hearts, and stomachs which cry out for an explanation. Before Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace provided one in 1859, it was reasonable to think they were the handiwork of a divine designer. One of the reasons, I suspect, that so many Enlightenment thinkers were deists rather than outright atheists. Darwin and Wallace made the designer unnecessary. Once self-organizing processes of physics and chemistry gave rise to a configuration of matter that could replicate itself, the copies would make copies, which would make copies of the copies, and so on, in an exponential explosion. The replicating systems would compete for the material to make their copies and the energy to power the replication. Since no copying process is perfect, the law of entropy sees to that. Errors will crop up, and though most of these mutations will degrade the replicator, entropy again, occasionally dumb luck will throw one up that's more effective at replicating, and its descendants will swamp the competition. As copying errors that enhance stability and replication accumulate over the generations, the replicating system, we call it an organism, will appear to have been engineered for survival and reproduction in the future, though it only preserved the copying errors that led to survival and reproduction in the past. Creationists commonly doctor the second law of thermodynamics to claim that biological evolution, an increase in order over time, is physically impossible. The part of the law they omit is, in a closed system. Organisms are open systems. They capture energy from the sun, food, or ocean vents to carve out temporary pockets of order in their bodies and nests while they dump heat and waste into the environment increasing disorder in the world as a whole. Organisms' use of energy to maintain their integrity against the press of entropy is a modern explanation of the principle of Canatus, effort or striving, which Spinoza defined as, the endeavor to persist and flourish in one's own being, and which was a foundation of several Enlightenment-era theories of life and mind. Point seven. The ironclad requirement to suck energy out of the environment leads to one of the tragedies of living things. While plants bask in solar energy, and a few creatures of the briny deep soak up the chemical broth spewing from cracks in the ocean floor, animals are born exploiters. They live off the hard-won energy stored in the bodies of plants and other animals by eating them. So do the viruses, bacteria, and other pathogens and parasites that gnaw at bodies from the inside. With the exception of fruit, everything we call, food, is the body part or energy store of some other organism, which would just as soon keep that treasure for itself. Nature is a war, and much of what captures our attention in the natural world is an arms race. 
Prey animals protect themselves with shells, spines, claws, horns, venom, camouflage, flight, or self-defense. Plants have thorns, rinds, bark, and irritants and poisons saturating their tissues. Animals evolve weapons to penetrate these defenses. Carnivores have speed, talons, and eagle-eyed vision, while herbivores have grinding teeth and livers that detoxify natural poisons. And now we come to the third keystone, information point eight. Information may be thought of as a reduction in entropy, as the ingredient that distinguishes an orderly, structured system from the vast set of random, useless ones. Point nine. Imagine pages of random characters tapped out by a monkey at a typewriter, or a stretch of white noise from a radio tuned between channels, or a screenful of confetti from a corrupted computer file. Each of these objects can take trillions of different forms, each as boring as the next. But now suppose that the devices are controlled by a signal that arranges the characters or sound waves or pixels into a pattern that correlates with something in the world. The Declaration of Independence, the opening bars of Hey Jude, a cat wearing sunglasses. We say that the signal transmits information about the declaration or the song or the cat.10. The information contained in a pattern depends on how coarsely or finely grained our view of the world is. If we cared about the exact sequence of characters in the monkey's output, or the precise difference between one burst of noise and another, or the particular pattern of pixels in just one of the haphazard displays, then we would have to say that each of the items contains the same amount of information as the others. Indeed, the interesting ones would contain less information, because when you look at one part, like the letter Q, you can guess others, such as the following letter, U, without needing the signal. But more commonly we lump together the immense majority of random-looking configurations as equivalently boring, and distinguish them all from the tiny few that correlate with something else. From that vantage point the cat photo contains more information than the confetti of pixels, because it takes a garrulous message to pinpoint a rare orderly configuration out of the vast number of equivalently disorderly ones. To say that the universe is orderly rather than random is to say that it contains information in this sense. Some physicists enshrine information as one of the basic constituents of the universe, together with matter and energy.11. Information is what gets accumulated in a genome in the course of evolution. The sequence of bases in a DNA molecule correlates with the sequence of amino acids in the proteins that make up the organism's body, and they got that sequence by structuring the organism's ancestors, reducing their entropy, into the improbable configurations that allowed them to capture energy and grow and reproduce. Information is also collected by an animal's nervous system as it lives its life. When the ear transduces sound into neural firings, the two physical processes, vibrating air and diffusing ions, could not be more different. But thanks to the correlation between them, the pattern of neural activity in the animal's brain carries information about the sound in the world. From there the information can switch from electrical to chemical and back as it crosses the synapses connecting one neuron to the next. Through all these physical transformations, the information is preserved. A momentous discovery of 20th century theoretical neuroscience is that networks of neurons not only can preserve information but can transform it in ways that allow us to explain how brains can be intelligent. Two input neurons can be connected to an output neuron in such a way that their firing patterns correspond to logical relations such as an, OR, and NOT, or to a statistical decision that depends on the weight of the incoming evidence. That gives neural networks the power to engage in information processing or computation. Given a large enough network built out of these logical and statistical circuits, and with billions of neurons, the brain has room for plenty, a brain can compute complex functions, the prerequisite for intelligence. 
it can transform the information about the world that it receives from the sense organs in a way that mirrors the laws governing that world, which in turn allows it to make useful inferences and predictions. Point one two. Internal representations that reliably correlate with states of the world, and that participate in inferences that tend to derive true implications from true premises, may be called knowledge. Point one three. We say that someone knows what a robin is if she thinks the thought, robin, whenever she sees one, and if she can infer that it is a kind of bird which appears in the spring and pulls worms out of the ground. Getting back to evolution, a brain wired by information in the genome to perform computations on information coming in from the senses could organize the animal's behavior in a way that allowed it to capture energy and resist entropy. It could, for example, implement the rule, if it squeaks, chase it, if it barks, flee from it. Chasing and fleeing, though, are not just sequences of muscle contractions, they are goal-directed. Chasing may consist of running or climbing or leaping or ambushing, depending on the circumstances, as long as it increases the chances of snagging the prey, fleeing may include hiding or freezing or zigzagging. And that brings up another momentous 20th century idea, sometimes called cybernetics, feedback, or control. The idea explains how a physical system can appear to be teleological, that is, directed by purposes or goals. All it needs are a way of sensing the state of itself and its environment, a representation of a goal state, what it, wants, what it's, trying for, an ability to compute the difference between the current state and the goal state, and a repertoire of actions that are tagged with their typical effects. If the system is wired so that it triggers actions that typically reduce the difference between the current state and the goal state, it can be said to pursue goals, and when the world is sufficiently predictable, it will attain them. The principle was discovered by natural selection in the form of homeostasis, as when our bodies regulate their temperature by shivering and sweating. When it was discovered by humans, it was engineered into analog systems like thermostats and cruise control and then into digital systems like chess playing programs and autonomous robots. The principles of information, computation, and control bridge the chasm between the physical world of cause and effect and the mental world of knowledge, intelligence, and purpose. It's not just a rhetorical aspiration to say that ideas can change the world, it's a fact about the physical makeup of brains. The Enlightenment thinkers had an inkling that thought could consist of patterns in matter. They likened ideas to impressions in wax, vibrations in a string, or waves from a boat. And some, like Hobbes, proposed that, reasoning is but reckoning, in the original sense of reckoning is calculation. But before the concepts of information and computation were elucidated, it was reasonable for someone to be a mind-body dualist and attribute mental life to an immaterial soul, just as before the concept of evolution was elucidated, it was reasonable to be a creationist and attribute design in nature to a cosmic designer. That's another reason, I suspect, that so many Enlightenment thinkers were deists. Of course it's natural to think twice about whether your cell phone truly knows a favorite number, your GPS is really figuring out the best route home, and your Roomba is genuinely trying to clean the floor. But as information processing systems become more sophisticated, as their representations of the world become richer, their goals are arranged into hierarchies of subgoals within subgoals, and their actions for attaining the goals become more diverse and less predictable, it starts to look like hominid chauvinism to insist that they don't. Whether information and computation explain consciousness, in addition to knowledge, intelligence, and purpose, is a question I'll turn to in the final chapter. Human intelligence remains the benchmark for the artificial kind, and what makes Homo sapiens an unusual species is that our ancestors invested in bigger brains that collected more information about the world, reasoned about it in more sophisticated ways, and deployed a greater variety of actions to achieve their goals. 
They specialized in the cognitive niche, also called the cultural niche and the hunter-gatherer niche.14. This embraced a suite of new adaptations, including the ability to manipulate mental models of the world and predict what would happen if one tried out new things. The ability to cooperate with others, which allowed teams of people to accomplish what a single person could not, and language, which allowed them to coordinate their actions and to pull the fruits of their experience into the collections of skills and norms we call cultures. Point one five. These investments allowed early hominids to defeat the defenses of a wide range of plants and animals and reap the bounty in energy, which stoked their expanding brains, giving them still more know-how and access to still more energy. A well-studied contemporary hunter-gatherer tribe, the Hadza of Tanzania, who live in the ecosystem where modern humans first evolved and probably preserve much of their lifestyle, extract 3,000 calories daily per person from more than 880 species. 16. They create this menu through ingenious and uniquely human ways of foraging, such as felling large animals with poison-tipped arrows, smoking bees out of their hives to steal their honey, and enhancing the nutritional value of meat and tubers by cooking them. Energy channeled by knowledge is the elixir with which we stave off entropy, and advances in energy capture are advances in human destiny. The invention of farming around 10,000 years ago multiplied the availability of calories from cultivated plants and domesticated animals, freed a portion of the population from the demands of hunting and gathering, and eventually gave them the luxury of writing, thinking, and accumulating their ideas. Around 500 BCE, in what the philosopher Carl Jaspers called the Axial Age, several widely separated cultures pivoted from systems of ritual and sacrifice that merely warded off misfortune to systems of philosophical and religious belief that promoted selflessness and promised spiritual transcendence. 17. Taoism and Confucianism in China Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism in India, Zoroastrianism in Persia, Second Temple Judaism in Judea, and classical Greek philosophy and drama emerged within a few centuries of one another. Confucius, Buddha, Pythagoras, Aeschylus, and the last of the Hebrew prophets walked the earth at the same time. Recently an interdisciplinary team of scholars identified a common cause. 18. It was not an aura of spirituality that descended on the planet but something more prosaic, energy capture. The Axial Age was when agricultural and economic advances provided a burst of energy, upwards of 20,000 calories per person per day in food, fodder, fuel, and raw materials. This surge allowed the civilizations to afford larger cities, a scholarly and priestly class, and a reorientation of their priorities from short-term survival to long-term harmony. As Bertolt Brecht put it millennia later, grub first, then ethics.19. When the Industrial Revolution released a gusher of usable energy from coal, oil, and falling water, it launched a great escape from poverty, disease, hunger, illiteracy, and premature death, first in the West and increasingly in the rest of the world, as we shall see in chapters 5 to 8. And the next leap in human welfare, the end of extreme poverty and spread of abundance, with all its moral benefits, will depend on technological advances that provide energy at an acceptable economic and environmental cost to the entire world. Chapter 10. Entro. Evo. Info. These concepts define the narrative of human progress, the tragedy we were born into, and our means for eking out a better existence. The first piece of wisdom they offer is that misfortune may be no one's fault. A major breakthrough of the scientific revolution, perhaps its biggest breakthrough, was to refute the intuition that the universe is saturated with purpose. In this primitive but ubiquitous understanding, everything happens for a reason, so when bad things happen, accidents, disease, famine, poverty, some agent must have wanted them to happen. If a person can be fingered for the misfortune, he can be punished or squeezed for damages. 
If no individual can be singled out, one might blame the merest ethnic or religious minority, who can be lynched or massacred in a pogrom. If no mortal can plausibly be indicted, one might cast about for witches, who may be burned or drowned. Failing that, one points to sadistic gods, who cannot be punished but can be placated with prayers and sacrifices. And then there are disembodied forces like karma, fate, spiritual messages, cosmic justice, and other guarantors of the intuition that, everything happens for a reason. Galileo, Newton, and Laplace replaced this cosmic morality play with a clockwork universe in which events are caused by conditions in the present, not goals for the future. Point to zero. People have goals, of course, but projecting goals onto the workings of nature is an illusion. Things can happen without anyone taking into account their effects on human happiness. This insight of the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment was deepened by the discovery of entropy. Not only does the universe not care about our desires, but in the natural course of events it will appear to thwart them, because there are so many more ways for things to go wrong than for them to go right. Houses burn down, ships sink, battles are lost for want of a horseshoe nail. Awareness of the indifference of the universe was deepened still further by an understanding of evolution. Predators, parasites, and pathogens are constantly trying to eat us, and pests and spoilage organisms try to eat our stuff. It may make us miserable, but that's not their problem. Poverty, too, needs no explanation. In a world governed by entropy and evolution, it is the default state of humankind. Matter does not arrange itself into shelter or clothing, and living things do everything they can to avoid becoming our food. As Adam Smith pointed out, what needs to be explained is wealth. Yet even today, when few people believe that accidents or diseases have perpetrators, discussions of poverty consist mostly of arguments about whom to blame for it. None of this is to say that the natural world is free of malevolence. On the contrary, evolution guarantees there will be plenty of it. Natural selection consists of competition among genes to be represented in the next generation, and the organisms we see today are descendants of those that edged out their rivals in contests for mates, food, and dominance. This does not mean that all creatures are always rapacious. Modern evolutionary theory explains how selfish genes can give rise to unselfish organisms but the generosity is measured. Unlike the cells in a body or the individuals in a colonial organism, humans are genetically unique, each having accumulated and recombined a different set of mutations that arose over generations of entropy-prone replication in their lineage. Genetic individuality gives us our different tastes and needs, and it also sets the stage for strife. Families, couples, friends, allies, and societies seethe with partial conflicts of interest, which are played out in tension, arguments, and sometimes violence. Another implication of the law of entropy is that a complex system like an organism can easily be disabled, because its functioning depends on so many improbable conditions being satisfied at once. A rock against the head, a hand around the neck, a well-aimed poisoned arrow, and the competition is neutralized. More tempting still to a language-using organism, a threat of violence may be used to coerce a rival, opening the door to oppression and exploitation. Evolution left us with another burden. Our cognitive, emotional, and moral faculties are adapted to individual survival and reproduction in an archaic environment, not to universal thriving in a modern one. To appreciate this burden, one doesn't have to believe that we are cavemen out of time, only that evolution, with its speed limit measured in generations, could not possibly have adapted our brains to modern technology and institutions. Humans today rely on cognitive faculties that worked well enough in traditional societies, but which we now see are infested with bugs. People are by nature illiterate and enumerate, quantifying the world by, one, two, many, and by rough guesstimates point to one.
They understand physical things as having hidden essences that obey the laws of sympathetic magic or voodoo rather than physics and biology. Objects can reach across time and space to affect things that resemble them or that had been in contact with them in the past. Remember the beliefs of pre scientific revolution Englishman. Point two two. They think that words and thoughts can impinge on the physical world in prayers and curses. They underestimate the prevalence of coincidence. Point two three. They generalize from paltry samples, namely their own experience, and they reason by stereotype, projecting the typical traits of a group onto any individual that belongs to it. They infer causation from correlation. They think holistically, in black and white, and physically, treating abstract networks as concrete stuff. They are not so much intuitive scientists as intuitive lawyers and politicians, marshalling evidence that confirms their convictions while dismissing evidence that contradicts them. Point two four. They overestimate their own knowledge, understanding, rectitude, competence, and luck. Point two five. The human moral sense can also work at cross purposes to our well-being. Point two six. People demonize those they disagree with, attributing differences of opinion to stupidity and dishonesty. For every misfortune, they seek a scapegoat. They see morality as a source of grounds for condemning rivals and mobilizing indignation against them. Point two seven. The grounds for condemnation may consist in the defendants having harmed others, but they also may consist in their having flouted custom, questioned authority, undermined tribal solidarity, or engaged in unclean sexual or dietary practices. People see violence as moral, not immoral. Across the world and throughout history, more people have been murdered to meet out justice than to satisfy greed. Point two eight. But we're not all bad. Human cognition comes with two features that give it the means to transcend its limitations. Point two nine. The first is abstraction. People can co-opt their concept of an object at a place and use it to conceptualize an entity in a circumstance, as when we take the pattern of a thought like the deer ran from the pond to the hill and apply it to the child went from sick to well. They can co-opt the concept of an agent exerting physical force and use it to conceptualize other kinds of causation, as when we extend the image in "She forced the door to open" to "She forced Lisa to join her" or "She forced herself to be polite." These formulas give people the means to think about a variable with a value and about a cause and its effect, just the conceptual machinery one needs to frame theories and laws. They can do this not just with the elements of thought, but with more complex assemblies, allowing them to think in metaphors and analogies. Heat is a fluid. A message is a container. A society is a family. Obligations are bonds. The second step ladder of cognition is its combinatorial, recursive power. The mind can entertain an explosive variety of ideas by assembling basic concepts like thing, place, path, actor. Cause and goal into propositions, and it can entertain not only propositions but propositions about the propositions and propositions about the propositions about the propositions. Bodies contain humors. Illness is an imbalance in the humors that bodies contain. I no longer believe the theory that illness is an imbalance in the humors that bodies contain. Thanks to language, ideas are not just abstracted and combined inside the head of a single thinker, but can be pulled across a community of thinkers. Thomas Jefferson explained the power of language with the help of an analogy: He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. Thirty. The potency of language as the original sharing app was multiplied by the invention of writing, and again in later epochs by the printing press, the spread of literacy, and electronic media. The networks of communicating thinkers expanded over time as populations grew, mixed, and became concentrated in cities. And the availability of energy beyond the minimum needed for survival gave more of them the luxury to think and talk. When large and connected communities take shape, they can come up with ways of organizing their affairs that work to their members' mutual advantage.
Though everyone wants to be right, as soon as people start to air their incompatible views it becomes clear that not everyone can be right about everything. Also, the desire to be right can collide with a second desire, to know the truth, which is uppermost in the minds of bystanders to an argument who are not invested in which side wins. Communities can thereby come up with rules that allow true beliefs to emerge from the rough and tumble of argument, such as that you have to provide reasons for your beliefs, you're allowed to point out flaws in the beliefs of others, and you're not allowed to forcibly shut people up who disagree with you. Add in the rule that you should allow the world to show you whether your beliefs are true or false, and we can call the rules science. With the right rules, a community of less than fully rational thinkers can cultivate rational thoughts. Point three one. The wisdom of crowds can also elevate our moral sentiments. When a wide enough circle of people confer on how best to treat each other, the conversation is bound to go in certain directions. If my starting offer is, I get to rob, beat, enslave, and kill you and your kind, but you don't get to rob, beat, enslave, or kill me or my kind, I can't expect you to agree to the deal or third parties to ratify it, because there's no good reason that I should get privileges just because I'm me and you're not point three two. Nor are we likely to agree to the deal, I get to rob, beat, enslave, and kill you and your kind, and you get to rob, beat, enslave, and kill me and my kind, despite its symmetry, because the advantages either of us might get in harming the other are massively outweighed by the disadvantages we would suffer in being harmed, yet another implication of the law of entropy, harms are easier to inflict and have larger effects than benefits. We'd be wiser to negotiate a social contract that puts us in a positive sum game, neither gets to harm the other, and both are encouraged to help the other. So for all the flaws in human nature, it contains the seeds of its own improvement, as long as it comes up with norms and institutions that channel parochial interests into universal benefits. Among those norms of free speech, nonviolence, cooperation, cosmopolitanism, human rights, and an acknowledgement of human fallibility, and among the institutions of science, education, media, democratic government, international organizations, and markets. Not coincidentally, these were the major brainchildren of the Enlightenment. Chapter 3. Counter Ian Light and Me and T.S. Who could be against reason, science, humanism, or progress? The words seem saccharine, the ideals unexceptionable. They define the missions of all the institutions of modernity, schools, hospitals, charities, news agencies, democratic governments, international organizations. Do these ideals really need a defense? They absolutely do. Since the 1960s, trust in the institutions of modernity has sunk, and the second decade of the 21st century saw the rise of populist movements that blatantly repudiate the ideals of the Enlightenment. Point one. They are tribalist rather than cosmopolitan, authoritarian rather than democratic, contemptuous of experts rather than respectful of knowledge, and nostalgic for an idyllic past rather than hopeful for a better future. But these reactions are by no means confined to 21st century political populism, a movement we will examine in chapters 20 and 23. Far from sprouting from the grassroots or channeling the anger of know nothings, the disdain for reason, science, humanism, and progress has a long pedigree in elite intellectual and artistic culture. Indeed, a common criticism of the Enlightenment project that it is a Western invention, unsuited to the world in all its diversity, is doubly wrong-headed. For one thing, all ideas have to come from somewhere, and their birthplace has no bearing on their merit. Though many Enlightenment ideas were articulated in their clearest and most influential form in 18th century Europe and America, they are rooted in reason and human nature, so any reasoning human can engage with them. That's why Enlightenment ideals have been articulated in non-Western civilizations at many times in history. Point two. 
but my main reaction to the claim that the Enlightenment is the guiding ideal of the West is, if only. The Enlightenment was swiftly followed by a counter-Enlightenment, and the West has been divided ever since. Point three. No sooner did people step into the light than they were advised that darkness wasn't so bad after all, that they should stop daring to understand so much, that dogmas and formulas deserved another chance, and that human nature's destiny was not progress but decline. The Romantic movement pushed back particularly hard against Enlightenment ideals. Rousseau, Johann Herder, Friedrich Schelling, and others denied that reason could be separated from emotion, that individuals could be considered apart from their culture, that people should provide reasons for their acts, that values applied across times and places, and that peace and prosperity were desirable ends. A human is a part of an organic whole, a culture, race, nation, religion, spirit, or historical force, and people should creatively channel the transcendent unity of which they are a part. Heroic struggle, not the solving of problems, is the greatest good, and violence is inherent to nature and cannot be stifled without draining life of its vitality. There are but three groups worthy of respect, wrote Charles Baudelaire, the priest, the warrior, and the poet. To know, to kill, and to create. It sounds mad, but in the 21st century those counter-enlightenment ideals continue to be found across a surprising range of elite cultural and intellectual movements. The notion that we should apply our collective reason to enhance flourishing and reduce suffering is considered crass, naive, wimpy, square. Let me introduce some of the popular alternatives to reason, science, humanism, and progress. They will reappear in other chapters, and in part three of the book I will confront them head on. The most obvious is religious faith. To take something on faith means to believe it without good reason, so by definition of faith in the existence of supernatural entities clashes with reason. Religions also commonly clash with humanism whenever they elevate some moral good above the well-being of humans, such as accepting a divine savior, ratifying a sacred narrative, enforcing rituals and taboos, proselytizing other people to do the same, and punishing or demonizing those who don't. Religions can also clash with humanism by valuing souls above lives, which is not as uplifting as it sounds. Belief in an afterlife implies that health and happiness are not such a big deal, because life on earth is an infinitesimal portion of one's existence, that coercing people into accepting salvation is doing them a favor, and that martyrdom may be the best thing that can ever happen to you. As for incompatibilities with science, these are the stuff of legend and current events, from Galileo and the Scopes monkey trial to stem cell research and climate change. A second counter-enlightenment idea is that people are the expendable cells of a superorganism, a clan, tribe, ethnic group, religion, race, class, or nation, and that the supreme good is the glory of this collectivity rather than the well-being of the people who make it up. An obvious example is nationalism, in which the superorganism is the nation-state, namely an ethnic group with a government. We see the clash between nationalism and humanism in morbid patriotic slogans like, Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, sweet and right it is to die for your country, and, happy those who with a glowing faith in one embrace clasp death and victory. 4. Even John F. Kennedy's less gruesome, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, makes the tension clear. Nationalism should not be confused with civic values, public spirit, social responsibility, or cultural pride. Humans are a social species, and the well-being of every individual depends on patterns of cooperation and harmony that span a community. When a nation is conceived as a tacit social contract among people sharing a territory, like a condominium association, it is an essential means for advancing its members' flourishing. And of course it is genuinely admirable for one individual to sacrifice his or her interests for those of many individuals. 
It's quite another thing when a person is forced to make the supreme sacrifice for the benefit of a charismatic leader, a square of cloth, or colors on a map. Nor is it sweet and right to clasp death in order to prevent a province from seceding, expand a sphere of influence, or carry out an irredentist crusade. Religion and nationalism are signature causes of political conservatism, and continue to affect the fate of billions of people in the countries under their influence. Many left-wing colleagues who learned that I was writing a book on reason and humanism egged me on, relishing the prospect of an arsenal of talking points against the right. But not so long ago the left was sympathetic to nationalism when it was fused with Marxist liberation movements. And many on the left encourage identity politicians and social justice warriors who downplay individual rights in favor of equalizing the standing of races, classes, and genders, which they see as being pitted in zero-sum competition. Religion, too, has defenders on both halves of the political spectrum. Even writers who are unwilling to defend the literal content of religious beliefs may be fiercely defensive of religion and hostile to the idea that science and reason have anything to say about morality. Most of them show little awareness that humanism even exists. Point 5. Defenders of the faith insist that religion has the exclusive franchise for questions about what matters. Or that even if we sophisticated people don't need religion to be moral, the teeming masses do. Or that even if everyone would be better off without religious faith, it's pointless to talk about the place of religion in the world because religion is a part of human nature, which is why, mocking Enlightenment hopes, it is more tenacious than ever. In Chapter 23 I will examine all these claims. The left tends to be sympathetic to yet another movement that subordinates human interests to a transcendent entity, the ecosystem. The Romantic Green movement sees the human capture of energy not as a way of resisting entropy and enhancing human flourishing but as a heinous crime against nature, which will exact a dreadful justice in the form of resource wars, poisoned air and water, and civilization and in climate change. Our only salvation is to repent, repudiate technology and economic growth, and revert to a simpler and more natural way of life. Of course, no informed person can deny that damage to natural systems from human activity has been harmful and that if we do nothing about it the damage could become catastrophic. The question is whether a complex, technologically advanced society is condemned to do nothing about it. In Chapter 10 we will explore a humanistic environmentalism, more enlightened than romantic, sometimes called ecomodernism or ecopragmatism. Point six. Left-wing and right-wing political ideologies have themselves become secular religions, providing people with a community of like-minded brethren, a catechism of sacred beliefs, a well-populated demonology, and a beatific confidence in the righteousness of their cause. In Chapter 21 we will see how political ideology undermines reason and science. Point 7. It scrambles people's judgment, inflames a primitive tribal mindset, and distracts them from a sounder understanding of how to improve the world. Our greatest enemies are ultimately not our political adversaries but entropy evolution in the form of pestilence and the flaws in human nature, and most of all ignorance, a shortfall of knowledge of how best to solve our problems. The last two counter-enlightenment movements cut across the left-right divide. For almost two centuries, a diverse array of writers has proclaimed that modern civilization, far from enjoying progress, is in steady decline and on the verge of collapse. In the idea of decline in Western history, the historian Arthur Herman recounts two centuries of doomsayers who have sounded the alarm of racial, cultural, political, or ecological degeneration. Apparently the world has been coming to an end for a long time indeed. Point 8. One form of declinism bemoans our Promethean dabbling with technology. Point 9. By wresting fire from the gods, we have only given our species the means to end its own existence, if not by poisoning our environment then by loosing nuclear weapons, nanotechnology, 
cyberterror, bioterror, artificial intelligence, and other existential threats upon the world. Chapter 19. And even if our technological civilization manages to escape outright annihilation, it is spiraling into a dystopia of violence and injustice, a brave new world of terrorism, drones, sweatshops, gangs, trafficking, refugees, inequality, cyberbullying, sexual assault, and hate crimes. Another variety of declinism agonizes about the opposite problem, not that modernity has made life too harsh and dangerous, but that it has made it too pleasant and safe. According to these critics, health, peace, and prosperity are bourgeois diversions from what truly matters in life. In serving up these philistine pleasures, technological capitalism has only damned people to an atomized, conformist, consumerist, materialist, other-directed, rootless, routinized, soul-deadening wilderness. In this absurd existence, people suffer from alienation, angst, enemy, apathy, bad faith, ennui, malaise, and nausea. They are hollow men eating their naked lunches in the wasteland while waiting for Godot. 10. I will examine these claims in chapters 17 and 18. In the twilight of a decadent, Degenerate civilization, true liberation is to be found not in sterile rationality or effete humanism but in an authentic, heroic, holistic, organic, sacred, vital being in itself and will to power. In case you are wondering what this sacred heroism consists of, Friedrich Nietzsche, who coined the term will to power, recommends the aristocratic violence of the Blondhuden beasts, and the samurai, Vikings, and Homeric heroes. Hard, cold, terrible, without feelings and without conscience, crushing everything, and bespattering everything with blood. 11. We'll take a closer look at this morality in the final chapter. Herman notes that the intellectuals and artists who foresee the collapse of civilization react to their prophecy in either of two ways. The historical pessimists dread the downfall but lament that we are powerless to stop it. The cultural pessimists welcome it with a ghoulish schadenfreude. Modernity is so bankrupt, they say, that it cannot be improved, only transcended. Out of the rubble of its collapse, a new order will emerge that can only be superior. A final alternative to Enlightenment humanism condemns its embrace of science. Following C. P. Snow, we can call it the second culture, the worldview of many literary intellectuals and cultural critics, as distinguished from the first culture of science. Point one two. Snow decried the Iron Curtain between the two cultures and called for a greater integration of science into intellectual life. It was not just that science was in its intellectual depth, complexity, and articulation, the most beautiful and wonderful collective work of the mind of man. 13. Knowledge of science, he argued, was a moral imperative, because it could alleviate suffering on a global scale by curing disease, feeding the hungry, saving the lives of infants and mothers, and allowing women to control their fertility. Though Snow's argument seems prescient today, a famous 1962 rebuttal from the literary critic F. R. Levis was so vituperative that the spectator had to ask Snow to promise not to sue for libel before they would publish it. Point one four. After noting Snow's utter lack of intellectual distinction and embarrassing vulgarity of style, Levis scoffed at a value system in which, standard of living, is the ultimate criterion, its raising an ultimate aim. 15. As an alternative, he suggested that, in coming to terms with great literature we discover what at bottom we really believe. What for? What ultimately for? What do men live by? The questions work and tell at what I can only call a religious depth of thought and feeling. Anyone whose depth of thought and feeling extends to a woman in a poor country who has lived to see her newborn because her standard of living has risen, and then multiplied that sympathy by a few hundred million, might wonder why, 
coming to terms with great literature, is morally superior to raising the standard of living as a criterion for what at bottom we really believe, or why the two should be seen as alternatives in the first place. As we shall see in Chapter 22, Levis's outlook may be found in a wide swath of the second culture today. Many intellectuals and critics express a disdain for science as anything but a fix for mundane problems. They write as if the consumption of elite art is the ultimate moral good. Their methodology for seeking the truth consists not in framing hypotheses and citing evidence but in issuing pronouncements that draw on their breadth of erudition and lifetime habits of reading. Intellectual magazines regularly denounce Shiantism, the intrusion of science into the territory of the humanities such as politics and the arts. In many colleges and universities, science is presented not as the pursuit of true explanations but as just another narrative or myth. Science is commonly blamed for racism, imperialism, world wars, and the Holocaust. And it is accused of robbing life of its enchantment and stripping humans of freedom and dignity. Enlightenment humanism, then, is far from being a crowd pleaser. The idea that the ultimate good is to use knowledge to enhance human welfare leaves people cold. Deep explanations of the universe, the planet, life, the brain. Unless they use magic, we don't want to believe them. Saving the lives of billions, eradicating disease, feeding the hungry. Bo Ring. People extending their compassion to all of humankind. Not good enough. We want the laws of physics to care about us. Longevity, health, understanding, beauty, freedom, love. There's got to be more to life than that. But it's the idea of progress that sticks most firmly in the craw. Even people who think it is a fine idea in theory to use knowledge to improve well-being insist it will never work in practice. If you had to choose a moment in history to be born, and you did not know ahead of time who you would be, you didn't know whether you were going to be born into a wealthy family or a poor family, what country you'd be born in, whether you were going to be a man or a woman, if you had to choose blindly what moment you'd want to be born, you'd choose now. Barack Obama, 2016. Chapter 4. P-R-O-G-R-E-S-S-O-P-H-O-B-I-A. Intellectuals hate progress. Intellectuals who call themselves progressive really hate progress. It's not that they hate the fruits of progress. Mind you, most pundits, critics, and their being pensant readers use computers rather than quills and inkwells, and they prefer to have their surgery with anesthesia rather than without it. It's the idea of progress that rankles the chattering class, the enlightenment belief that by understanding the world we can improve the human condition. An entire lexicon of abuse has grown up to express their scorn. If you think knowledge can help solve problems, then you have a blind faith and a quasi-religious belief in the outmoded superstition and false promise of the myth of the onward march of inevitable progress. You are a cheerleader for vulgar American can doism with the rah rah spirit of boardroom ideology, Silicon Valley, and the chamber of commerce. You are a practitioner of Whig history, a naive optimist, a Pollyanna, and of course a Pangloss, a modern-day version of the philosopher in Voltaire's Candide who asserts that, all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Professor Pangloss, as it happens, is what we would now call a pessimist. A modern optimist believes that the world can be much, much better than it is today. Voltaire was satirizing not the Enlightenment hope for progress but its opposite, the religious rationalization for suffering called theodicy, according to which God had no choice but to allow epidemics and massacres because a world without them is metaphysically impossible. Epithets aside, the idea that the world is better than it was and can get better still fell out of fashion among the clerisy long ago. 
In the idea of decline in Western history, Arthur Herman shows that prophets are doom of the all-stars of the liberal arts curriculum, including Mietje, Arthur Schopenhauer, Martin Heidegger, Theodore Adorno, Walter Benjamin, Herbert Marcuse, Jean-Paul Sartre, Franz Fanon, Michel Foucault, Edward Said, Cornel West, and a chorus of eco-pessimists. Point one. Surveying the intellectual landscape at the end of the 20th century, Herman lamented a grand recessional, of, the luminous exponents, of Enlightenment humanism, the ones who believe that, since people generate conflicts and problems in society, they can also resolve them. In History of the Idea of Progress the sociologist Robert Nisbet agreed, the skepticism regarding Western progress that was once confined to a very small number of intellectuals in the 19th century has grown and spread to not merely the large majority of intellectuals in this final quarter of the century, but to many millions of other people in the West. 2. Yes. It's not just those who intellectualize for a living who think the world is going to hell in a handcart. It's ordinary people when they switch into intellectualizing mode. Psychologists have long known that people tend to see their own lives through rose-colored glasses. They think they're less likely than the average person to become the victim of a divorce, layoff, accident, illness, or crime. But change the question from the people's lives to their society, and they transform from Pollyanna to Eeyore. Public opinion researchers call it the optimism gap. Point three. For more than two decades, through good times and bad, when Europeans were asked by pollsters whether their own economic situation would get better or worse in the coming year, more of them said it would get better, but when they were asked about their country's economic situation, more of them said it would get worse. Point four. A large majority of Britons think that immigration, teen pregnancy, litter, Unemployment, crime, vandalism, and drugs are a problem in the United Kingdom as a whole, while few think they are problems in their area. Point five. Environmental quality, too, is judged in most nations to be worse in the nation than in the community, and worse in the world than in the nation. Point six. In almost every year from 1992 through 2015, an era in which the rate of violent crime plummeted, a majority of Americans told pollsters that crime was rising. Point seven. In late 2015, large majorities in 11 developed countries said that, the world is getting worse, and in most of the last 40 years a solid majority of Americans have said that the country is, heading in the wrong direction. Eight. Are they right? Is pessimism correct? Could the state of the world, like the stripes on a barbershop pole, keep sinking lower and lower? It's easy to see why people feel that way. Every day the news is filled with stories about war, terrorism, crime, pollution, inequality, drug abuse, and oppression. And it's not just the headlines we're talking about, it's the op-eds and long-form stories as well. Magazine covers warn us of coming anarchies, plagues, epidemics, collapses, and so many, crises, farm, health, retirement, welfare, energy, deficit, that copywriters have had to escalate to the redundant, serious crisis. Whether or not the world really is getting worse, the nature of news will interact with the nature of cognition to make us think that it is. News is about things that happen, not things that don't happen. We never see a journalist saying to the camera, I'm reporting live from a country where a war has not broken out, or a city that has not been bombed, or a school that has not been shot up. As long as bad things have not vanished from the face of the earth, there will always be enough incidents to fill the news, especially when billions of smartphones turn most of the world's population into crime reporters and war correspondents. And among the things that do happen, the positive and negative ones unfold on different timelines. The news, far from being a first draft of history, is closer to play-by-play -play sports commentary. It focuses on discrete events, generally those that took place since the last edition in earlier times, the day before, now, seconds before, point nine. 
Bad things can happen quickly, but good things aren't built in a day, and as they unfold, they will be out of sync with the news cycle. The peace researcher John Galtung pointed out that if a newspaper came out once every 50 years, it would not report half a century of celebrity gossip and political scandals. It would report momentous global changes such as the increase in life expectancy.10. The nature of news is likely to distort people's view of the world because of a mental bug that the psychologists Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman called the availability heuristic. People estimate the probability of an event or the frequency of a kind of thing by the ease with which instances come to mind. Point one one. In many walks of life, this is a serviceable rule of thumb. Frequent events leave stronger memory traces, so stronger memories generally indicate more frequent events. You really are on solid ground in guessing that pigeons are more common in cities than orioles, even though you're drawing on your memory of encountering them rather than on a bird's census. But whenever a memory turns up high in the result list of the mind's search engine for reasons other than frequency, because it is recent, vivid, gory, distinctive, or upsetting, people will overestimate how likely it is in the world. Which are more numerous in the English language, words that begin with K or words with K in the third position? Most people say the former. In fact, there are three times as many words with K in the third position ankle, ask, awkward, bake, cake, make, take. But we retrieve words by their initial sounds, so keep, kind, kill, kid, and king are likelier to pop into mind on demand. Availability errors are a common source of folly in human reasoning. First-year medical students interpret every rash as a symptom of an exotic disease, and vacationers stay out of the water after they have read about a shark attack or if they have just seen Jaws.12. Plane crashes always make the news, but car crashes, which kill far more people, almost never do. Not surprisingly, many people have a fear of flying, but almost no one has a fear of driving. People rank tornadoes which kill about 50 Americans a year as a more common cause of death than asthma which kills more than 4,000 Americans a year presumably because tornadoes make for better television. It's easy to see how the availability heuristic, stoked by the news policy, if it bleeds, it leads, could induce a sense of gloom about the state of the world. Media scholars who tally news stories of different kinds, or present editors with a menu of possible stories and see which they pick and how they display them, have confirmed that the gatekeepers prefer negative to positive coverage, holding the event's constant point one three. That in turn provides an easy formula for pessimists on the editorial page. Make a list of all the worst things that are happening anywhere on the planet that week, and you have an impressive sounding case that civilization has never faced greater peril. The consequences of negative news are themselves negative. Far from being better informed, heavy news watchers can become miscalibrated. They worry more about crime even when rates are falling, and sometimes they part company with reality altogether. A 2016 poll found that a large majority of Americans follow news about ISIS closely, and 77% agreed that, Islamic militants operating in Syria and Iraq pose a serious threat to the existence or survival of the United States, a belief that is nothing short of delusional.14. Consumers of negative news, not surprisingly, become glum. A recent literature review cited, misperception of risk, anxiety, lower mood levels, learned helplessness, contempt and hostility towards others, desensitization, and in some cases, complete avoidance of the news. 15. And they become fatalistic, saying things like, why should I vote? It's not gonna help. Or, I could donate money, but there's just gonna be another kid who's starving next week. 16. Seeing how journalistic habits and cognitive biases bring out the worst in each other, how can we soundly appraise the state of the world? The answer is to count. How many people are victims of violence is a proportion of the number of people alive. 
How many are sick? How many starving? How many poor? How many oppressed? How many illiterate? How many unhappy? And are those numbers going up or down? A quantitative mindset, despite its nerdy aura, is in fact the morally enlightened one, because it treats every human life as having equal value rather than privileging the people who are closest to us or most photogenic. And it holds out the hope that we might identify the causes of suffering and thereby know which measures are most likely to reduce it. That was the goal of my 2011 book The Better Angels of Our Nature, which presented a hundred graphs and maps showing how violence and the conditions that foster it have declined over the course of history. To emphasize that the declines took place at different times and had different causes, I gave them names. The pacification process was a five-fold reduction in the rate of death from tribal raiding and feuding, the consequence of effective states exerting control over a territory. The civilizing process was a forty-fold reduction in homicide and other violent crimes which followed upon the entrenchment of the rule of law and norms of self-control in early modern Europe. The Humanitarian Revolution is another name for the Enlightenment era abolition of slavery, religious persecution, and cruel punishments. The Long Peace is the historian's term for the decline of great power and interstate war after World War II. Following the end of the Cold War, the world has enjoyed a new peace with fewer civil wars, genocides, and autocracies. And since the 1950s the world has been swept by a cascade of rights revolutions, civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, children's rights, and animal rights. Few of these declines are contested among experts who are familiar with the numbers. Historical criminologists, for example, agree that homicide plummeted after the Middle Ages, and it's a commonplace among international relations scholars that major wars tapered off after 1945. But they come as a surprise to most people in the wider world. Point one seven. I had thought that a parade of graphs with time on the horizontal axis, body counts or other measures of violence on the vertical, and a line that meandered from the top left to the bottom right would cure audiences of the availability bias and persuade them that at least in this sphere of well-being the world has made progress. But I learned from their questions and objections that resistance to the idea of progress runs deeper than statistical fallacies. Of course, any dataset is an imperfect reflection of reality, so it is legitimate to question how accurate and representative the numbers truly are. But the objections revealed not just a skepticism about the data but also an unpreparedness for the possibility that the human condition has improved. Many people lack the conceptual tools to ascertain whether progress has taken place or not. The very idea that things can get better just doesn't compute. Here are stylized versions of dialogues I have often had with questioners. So violence has declined linearly since the beginning of history. Awesome. No. Not, linearly, it would be astonishing if any measure of human behavior with all its vicissitudes ticked downward by a constant amount per unit of time, decade after decade and century after century. And not monotonically, either, which is probably what the questioners have in mind, that would mean that it always decreased or stayed the same, never increased. Real historical curves have wiggles, upticks, spikes, and sometimes sickening lurches. Examples include the two world wars, a boom in crime in Western countries from the mid 1960s to the early 1990s, and a bulge of civil wars in the developing world following decolonization in the 1960s and 1970s. Progress consists of trends in violence on which these fluctuations are superimposed a downward swoop or drift, a return from a temporary swelling to a low baseline. Progress cannot always be monotonic because solutions to problems create new problems. Point one eight. But progress can resume when the new problems are solved in their turn. By the way, the non-monotonicity of social data provides an easy formula for news outlets to accentuate the negative. If you ignore all the years in which an indicator of some problem declines, and report every uptick since, 
After all, it's news. Readers will come away with the impression that life is getting worse and worse even as it gets better and better. In the first six months of 2016 the New York Times pulled this trick three times, with figures for suicide, longevity, and automobile fatalities. Well, if levels of violence don't always go down, that means they're cyclical, so even if they're low right now it's only a matter of time before they go back up. No. Changes over time may be statistical, with unpredictable fluctuations, without being cyclical, namely oscillating like a pendulum between two extremes. That is, even if a reversal is possible at any time, that does not mean it becomes more likely as time passes. Many investors have lost their shirts betting on a misnamed business cycle that in fact consists of unpredictable swings. Progress can take place when the reversals in a positive trend become less frequent, become less severe, or, in some cases, cease altogether. How can you say that violence has decreased? Didn't you read about the school shooting, or terrorist bombing, or artillery shelling, or soccer riot, or barroom stabbing, in the news this morning? A decline is not the same thing as a disappearance. The statement, x greater than y, is different from the statement, y equals zero. Something can decrease a lot without vanishing altogether. That means that the level of violence today is completely irrelevant to the question of whether violence has declined over the course of history. The only way to answer that question is to compare the level of violence now with the level of violence in the past. And whenever you look at the level of violence in the past, you find a lot of it, even if it isn't as fresh in memory as the morning's headlines. All your fancy statistics about violence going down don't mean anything if you're one of the victims. True. But they do mean that you're less likely to be a victim. For that reason they mean the world to the millions of people who are not victims but would have been if rates of violence had stayed the same. So you're saying that we can all sit back and relax, that violence will just take care of itself. Illogical. Captain. If you see that a pile of laundry has gone down, it does not mean the clothes washed themselves, it means someone washed the clothes. If a type of violence has gone down, then some change in the social, cultural, or material milieu has caused it to go down. If the conditions persist, violence could remain low or decline even further, if they don't, it won't. That makes it important to find out what the causes are, so we can try to intensify them and apply them more widely to ensure that the decline of violence continues. To say that violence has gone down is to be naive, sentimental, idealistic, romantic, starry-eyed, whiggish, utopian, a Pollyanna, a Pangloss. No. To look at data showing that violence has gone down and say, violence has gone down, is to describe a fact. To look at data showing that violence has gone down and say, violence has gone up, is to be delusional. To ignore data on violence and say, violence has gone up, is to be a know-nothing. As for accusations of romanticism, I can reply with some confidence. I am also the author of the staunchly unromantic, anti-utopian The Blank Slate, The Modern Denial of Human Nature, in which I argued that human beings are fitted by evolution with a number of destructive motives such as greed, lust, dominance, vengeance, and self-deception. But I believe that people are also fitted with a sense of sympathy, an ability to reflect on their predicament, and faculties to think up and share new ideas, the better angels of our nature, in the words of Abraham Lincoln. Only by looking at the facts can we tell to what extent our better angels have prevailed over our inner demons at a given time and place. How can you predict that violence will keep going down? Your theory could be refuted by a war breaking out tomorrow. A statement that some measure of violence has gone down is not a theory, but an observation of a fact. And yes, the fact that a measure has changed over time is not the same as a prediction that it will continue to change in that way at all times forever.
As the investment ads are required to say, past performance is no guarantee of future results. In that case, what good are all those graphs and analyses? Isn't a scientific theory supposed to make testable predictions? A scientific theory makes predictions in experiments in which the causal influences are controlled. No theory can make a prediction about the world at large, with its 7 billion people spreading viral ideas in global networks and interacting with chaotic cycles of weather and resources. To declare what the future holds in an uncontrollable world, and without an explanation of why events unfold as they do, is not prediction but prophecy, and as David Deutsch observes, the most important of all limitations on knowledge creation is that we cannot prophesy, we cannot predict the content of ideas yet to be created, or their effects. This limitation is not only consistent with the unlimited growth of knowledge, it is entailed by it. 19. Our inability to prophesy is not, of course, a license to ignore the facts. An improvement in some measure of human well-being suggests that, overall, more things have pushed in the right direction than in the wrong direction. Whether we should expect progress to continue depends on whether we know what those forces are and how long they will remain in place. That will vary from trend to trend. Some may turn out to be like Moore's law, the number of transistors per computer chip doubles every two years, and give grounds for confidence though not certainty, that the fruits of human ingenuity will accumulate and progress will continue. Some may be like the stock market and foretell short-term fluctuations but long-term gains. Some of these may reel in a statistical distribution with a thick tail, in which extreme events, even if less likely, cannot be ruled out. Point two zero. Still others may be cyclical or chaotic. In chapters 19 and 21 we will examine rational forecasting in an uncertain world. For now we should keep in mind that a positive trend suggests but does not prove that we have been doing something right, and that we should seek to identify what it is and do more of it. When all these objections are exhausted, I often see people racking their brains to find some way in which the news cannot be as good as the data suggest. In desperation, they turn to semantics. Isn't internet trolling a form of violence? Isn't strip mining a form of violence? Isn't inequality a form of violence? Isn't pollution a form of violence? Isn't poverty a form of violence? Isn't consumerism a form of violence? Isn't divorce a form of violence? Isn't advertising a form of violence? Isn't keeping statistics on violence a form of violence? As wonderful as metaphor is as a rhetorical device, it is a poor way to assess the state of humanity. Moral reasoning requires proportionality. It may be upsetting when someone says mean things on Twitter, but it is not the same as the slave trade or the Holocaust. It also requires distinguishing rhetoric from reality. Marching into a rape crisis center and demanding to know what they have done about the rape of the environment does nothing for rape victims and nothing for the environment. Finally, improving the world requires an understanding of cause and effect. Though primitive moral intuitions tend to lump bad things together and find a villain to blame them on, there is no coherent phenomenon of bad things, that we can seek to understand and eliminate. Entropy and evolution will generate them in profusion. War, crime, pollution, poverty, disease, and incivility are evils that may have little in common, and if we want to reduce them, we can't play word games that make it impossible even to discuss them individually. I have run through these objections to prepare the way for my presentation of other measures of human progress. The incredulous reaction to better angels convinced me that it isn't just the availability heuristic that makes people fatalistic about progress. Nor can the media's fondness for bad news be blamed entirely on a cynical chase for eyeballs and clicks. No. The psychological roots of progressophobia run deeper. The deepest is a bias that has been summarized in the slogan, bad is stronger than good. 
21. The idea can be captured in a set of thought experiments suggested by Tversky.22. How much better can you imagine yourself feeling than you are feeling right now? How much worse can you imagine yourself feeling? In answering the first hypothetical, most of us can imagine a bit more of a spring in our step or a twinkle in our eye, but the answer to the second one is, it's bottomless. This asymmetry in mood can be explained by an asymmetry in life, a corollary of the law of entropy. How many things could happen to you today that would leave you much better off? How many things could happen that would leave you much worse off? Once again, to answer the first question, we can all come up with the odd windfall or stroke of good luck, but the answer to the second one is, it's endless. But we needn't rely on our imaginations. The psychological literature confirms that people dread losses more than they look forward to gains, that they dwell on setbacks more than they save a good fortune, and that they are more stung by criticism than they are hardened by praise. As a psycholinguist I am compelled to add that the English language has far more words for negative emotions than for positive ones. 23. One exception to the negativity bias is found in autobiographical memory. Though we tend to remember bad events as well as we remember good ones, the negative coloring of the misfortunes fades with time, particularly the ones that happen to us. Point two four. We are wired for nostalgia. In human memory, time heals most wounds. Two other illusions mislead us into thinking that things ain't what they used to be. We mistake the growing burdens of maturity in parenthood for a less innocent world, and we mistake a decline in our own faculties for a decline in the times. Point two five. As the columnist Franklin Pierce Adams pointed out, nothing is more responsible for the good old days than a bad memory. Intellectual culture should strive to counteract our cognitive biases, but all too often it reinforces them. The cure for the availability bias is quantitative thinking, but the literary scholar Stephen Connor has noted that, there is in the arts and humanities an exceptionless consensus about the encroaching horror of the domain of number. 26. This, ideological rather than accidental enumeracy, leads writers to notice, for example, that wars take place today and wars took place in the past and to conclude that, nothing has changed, failing to acknowledge the difference between an era with a handful of wars that collectively kill in the thousands and an era with dozens of wars that collectively killed in the millions. And it leaves them unappreciative of systemic processes that eke out incremental improvements over the long term. Nor is intellectual culture equipped to treat the negativity bias. Indeed, our vigilance for bad things around us opens up a market for professional curmudgeons who call our attention to bad things we may have missed. Experiments have shown that a critic who pans a book is perceived as more competent than a critic who praises it, and the same may be true of critics of society. Point two seven. Always predict the worst, and you'll be hailed as a prophet, the musical humorist Tom Lehrer once advised. At least since the time of the Hebrew prophets, who blended their social criticism with forewarnings of disaster, pessimism has been equated with moral seriousness. Journalists believe that by accentuating the negative they are discharging their duty as watchdogs, muckrakers, whistleblowers, and afflictors of the comfortable. And intellectuals know they can attain instant gravitas by pointing to an unsolved problem and theorizing that it is a symptom of a sick society. The converse is true as well. The financial writer Morgan Housel has observed that while pessimists sound like they're trying to help you, optimists sound like they're trying to sell you something. Point two eight. Whenever someone offers a solution to a problem, critics will be quick to point out that it is not a panacea, a silver bullet, a magic bullet, or a one-size-fits-all solution. It's just a band-aid or a quick technological fix that fails to get at the root causes and will blow back with side effects and unintended consequences. Of course, since nothing is a panacea and everything has side effects, you can't do just one thing. These common tropes are little more than a refusal to entertain the possibility that anything can ever be improved. Point two nine. 
Pessimism among the intelligentsia can also be a form of one-upmanship. A modern society is a league of political, industrial, financial, technological, military, and intellectual elites, all competing for prestige and influence, and with differing responsibilities for making the society run. Complaining about modern society can be a backhanded way of putting down one's rivals. For academics to feel superior to business people, business people to feel superior to politicians, and so on. As Thomas Hobbes noted in 1651, competition of praise inclineth to a reverence of antiquity. For men contend with the living, not with the dead. Pessimism, to be sure, has a bright side. The expanding circle of sympathy makes us concerned about harms that would have passed unnoticed in more callous times. Today we recognize the Syrian civil war as a humanitarian tragedy. The wars of earlier decades, such as the Chinese Civil War, the Partition of India, and the Korean War, are seldom remembered that way, though they killed and displaced more people. When I grew up, bullying was considered a natural part of boyhood. It would have strained belief to think that someday the President of the United States would deliver a speech about its evils, as Barack Obama did in 2011. As we care about more of humanity, we're apt to mistake the harms around us for signs of how low the world has sunk rather than how high our standards have risen. But relentless negativity can itself have unintended consequences, and recently a few journalists have begun to point them out. In the wake of the 2016 American election, the New York Times writers David Bornstein and Tina Rosenberg reflected on the media's role in its shocking outcome. Trump was the beneficiary of a belief, mere universal in American journalism, that serious news can essentially be defined as what's going wrong. For decades, journalism's steady focus on problems and seemingly incurable pathologies was preparing the soil that allowed Trump's seeds of discontent and despair to take root. One consequence is that many Americans today have difficulty imagining, valuing or even believing in the promise of incremental system change, which leads to a greater appetite for revolutionary, smash the machine change point three zero. Bornstein and Rosenberg don't blame the usual culprits cable TV, social media, late-night comedians but instead trace it to the shift during the Vietnam and Watergate eras from glorifying leaders to checking their power, with an overshoot toward indiscriminate cynicism, in which everything about America's civic actors invites an aggressive takedown. If the roots of progressophobia lie in human nature, is my suggestion that it is on the rise itself an illusion of the availability bias. Anticipating the methods I will use in the rest of the book, let's look at an objective measure. The data scientist Kalev Literu applied a technique called sentiment mining to every article published in the New York Times between 1945 and 2005 and to an archive of translated articles and broadcasts from 130 countries between 1979 and 2010. Sentiment mining assesses the emotional tone of a text by tallying the number and contexts of words with positive and negative connotations, like good, nice, terrible, and horrific. Figure 4 to 1 shows the results. Putting aside the wiggles and waves that reflect the crises of the day, we see that the impression that the news has become more negative over time is real. The New York Times got steadily more morose from the early 1960s to the early 1970s, lightened up a bit but just a bit, in the 1980s and 1990s, and then sank into a progressively worse mood in the first decade of the new century. News outlets in the rest of the world, too, became gloomier and gloomier from the late 1970s to the present day. So has the world really gone steadily downhill during these decades? Keep figure 4 to 1 in mind as we examine the state of humanity in the chapters to come. Figure 4 to 1. Tone of the News, 1945-2010. Source. Literu 2011. Plotted by month, beginning in January. What is progress? 
You might think that the question is so subjective and culturally relative as to be forever unanswerable. In fact, it's one of the easier questions to answer. Most people agree that life is better than death. Health is better than sickness. Sustenance is better than hunger. Abundance is better than poverty. Peace is better than war. Safety is better than danger. Freedom is better than tyranny. Equal rights are better than bigotry and discrimination. Literacy is better than illiteracy. Knowledge is better than ignorance. Intelligence is better than dull wittedness. Happiness is better than misery. Opportunities to enjoy family, friends, culture, and nature are better than drudgery and monotony. All these things can be measured. If they have increased over time, that is progress. Granted, not everyone would agree on the exact list. The values are avowedly humanistic, and leave out religious, romantic, and aristocratic virtues like salvation, grace, sacredness, heroism, honor, glory, and authenticity. But most would agree that it's a necessary start. It's easy to extol transcendent values in the abstract, but most people prioritize life, health, safety, literacy, sustenance, and stimulation for the obvious reason that these goods are a prerequisite to everything else. If you're reading this, you are not dead, starving, destitute, moribund, terrified, enslaved, or illiterate, which means that you're in no position to turn your nose up at these values, or to deny that other people should share your good fortune. As it happens, the world does agree on these values. In the year 2000, all 189 members of the United Nations, together with two dozen international organizations, agreed on eight Millennium Development Goals for the year 2015 that blend right into this list.31. And here is a shocker. The world has made spectacular progress in every single measure of human well-being. Here is a second shocker, almost no one knows about it. Information about human progress, though absent from major news outlets and intellectual forums, is easy enough to find. The data are not entombed in dry reports but are displayed in gorgeous websites, particularly Max Rose's Our World in Data, Marion Tupi's Human Progress, and Hans Rosling's Gapminder. Rosling learned that not even swallowing a sword during a 2007 TED Talk was enough to get the world's attention. The case has been made in beautifully written books, some by Nobel laureates, which flaunt the news in their titles, Progress, The Progress Paradox, Infinite Progress, The Infinite Resource, The Rational Optimist, The Case for Rational Optimism, Utopia for Realists, Mass Flourishing, Abundance, The Improving State of the World, Getting Better, The End of Doom, The Moral Arc, The Big Ratchet, the Great Escape, The Great Surge, The Great Convergence.32. None was recognized with a major prize, but over the period in which they appeared, Pulitzers in nonfiction were given to four books on genocide, three on terrorism, two on cancer, two on racism, and one on extinction. And for those whose reading habits tend toward listicles, recent years have offered five amazing pieces of good news nobody is reporting. Five reasons why 2013 was the best year in human history, seven reasons the world looks worse than it really is, 29 charts and maps that show the world is getting much, much better, 40 ways the world is getting better, and my favorite, 50 reasons we're living through the greatest period in world history. Let's look at some of those reasons. Chapter 5. Life. The struggle to stay alive is the primal urge of animate beings, and humans deploy their ingenuity and conscious resolve to stave off death as long as possible. Choose life, so that you and your children may live, commanded the God of the Hebrew Bible, rage, rage against the dying of the light, adjured Dylan Thomas. A long life is the ultimate blessing. How long do you think an average person in the world can be expected to live today? Bear in mind that the global average is dragged down by the premature deaths from hunger and disease in the populous countries in the developing world, 
particularly by the deaths of infants, who mix a lot of zeros into the average. The answer for 2015 is 71.4 years.1. How close is that to your guess? In a recent survey Hans Rosling found that less than one in four Swedes guessed that it was that high, a finding consistent with the results of other multinational surveys of opinions on longevity, literacy, and poverty in what Rosling dubbed the Ignorance Project. The logo of the project is a chimpanzee, because, as Rosling explained, if for each question I wrote the alternatives on bananas, and asked chimpanzees in the zoo to pick the right answers, they'd have done better than the respondents. The respondents, including students and professors of global health, were not so much ignorant as fallaciously pessimistic. Point two. Figure 5 to 1, a plot from Max Rosa of life expectancy over the centuries, displays a general pattern in world history. At the time when the lines begin, in the mid-18th century, life expectancy in Europe and the Americas was around 35, where it had been parked for the 225 previous years for which we have data.3. Life expectancy for the world as a whole was 29. These numbers are in the range of expected lifespans for most of human history. The life expectancy of hunter-gatherers is around 32.5, and it probably decreased among the peoples who first took up farming because of their starchy diet and the diseases they caught from their livestock and each other. It returned to the low 30s by the Bronze Age, where it stayed put for thousands of years, with small fluctuations across centuries and regions. Point four. This period in human history may be called the Malthusian era, when any advance in agriculture or health was quickly cancelled by the resulting bulge in population, though, era, is an odd term for 99.9% .9 of our species' existence. Figure 5 to 1, Life Expectancy, 1771-2015. Sources. Our World in Data, Rosa 2016N, based on data from Riley 2005 for the years before 2000 and from the World Health Organization and the World Bank for the subsequent years. Updated with data provided by Max Rosa. But starting in the 19th century, the world embarked on the Great Escape, the economist Angus Deaton's term for humanity's release from its patrimony of poverty, disease, and early death. Life expectancy began to rise, picked up speed in the 20th century, and shows no signs of slowing down. As the economic historian Johann Norberg points out, we tend to think that, we approach death by one year for every year we age. But during the 20th century, the average person approached death by just seven months for every year they aged. Thrillingly, the gift of longevity is spreading to all of humankind, including the world's poorest countries, and at a much faster pace than it did in the rich ones. Life expectancy in Kenya increased by almost 10 years between 2003 and 2013, Norberg writes. After having lived, loved and struggled for a whole decade, the average person in Kenya had not lost a single year of their remaining lifetime. Everyone got 10 years older, yet death had not come a step closer. 5. As a result, inequality in life expectancy, which opened up during the Great Escape when a few fortunate countries broke away from the pack, is shrinking as the rest catch up. In 1800, no country in the world had a life expectancy above 40. By 1950, it had grown to around 60 in Europe and the Americas, leaving Africa and Asia far behind. But since then Asia has shot up at twice the European rate, and Africa at one and a half times the rate. An African born today can expect to live as long as a person born in the Americas in 1950 or in Europe in the 1930s. The average would have been longer still were it not for the calamity of AIDS, which caused the terrible trough in the 1990s before antiretroviral drugs started to bring it under control. The African AIDS dip is a reminder that progress is not an escalator that inexorably raises the well-being of every human everywhere all the time. That would be magic, and progress is an outcome not of magic but of problem-solving. 
Problems are inevitable, and at times particular sectors of humanity have suffered terrible setbacks. In addition to the African AIDS epidemic, longevity went into reverse for young adults worldwide during the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918–19 and for middle-aged, non-college educated, non-Hispanic white Americans in the early 21st century. Point six. But problems are solvable, and the fact that longevity continues to increase in every other Western demographic means that solutions to the problems facing this one exist as well. Average lifespans are stretched the most by decreases in infant and child mortality, both because children are fragile and because the death of a child brings down the average more than the death of a 60-year-old. Figure 5-2 shows what has happened to child mortality since the Age of Enlightenment in five countries that are more or less representative of their continents. Look at the numbers on the vertical axis, they refer to the percentage of children who die before reaching the age of five. Yes, well into the 19th century, in Sweden, one of the world's wealthiest countries, between a quarter and a third of all children died before their fifth birthday, and in some years the death toll was close to half. This appears to be typical in human history, a fifth of hunter-gatherer children die in their first year, and almost half before they reach adulthood. Point seven. The spikiness in the curve before the 20th century reflects not just noise in the data but the parlous nature of life. An epidemic, war, or famine could bring death to one's door at any time. Even the well-to-do could be struck by tragedy. Charles Darwin lost two children in infancy and his beloved daughter Annie at the age of 10. Figure 5-2, Child Mortality, 1751-2013. Sources. Our World in Data, Rosa 2016A, based on data from the UN Child Mortality Estimates, and the Human Mortality Database. Then a remarkable thing happened. The rate of child mortality plunged a hundredfold, to a fraction of a percentage point in developed countries, and the plunge went global. As Deaton observed in 2013, there is not a single country in the world where infant or child mortality today is not lower than it was in 1950. 8. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the child mortality rate has fallen from around 1 in 4 in the 1960s to less than 1 in 10 in 2015, and the global rate has fallen from 18 to 4 percent, still too high, but sure to come down if the current thrust to improve global health continues. Remember two facts behind the numbers. One is demographic. When fewer children die, parents have fewer children, since they no longer have to hedge their bets against losing their entire families. So contrary to the worry that saving children's lives would only set off a population bomb, a major eco-panic of the 1960s and 1970s, which led to calls for reducing health care in the developing world the decline in child mortality has diffused at point nine. The other is personal. The loss of a child is among the most devastating experiences. Imagine the tragedy, then try to imagine it another million times. That's a quarter of the number of children who did not die last year alone who would have died had they been born 15 years earlier. Now repeat, 200 times or so, for the years since the decline in child mortality began. Graphs like figure 5 to 2 display a triumph of human well-being whose magnitude the mind cannot begin to comprehend. Just as difficult to appreciate is humanity's impending triumph over another of nature's cruelties, the death of a mother in childbirth. The God of the Hebrew Bible, ever merciful, told the first woman, I will multiply your pain in childbearing, in pain you shall bring forth children. Until recently about 1% of mothers died in the process. For an American woman, being pregnant a century ago was almost as dangerous as having breast cancer today. Point one zero. Figure 5 to 3 shows the trajectory of maternal mortality since 1751 in four countries that are representative of their regions. Figure 5 to 3, maternal mortality, 1751-2013. 
Source. Our World in Data, Rosa 2016p, based partly on data from Claudia Hansen of Gapminder. Starting in the late 18th century in Europe, the mortality rate plummeted 300-fold, from 1.2 to 0.004%. The declines have spread to the rest of the world, including the poorest countries, where the death rate has fallen even faster, though for a shorter time because of their later start. The rate for the entire world, after dropping almost in half in just 25 years, is now about 0.2%, around where Sweden was in 1941.11. You may be wondering whether the drops in child mortality explain all the gains in longevity shown in figure 5 to 1. Are we really living longer, or are we just surviving infancy in greater numbers? After all, the fact that people before the 19th century had an average life expectancy at birth of around 30 years doesn't mean that everyone dropped dead on their 30th birthday. The many children who died pulled the average down, cancelling the boost of the people who died of old age, and these seniors can be found in every society. In the time of the Bible, the days of our years were said to be threescore and ten, and that's the age at which Socrates' life was cut short in 399 BCE, not by natural causes but by a cup of hemlock. Most hunter-gatherer tribes have plenty of people in their 70s and even some in their 80s. Though a Hadza woman's life expectancy at birth is 32.5 years, if she makes it to 45 she can expect to live another 21 years.12. So do those of us who survive the ordeals of childbirth and childhood today live any longer than the survivors of earlier eras? Yes. Much longer. Figure 5 to 4 shows the life expectancy in the United Kingdom at birth and at different ages from 1 to 70, over the past three centuries. Figure 5 to 4. Life Expectancy, UK, 1701-2013. Sources. Our World in Data, Rosa 2016N. Data before 1845 are for England and Wales and come from OECD Clio Infra, Van Zanden et al. 2014. Data from 1845 on a for mid-decade years only, and come from the Human Mortality Database. No matter how old you are, you have more years ahead of you than people of your age did in earlier decades and centuries. A British baby who had survived the hazardous first year of life would have lived to 47 in 1845, 57 in 1905, 72 in 1955, and 81 in 2011. A 30-year-old could look forward to another 33 years of life in 1845, another 36 in 1905, another 43 in 1955, and another 52 in 2011. If Socrates had been acquitted in 1905, he could have expected to live another nine years, in 1955, another ten, in 2011, another sixteen. An 80-year-old in 1845 had five more years of life, an 80-year-old in 2011, nine years. Similar trends, though with lower numbers, so far, have occurred in every part of the world. For example, a 10-year-old Ethiopian in 1950 could expect to live to 44, a 10-year-old Ethiopian today can expect to live to 61. The economist Stephen Radlett has pointed out that, the improvements in health among the global poor in the last few decades are so large and widespread that they rank among the greatest achievements in human history. Rarely has the basic well-being of so many people around the world improved so substantially, so quickly. Yet few people are even aware that it is happening. 13. And no, the extra years of life will not be spent senile in a rocking chair. Of course the longer you live, the more of those years you'll live as an older person, with its inevitable aches and pains. But bodies that are better at resisting a mortal blow are also better at resisting the lesser assaults of disease, injury, and wear. As the lifespan is stretched, our run of vigor is stretched out as well, even if not by the same number of years. 
A heroic project called the Global Burden of Disease has tried to measure this improvement by tallying not just the number of people who drop dead of each of 291 diseases and disabilities, but how many years of healthy life they lose, weighted by the degree to which each condition compromises the quality of their lives. For the world in 1990, the project estimated that 56.8 of the 64.5 years of life that an average person could be expected to live were years of healthy life. And at least in developed countries, where estimates are available for 2010 as well, we know that out of the 4.7 years of additional expected life we gained in those two decades, 3.8 were healthy years.14. Numbers like these show that people today live far more years in the pink of health than their ancestors lived altogether, healthy and infirm years combined. For many people the greatest fear raised by the prospect of a longer life is dementia. But another pleasant surprise has come to light. Between 2000 and 2012, the rate among Americans over 65 fell by a quarter, and the average age at diagnosis rose from 80.7 to 82.4 years.15. There is still more good news. The curves in figure 5 to 4 are not tapestries of your life that have been drawn out and measured by two of the fates and will someday be cut by the third. Rather, they are projections from today's vital statistics, based on the assumption that medical knowledge will be frozen at its current state. It's not that anyone believes that assumption, but in the absence of clairvoyance about future medical advances we have no other choice. That means you will almost certainly live longer, perhaps much longer, than the numbers you read off the vertical axis. People will complain about anything, and in 2001 George W. Bush appointed a President's Council on Bioethics to deal with the looming threat of biomedical advances that promise longer and healthier lives.16. Its chairman, the physician and public intellectual Leon Cass, decreed that, the desire to prolong youthfulness is an expression of a childish and narcissistic wish incompatible with a devotion to posterity, and that the years that would be added to other people's lives were not worth living, would professional tennis players really enjoy playing 25% more games of tennis? He asks. Most people would rather decide that for themselves, and even if he is right that, mortality makes life matter, longevity is not the same as immortality.17. But the fact that experts' assertions about maximum possible life expectancy have repeatedly been shattered, on average five years after they were published raises the question of whether longevity will increase indefinitely and someday slip the surly bonds of mortality entirely.18. Should we worry about a world of stodgy multicentenarians who will resist the innovations of 90-something upstarts and perhaps ban the begetting of pesky children altogether? A number of Silicon Valley visionaries are trying to bring that world closer.19. They have funded research institutes which aim not to chip away at mortality one disease at a time but to reverse engineer the aging process itself and upgrade our cellular hardware to a version without that bug. The result, they hope, will be an increase in the human lifespan of 50, 100, even a thousand years. In his 2006 bestseller The Singularity is Near, the inventor Ray Kurzweil forecasts that those of us who make it to 2045 will live forever, thanks to advances in genetics, nanotechnology, such as nanobots that will course through our bloodstream and repair our bodies from the inside, and artificial intelligence, which will not just figure out how to do all this but recursively improve its own intelligence without limit. To readers of medical newsletters and other hypochondriacs, the prospects for immortality look rather different. We certainly find incremental improvements to celebrate, such as a decline in the death rate from cancer over the past 25 years of around a percentage point a year, saving a million lives in the United States alone.20. But we also are regularly disappointed by miracle drugs that work no better than the placebo, treatments with side effects worse than the disease, and trumpeted benefits that wash out in the meta-analysis. Medical progress today is more Sisyphus than singularity.
Lacking the gift of prophecy, no one can say whether scientists will ever find a cure for mortality. But evolution and entropy make it unlikely. Senescence is baked into our genome at every level of organization, because natural selection favors genes that make us vigorous when we are young over those that make us live as long as possible. That bias is built in because of the asymmetry of time. There is a non-zero probability at any moment that we will be felled by an unpreventable accident like a lightning strike or landslide, making the advantage of any costly longevity gene moot. Biologists would have to reprogram thousands of genes or molecular pathways, each with a small and uncertain effect on longevity, to launch the leap to immortality.21. And even if we were fitted with perfectly tuned biological hardware, the march of entropy would degrade it. As the physicist Peter Hoffman points out, life pits biology against physics in mortal combat. Violently thrashing molecules constantly collide with the machinery of our cells, including the very machinery that staves off entropy by correcting errors and repairing damage. As damage to the various damage control systems accumulates, the risk of collapse increases exponentially, sooner or later swamping whatever protections biomedical science has given us against constant risks like cancer and organ failure. Point two two. In my view the best projection of the outcome of our multicentury war on death is Stein's law, things that can't go on forever don't, as amended by Davies's corollary, things that can't go on forever can go on much longer than you think. Chapter 6. Health. How do we explain the gift of life that has been granted to more and more of our species since the end of the 18th century? The timing offers a clue. In The Great Escape, Deaton writes, ever since people rebelled against authority in the Enlightenment, and set about using the force of reason to make their lives better, they have found a way to do so, and there is little doubt that they will continue to win victories against the forces of death. 1. The gains in longevity celebrated in the previous chapter are the spoils of victory against several of those forces – disease, starvation, war, homicide, accidents, and in this chapter and subsequent ones I will tell the story of each. For most of human history, the strongest force of death was infectious disease, the nasty feature of evolution in which small, rapidly reproducing organisms make their living at our expense and hitch a ride from body to body in bugs, worms, and bodily effluvia. Epidemics killed by the millions, wiping out entire civilizations, and visited sudden misery on local populations. To take just one example, yellow fever, a viral disease transmitted by mosquitoes, was so named because its victims turned that color before dying in agony. According to an account of an 1878 Memphis epidemic, the sick had crawled into holes twisted out of shape, their bodies discovered later only by the stench of their decaying flesh. A mother was found dead with her body sprawled across the bed. Black vomit-like coffee grounds spattered all over. The children rolling on the floor, groaning. 2. The rich were not spared. In 1836, the wealthiest man in the world, Nathan Meyer Rothschild, died of an infected abscess. Nor the powerful. Various British monarchs were cut down by dysentery, smallpox, pneumonia, typhoid, tuberculosis, and malaria. American presidents, too, were vulnerable. William Henry Harrison fell ill shortly after his inauguration in 1841 and died of septic shock 31 days later, and James Polk succumbed to cholera three months after leaving office in 1849. As recently as 1924, the 16-year-old son of a sitting president, Calvin Coolidge Jr., died of an infected blister he got while playing tennis. Ever-creative Homo sapiens had long fought back against disease with quackery such as prayer, sacrifice, bloodletting, cupping, toxic metals, homeopathy, and squeezing a hen to death against an infected body part. But starting in the late 18th century with the invention of vaccination, and accelerating in the 19th with acceptance of the germ theory of disease, the tide of battle began to turn. 
handwashing, midwifery, mosquito control, and especially the protection of drinking water by public sewage and chlorinated tap water would come to save billions of lives. Before the 20th century, cities were piled high in excrement, their rivers and lakes viscous with waste, and their residents drinking and washing their clothes in putrid brown liquid. Point three. Epidemics were blamed on miasmas, foul-smelling air. Until John Snow, 1813-1858, the first epidemiologist, determined that cholera-stricken Londoners got their water from an intake pipe that was downstream from an outflow of sewage. Doctors themselves used to be a major health hazard as they went from autopsy to examining room in black coats encrusted with dried blood and pus, probed their patients' wounds with unwashed hands, and sewed them up with sutures they kept in their buttonholes, until Ignaz Semmelweis and Joseph Lister got them to sterilize their hands and equipment. Antisepsis, anesthesia, and blood transfusions allowed surgery to cure rather than torture and mutilate, and antibiotics, antitoxins, and countless other medical advances further beat back the assault of pestilence. The sin of ingratitude may not have made the top seven, but according to Dante it consigns the sinners to the ninth circle of hell, and that's where post-1960s intellectual culture may find itself because of its amnesia for the conquerors of disease. It wasn't always that way. When I was a boy, a popular literary genre for children was the heroic biography of a medical pioneer such as Edward Jenner, Louis Pasteur, Joseph Lister, Frederick Banting, Charles Best, William Osler, or Alexander Fleming. On April 12, 1955, a team of scientists announced that Jonas Salk's vaccine against polio, the disease that had killed thousands a year, paralyzed Franklin Roosevelt, and sent many children into iron lungs, was proven safe. According to Richard Carter's History of the Discovery, on that day, people observed moments of silence, rang bells, honked horns, blew factory whistles, fired salutes, took the rest of the day off, closed their schools or convoked fervid assemblies therein, drank toasts, hugged children, attended church, smiled at strangers, and forgave enemies. 4. The city of New York offered to honor Salk with a ticker tape parade, which he politely declined. And how much thought have you given lately to Carl Landsteiner? Carl who? He only saved a billion lives by his discovery of blood groups. Or how about these other heroes? Scientist. Discovery. Lives saved. Abel Wallman, 1892-1982, and Linenslo, 1891-1957. Chlorination of water. 177 million. William Foge, 1936. Smallpox Eradication Strategy. 131 million. Maurice Hillman, 1919 2005. Eight vaccines. 129 million. John Enders, 1897 1985. Measles vaccine. 120 million. Howard Florey, 1898–1968. Penicillin. 82 million. Gaston Ramon, 1886–1963. Diphtheria and tetanus vaccines. 60 million. David Nayland, 1941. Oral rehydration therapy. 54 million. Paul Lealich, 1854–1915. Diphtheria and tetanus antitoxins. 42 million. Andreas Grunzig, 1939-1985. Angioplasty. 15 million. Grace Eldering, 1900-1988, and Pearl Kendrick, 1890-1980. Whooping cough vaccine. 14 million. Gertrude Ellian, 1918-1999. Rational drug design. 5 million. The researchers who assembled these conservative estimates calculate that more than 5 billion lives have been saved, so far, by the hundred or so scientists they selected. Point 5. 
Of course hero stories don't do justice to the way science is really done. Scientists stand on the shoulders of giants, collaborate in teams, toil in obscurity, and aggregate ideas across worldwide webs. But whether it's the scientists or the science that is ignored, the neglect of the discoveries that transformed life for the better is an indictment of our appreciation of the modern human condition. As a psycholinguist who once wrote an entire book on the past tense, I can single out my favorite example in the history of the English language. Point six. It comes from the first sentence of a Wikipedia entry. Smallpox was an infectious disease caused by either of two virus variants, variola major and variola minor. Yes. Smallpox was. The disease that got its name from the painful pustules that cover the victim's skin, mouth, and eyes and that killed more than 300 million people in the 20th century has ceased to exist. The last case was diagnosed in Somalia in 1977. For this astounding moral triumph we can thank, among others, Edward Jenner, who discovered vaccination in 1796, the World Health Organization, which in 1959 set the audacious goal of eradicating the disease, and William Foge, who figured out that vaccinating small but strategically chosen portions of the vulnerable populations would do the job. In Getting Better, the economist Charles Kumi comments. The total cost of the program over those 10 years was in the region of $312 million, perhaps 32 cents per person in infected countries. The eradication program cost about the same as producing five recent Hollywood blockbusters, or the wing of a B-2 bomber, or a little under one-tenth the cost of Boston's recent road improvement project nicknamed the Big Dig. However much one admires the improved views of the Boston waterfront, the lines of the stealth bomber, or the acting skills of Kira Knightley in Pirates of the Caribbean, or indeed of the gorilla in King Kong, this still seems like a very good deal. Point seven. Even as a resident of the Boston waterfront, I'd have to agree. But this stupendous achievement was only the beginning. Wikipedia's definition of Rindipst cattle plague which starved millions of farmers and herders throughout history by wiping out their livestock, is also in the past tense. And four other sources of misery in the developing world are slated for eradication. Jonas Salk did not live to see the Global Polio Eradication Initiative approach its goal. By 2016 the disease had been beaten back to just 37 cases in three countries Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Nigeria, the lowest in history, with an even lower rate thus far in 2017.8 Guinea worm is a three-foot-long parasite that worms its way into the victim's lower limbs and diabolically forms a painful blister. When the sufferer soaks his or her foot for relief, the blister bursts, releasing thousands of larvae into the water, which other people drink, continuing the cycle. The only treatment consists of pulling the worm out over several days or weeks. But thanks to a three-decade campaign of education and water treatment by the Carter Center, the number of cases fell from 3.5 million in 21 countries in 1986 to just 25 cases in three countries in 2016, and just three in one country in the first quarter of 2017.9. Elephantiasis, river blindness, and blinding trachoma whose symptoms are as bad as they sound, may also be defined in the past tense by 2030, and measles, rubella, yours, sleeping sickness, and hookworm are in epidemiologists' sites as well. Point one zero. Will any of these triumphs be heralded with moments of silence, ringing bells, honking horns, people smiling at strangers and forgiving their enemies? Even diseases that are not obliterated are being decimated. Between 2000 and 2015, the number of deaths from malaria, which in the past killed half the people who had ever lived, fell by 60%. The World Health Organization has adopted a plan to reduce the rate by another 90% by 2030, and to eliminate it from 35 of the 97 countries in which it is endemic today just as it was eliminated from the United States, where it had been endemic until 1951.11.
The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has adopted the goal of eradicating it altogether. Point one two. As we saw in Chapter 5, in the 1990s HIV AIDS in Africa was a setback for humanity's progress in lengthening life spans. But the tide turned in the next decade, and the global death rate for children was cut in half, emboldening the UN to agree in 2016 to a plan to end the AIDS epidemic, though not necessarily to eradicate the virus. By 2030.13 figures 6 to 1 shows that between 2000 and 2013 the world also saw massive reductions in the number of children dying from the five most lethal infectious diseases. In all, the control of infectious disease since 1990 has saved the lives of more than a hundred million children. Point one four. Figure six to one. Childhood deaths from infectious disease, 2020-13. Source: Child Health Epidemiology Reference Group of the World Health Organization, Lou et al., 2014. Supplementary Appendix. And in the most ambitious plan of all, a team of global health experts led by the economists Dean Jameson and Lawrence Summers have laid out a roadmap for a grand convergence in global health by 2035, when infectious, maternal, and child deaths everywhere in the world could be reduced to the levels found in the healthiest middle income countries today. 15. As impressive as the conquest of infectious disease in Europe and America was, the ongoing progress among the global poor is even more astonishing. Part of the explanation lies in economic development Chapter 8 because a richer world is a healthier world. Part lies in the expanding circle of sympathy, which inspired global leaders such as Bill Gates, Jimmy Carter, and Bill Clinton to make their legacy the health of the poor in distant continents rather than glittering buildings close to home. George W. Bush, for his part, has been praised by even his harshest critics for his policy on African AIDS relief, which saved millions of lives. But the most powerful contributor was science. It is knowledge that is the key, Deaton argues. Income, although important both in and of itself and as a component of well-being, is not the ultimate cause of well-being. 16. The fruits of science are not just high-tech pharmaceuticals such as vaccines, antibiotics, antiretrovirals, and worming pills. They also comprise ideas, ideas that may be cheap to implement and obvious in retrospect, but which save millions of lives. Examples include boiling, filtering, or adding bleach to water, washing hands, giving iodine supplements to pregnant women, breastfeeding and cuddling infants, defecating in latrines rather than in fields, streets, and waterways, protecting sleeping children with insecticide-impregnated bed nets, and treating diarrhea with a solution of salt and sugar in clean water. Conversely, progress can be reversed by bad ideas, such as the conspiracy theory spread by the Taliban and Boko Haram that vaccines sterilize Muslim girls, or the one spread by affluent American activists that vaccines cause autism. Deaton notes that even the idea that lies at the core of the Enlightenment, knowledge can make us better off, may come as a revelation in the parts of the world where people are resigned to their poor health, Never dreaming that changes to their institutions and norms could improve at point one seven. Chapter seven. Sustenance. Together with senescence, childbirth, and pathogens, another mean trick has been played on us by evolution and entropy, our ceaseless need for energy. Famine has long been part of the human condition. The Hebrew Bible tells of seven lean years in Egypt. The Christian Bible has famine as one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Well into the 19th century a crop failure could bring sudden misery even to privileged parts of the world. Johann Norberg quotes the childhood reminiscence of a contemporary of one of his ancestors in Sweden in the winter of 1868. We often saw mother weeping to herself, and it was hard on a mother, not having any food to put on the table for her hungry children. Emaciated, starving children were often seen going from farm to farm, begging for a few crumbs of bread. One day three children came to us, 
crying and begging for something to still the pangs of hunger. Sadly, her eyes brimming with tears, our mother was forced to tell them that we had nothing but a few crumbs of bread which we ourselves needed. When we children saw the anguish in the unknown children's supplicatory eyes, we burst into tears and begged mother to share with them what crumbs we had. Hesitantly she acceded to our request, and the unknown children wolfed down the food before going on to the next farm, which was a good way off from our home. The following day all three were found dead between our farm and the next point one. The historian Fernand Braudel has documented that pre-modern Europe suffered from famines every few decades. Point two. Desperate peasants would harvest grain before it was ripe, eat grass or human flesh, and pour into cities to beg. Even in good times, many would get the bulk of their calories from bread or gruel, and not many at that. In the escape from hunger and premature death, 1700-2100, the economist Robert Fogel noted that, the energy value of the typical diet in France at the start of the 18th century was as low as that of Rwanda in 1965, the most malnourished nation for that year. 3. Many of those who were not starving were too weak to work, which locked them into poverty. Hungry Europeans titillated themselves with food pornography, such as Tales of Cocaine, a country where pancakes grew on trees, the streets were paved with pastry, roasted pigs wandered around with knives in their backs for easy carving, and cooked fish jumped out of the water and landed at one's feet. Today we live in cocaine, and our problem is not too few calories but too many. As the comedian Chris Rock observed, this is the first society in history where the poor people are fat. With the usual first world ingratitude, modern social critics rail against the obesity epidemic with a level of outrage that might be appropriate for a famine, that is, when they are not railing at fat shaming, slender fashion models, or eating disorders. Though obesity surely is a public health problem, by the standards of history it's a good problem to have. What about the rest of the world? The hunger that many Westerners associate with Africa and Asia is by no means a modern phenomenon. India and China have always been vulnerable to famine, because millions of people subsisted on rice that was watered by erratic monsoons or fragile irrigation systems and had to be transported across great distances. Braudel recounts the testimony of a Dutch merchant who was in India during a famine in 1630-31. Men abandoned towns and villages and wandered helplessly. It was easy to recognize their condition, eyes sunk deep in the head, lips pale and covered with slime, the skin hard, with the bones showing through, the belly nothing but a pouch hanging down empty. One would cry and howl for hunger, while another lay stretched on the ground dying in misery. The familiar human dramas followed, wives and children abandoned, children sold by parents, who either abandoned them or sold themselves in order to survive, collective suicides. Then came the stage when the starving split open the stomachs of the dead or dying and drew at the entrails to fill their own bellies. Many hundred thousands of men died of hunger, so that the whole country was covered with corpses lying unburied, which caused such a stench that the whole air was filled and infected with it. In the village of Sasantra, human flesh was sold in open market. 4. But in recent times the world has been blessed with another remarkable and little-noticed advance. In spite of burgeoning numbers, the developing world is feeding itself. This is most obvious in China, whose 1.3 billion people now have access to an average of 3,100 calories per person per day, which, according to U.S. government guidelines, is the number needed by a highly active young man. Point five. India's billion people get an average of 2,400 calories a day, the number recommended for a highly active young woman or an active middle-aged man. The figure for the continent of Africa comes in between the two at 2,600.6. Figure 7 to 1, which plots available calories for a representative sample of developed and developing nations and for the world as a whole, shows a pattern familiar from earlier graphs. 
hardship everywhere before the 19th century, rapid improvement in Europe and the United States over the next two centuries, and, in recent decades, the developing world catching up. Figure 7 to 1. Calories, 1700-2013. Sources. United States, England, and France, Our World in Data, Rosa 2016, based on data from Fogel 2004. China, India, and the World, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. The numbers plotted in figures 7 to 1 are averages, and they would be a misleading index of well-being if they were just lifted by rich people scarfing down more calories if no one was getting fat except Mama Cass. Fortunately, the numbers reflect an increase in the availability of calories throughout the range, including the bottom. When children are underfed, their growth is stunted, and throughout their lives they have a higher risk of getting sick and dying. Figure 7 to 2 shows the proportion of children who are stunted in a representative sample of countries which have data for the longest spans of time. Though the proportion of stunted children in poor countries like Kenya and Bangladesh is deplorable, we see that in just two decades the rate of stunting has been cut in half. Countries like Colombia and China also had high rates of stunting not long ago and have managed to bring them even lower. Figure 7 to 2, Childhood Stunting, 1966-2014. Source. Our World in Data, Rosa 2016J, based on data from the World Health Organization's Nutrition Landscape Information System. Figure 7 to 3 offers another look at how the world has been feeding the hungry. It shows the rate of undernourishment, a year or more of insufficient food, for developing countries in five regions and for the world as a whole. In developed countries, which are not included in the estimates, the rate of undernourishment was less than 5% during the entire period, statistically indistinguishable from zero. Though 13% of people in the developing world being undernourished is far too much, it's better than 35%, which was the level 45 years earlier, or for that matter 50%, an estimate for the entire world in 1947, not shown on the graph.7. Remember that these figures are proportions. The world added almost 5 billion people in those 70 years, which means that as the world was reducing the rate of hunger it was also feeding billions of additional mouths. Figure 7 to 3. Undernourishment, 1970-2015. Source. Our World in Data, Rosa 2016J, based on data from the Food and Agriculture Organization 2014, also reported in. Not only has chronic undernourishment been in decline, but so have catastrophic famines, the crises that kill people in large numbers and cause widespread wasting, the condition of being two standard deviations below one's expected weight, and quashi or core, the protein deficiency which causes the swollen bellies of the children in photographs that have become icons of famine. Point eight. Figure 7 to 4 shows the number of deaths in major famines in each decade for the past 150 years, scaled by world population at the time. Writing in 2000, The Economist Stephen Devereux summarized the world's progress in the 20th century. Vulnerability to famine appears to have been virtually eradicated from all regions outside Africa. Famine as an endemic problem in Asia and Europe seems to have been consigned to history. The grim label, Land of Famine, has left China, Russia, India and Bangladesh, and since the 1970s has resided only in Ethiopia and Sudan. In addition, the link from crop failure to famine has been broken. Most recent drought or flood-triggered food crises have been adequately met by a combination of local and international humanitarian response. If this trend continues, the 20th century should go down as the last during which tens of millions of people died for lack of access to food. Point nine. Figure 7 to 4. Famine deaths, 1860-2016. Sources. Our World in Data. 
Hassel and Rosa 2017, based on data from Devereaux 2000, Ograda 2009, White 2011, and MDAT, the International Disaster Database, and other sources. Famine, is defined as in Ograda 2009. So far, the trend has continued. There is still hunger, including among the poor in developed countries, and there were famines in East Africa in 2011, the Sahel in 2012, and South Sudan in 2016, together with near famines in Somalia, Nigeria, and Yemen. But they did not kill on the scale of the catastrophes that were regular occurrences in earlier centuries. None of this was supposed to happen. In 1798 Thomas Malthus explained that the frequent famines of his era were unavoidable and would only get worse, because population, when unchecked, increases in a geometrical ratio. Subsistence increases only in an arithmetic ratio. A slight acquaintance with numbers will show the immensity of the first power in comparison with the second. The implication was that efforts to feed the hungry would only lead to more misery, because they would breed more children who were doomed to hunger in their turn. Not long ago, Malthusian thinking was revived with a vengeance. In 1967 William and Paul Paddock wrote Famine 1975, and in 1968 the biologist Paul R. Illich wrote The Population Bomb, in which he proclaimed that, the battle to feed all of humanity is over, and predicted that by the 1980s 65 million Americans and 4 billion other people would starve to death. New York Times Magazine readers were introduced to the battlefield term triage, the emergency practice of separating wounded soldiers into the savable and the doomed, and to philosophy seminar arguments about whether it is morally permissible to throw someone overboard from a crowded lifeboat to prevent it from capsizing and drowning everyone. Illich and other environmentalists argued for cutting off food aid to countries they deemed basket cases. Robert McNamara, president of the World Bank from 1968 to 1981, discouraged financing of health care, unless it was very strictly related to population control, because usually health facilities contributed to the decline of the death rate, and thereby to the population explosion. Population control programs in India and China, especially under China's one child policy, coerced women into sterilizations abortions, and being implanted with painful and septic IUDs.12. Where did Malthus's math go wrong? Looking at the first of his curves, we already saw that population growth needn't increase in a geometric ratio indefinitely, because when people get richer and more of their babies survive, they have fewer babies see also figure 10 to 1. Conversely, famines don't reduce population growth for long. They disproportionately kill children and the elderly, and when conditions improve, the survivors quickly replenish the population. Point one three. As Hans Rosling put it, you can't stop population growth by letting poor children die. 14. Looking at the second curve, we discover that the food supply can grow geometrically when knowledge is applied to increase the amount of food that can be coaxed out of a patch of land. Since the birth of agriculture 10,000 years ago, humans have been genetically engineering plants and animals by selectively breeding the ones that had the most calories and fewest toxins and that were the easiest to plant and harvest. The wild ancestor of corn was a grass with a few tough seeds, the ancestor of carrots looked and tasted like a dandelion root, the ancestors of many wild fruits were bitter, astringent, and more stone than flesh. Clever farmers also tinkered with irrigation, plows, and organic fertilizers, but Malthus always had the last word. It was only at the time of the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution that people figured out how to bend the curve upward. Point one five. In Jonathan Swift's 1726 novel, the moral imperative was explained to Gulliver by the king of Brobdingnag, whoever makes two ears of corn, or two blades of grass to grow where only one grew before, deserves better of humanity, and does more essential service to his country than the whole race of politicians put together.
Soon after that, as figures 7 to 1 shows, more ears of corn were indeed made to grow, in what has been called the British Agricultural Revolution.16. Crop rotation and improvements to plows and seed drills were followed by mechanization, with fossil fuels replacing human and animal muscle. In the mid-19th century it took 25 men a full day to harvest and thresh a ton of grain. Today one person operating a combine harvester can do it in 6 minutes.17. Machines also solve an inherent problem with food. As any zucchini gardener in August knows, a lot becomes available all at once, and then it quickly rots or gets eaten by vermin. Railroads, canals, trucks granaries, and refrigeration evened out the peaks and troughs in the supply and matched it with demand, coordinated by the information carried in prices. But the truly gargantuan boost would come from chemistry. The NNSPONCH, the acronym taught to schoolchildren for the chemical elements that make up the bulk of our bodies, stands for nitrogen, a major ingredient of protein, DNA, chlorophyll, and the energy carrier ATP. Nitrogen atoms are plentiful in the air but bound in pairs hence the chemical formula REN2, which are hard to split apart so that plants can use them. In 1909 Carl Bosch perfected a process invented by Fritz Haber which used methane and steam to pull nitrogen out of the air and turn it into fertilizer on an industrial scale, replacing the massive quantities of bird poop that had previously been needed to return nitrogen to depleted soils. Those two chemists top the list of the 20th century scientists who saved the greatest number of lives in history, with 2.7 billion.18. So forget arithmetic ratios. Over the past century, grain yields per hectare have swooped upward while real prices have plunged. The savings are mind-boggling. If the food grown today had to be grown with pre-nitrogen farming techniques, an area the size of Russia would go under the plow.19. In the United States in 1901, an hour's wages could buy around three quarts of milk, a century later, the same wages would buy 16 quarts. The amount of every other foodstuff that can be bought with an hour of labor has multiplied as well. From a pound of butter to five pounds, a dozen eggs to twelve dozen, two pounds of pork chops to five pounds, and nine pounds of flour to 49 pounds.20. In the 1950s and 60s, another giga lifesaver, Norman Borlaug, outsmarted evolution to foment the green revolution in the developing world. Point two one. Plants in nature invest a lot of energy and nutrients in woody stalks that raise their leaves and blossoms above the shade of neighboring weeds and of each other. Like fans at a rock concert, everyone stands up, but no one gets a better view. That's the way evolution works. It myopically selects for individual advantage, not the greater good of the species, let alone the good of some other species. From a farmer's perspective, not only do tall wheat plants waste energy in inedible stalks, but when they are enriched with fertilizer they collapse under the weight of the heavy seed head. Borlaug took evolution into his own hands, crossing thousands of strains of wheat and then selecting the offspring with dwarfed stalks, high yields, resistance to rust, and an insensitivity to day length. After several years of this, mind-warpingly tedious work, Borlaug evolved strains of wheat, and then corn and rice with many times the yield of their ancestors. By combining these strains with modern techniques of irrigation, fertilization, and crop management, Borlaug turned Mexico and then India, Pakistan, and other famine-prone countries into grain exporters almost overnight. The Green Revolution continues, it has been called, Africa's best-kept secret, driven by improvements in sorghum, millet, cassava, and tubers.22. Thanks to the Green Revolution, the world needs less than a third of the land it used to need to produce a given amount of food.23. Another way of stating the bounty is that between 1961 and 2009 the amount of land used to grow food increased by 12%, but the amount of food that was grown increased by 300%.24.
In addition to beating back hunger, the ability to grow more food from less land has been, on the whole, good for the planet. Despite their bucolic charm, farms are biological deserts which sprawl over the landscape at the expense of forests and grasslands. Now that farms have receded in some parts of the world, temperate forests have been bouncing back, a phenomenon we will return to in Chapter 10.25. If agricultural efficiency had remained the same over the past 50 years while the world grew the same amount of food, an area the size of the United States, Canada, and China combined would have had to be cleared and plowed. Point two six. The environmental scientist Jesse Orzubel has estimated that the world has reached peak farmland. We may never again need as much as we use today. Point two seven. Like all advances, the Green Revolution came under attack as soon as it began. High-tech agriculture, the critics said, consumes fossil fuels and groundwater, uses herbicides and pesticides, disrupts traditional subsistence agriculture, is biologically unnatural, and generates profits for corporations. Given that it saved a billion lives and helped consign major famines to the dustbin of history, this seems to me like a reasonable price to pay. More important, the price need not be with us forever. The beauty of scientific progress is that it never locks us into a technology but can develop new ones with fewer problems than the old ones, a dynamic we will return to here. Genetic engineering can now accomplish in days what traditional farmers accomplished in millennia and Borlaug accomplished in his years of mind-warping tedium. Transgenic crops are being developed with high yields, life-saving vitamins, tolerance to drought and salinity, resistance to disease, pests, and spoilage, and reduced need for land, fertilizer, and plowing. Hundreds of studies, every major health and science organization, and more than a hundred Nobel laureates have testified to their safety unsurprisingly, since there is no such thing as a genetically unmodified crop. Point two eight. Yet traditional environmentalist groups, with what the ecology writer Stuart Brand has called their customary indifference to starvation, have prosecuted a fanatical crusade to keep transgenic crops from people, not just from whole food gourmets in rich countries but from poor farmers in developing ones. Their opposition begins with a commitment to the sacred yet meaningless value of naturalness, which leads them to decry genetic pollution and playing with nature, and to promote real food based on ecological agriculture. From there, they capitalize on primitive intuitions of essentialism and contamination among the scientifically illiterate public. Depressing studies have shown that about half of the populace believes that ordinary tomatoes don't have genes but genetically modified ones do, that a gene inserted into a food might migrate into the genomes of people who eat it, and that a spinach gene inserted into an orange would make it taste like spinach. 80% favored a law that would mandate labels on all foods, containing DNA. 30. As Brand put it, I dare say the environmental movement has done more harm with its opposition to genetic engineering than with any other thing we've been wrong about. We've starved people, hindered science, hurt the natural environment, and denied our own practitioners a crucial tool. 31. One reason for Brand's harsh judgment is that opposition to transgenic crops has been perniciously effective in the part of the world that could most benefit from it. Sub-Saharan Africa has been cursed by nature with thin soil, capricious rainfall, and a paucity of harbors and navigable rivers, and it never developed an extensive network of roads, rails, or canals. Point three two. Like all farmed land, its soils have been depleted, but unlike those in the rest of the world, Africa's have not been replenished with synthetic fertilizer. Adoption of transgenic crops, both those already in use and ones customized for Africa, grown with other modern practices such as no-till farming and drip irrigation, could allow Africa to leapfrog the more invasive practices of the first green revolution and eliminate its remaining undernourishment. For all the importance of agronomy, food security is not just about farming. 
Famines are caused not only when food is scarce but when people can't afford it, when armies prevent them from getting it, or when their governments don't care how much of it they have. Point three three. The pinnacles and valleys in figures 7 to 4 show that the conquest of famine was not a story of steady gains in agricultural efficiency. In the 19th century, famines were triggered by the usual droughts and blights, but they were exacerbated in colonial India and Africa by the callousness, bungling, and sometimes deliberate policies of administrators who had no benevolent interest in their subjects' welfare. Point three four. By the early 20th century, colonial policies had become more responsive to food crises, and advances in agriculture had taken a bite out of hunger. Point three five. But then a horror show of political catastrophes triggered sporadic famines for the rest of the century. Of the 70 million people who died in major 20th century famines, 80% were victims of communist regimes forced collectivization, punitive confiscation, and totalitarian central planning. 36. These included famines in the Soviet Union in the aftermaths of the Russian Revolution, the Russian Civil War, and World War II, Stalin's Holodomor terror famine in Ukraine in 1932-33, Mao's Great Leap Forward in 1958-61, Pol Pot's U-0 in 1975-79, and Kim Jong-il's arduous march in North Korea as recently as the late 1990s. The first governments in post-colonial Africa and Asia often implemented ideologically fashionable but economically disastrous policies such as the mass collectivization of farming, import restrictions to promote, self-sufficiency, and artificially low food prices which benefited politically influential city dwellers at the expense of farmers. Point three seven. When the countries fell into civil war, as they so often did, not only was food distribution disrupted, but both sides could use hunger as a weapon, sometimes with the complicity of their Cold War patrons. Fortunately, since the 1990s the prerequisites to plenty have been falling into place in more of the world. Once the secrets to growing food in abundance are unlocked and the infrastructure to move it around is in place, the decline of famine depends on the decline of poverty, war, and autocracy. Let's turn to the progress that has been made against each of these scourges. Chapter 8. Wealth. Poverty has no causes, wrote the economist Peter Bauer. Wealth has causes. In a world governed by entropy and evolution, the streets are not paved with pastry, and cooked fish do not land at our feet. But it's easy to forget this truism and think that wealth has always been with us. History is written not so much by the victors as by the affluent, the sliver of humanity with the leisure and education to write about it. As the economist Nathan Rosenberg and the legal scholar L. E. Birds LJR point out, we are led to forget the dominating misery of other times in part by the grace of literature, poetry, romance, and legend, which celebrate those who lived well and forget those who lived in the silence of poverty. The eras of misery have been mythologized and may even be remembered as golden ages of pastoral simplicity. They were not. 1. Norberg. Drawing on Braudel offers vignettes of this era of misery, when the definition of poverty was simple, if you could afford to buy bread to survive another day, you were not poor. In wealthy Genoa, poor people sold themselves as galley slaves every winter. In Paris the very poor were chained together in pairs and forced to do the hard work of cleaning the drains. In England, the poor had to work in workhouses to get relief where they worked long hours for almost no pay. Some were instructed to crush dog, horse and cattle bones for use as fertilizer, until an inspection of a workhouse in 1845 showed that hungry paupers were fighting over the rotting bones to suck out the marrow. Point two. Another historian, Carlo Cipolla, noted. In pre-industrial Europe, the purchase of a garment or of the cloth for a garment remained a luxury the common people could only afford a few times in their lives. 
One of the main preoccupations of hospital administration was to ensure that the clothes of the deceased should not be usurped but should be given to lawful inheritors. During epidemics of plague, the town authorities had to struggle to confiscate the clothes of the dead and to burn them. People waited for others to die so as to take over their clothes, which generally had the effect of spreading the epidemic. Point three. The need to explain the creation of wealth is obscured yet again by political debates within modern societies on how wealth ought to be distributed, which presuppose that wealth worth distributing exists in the first place. Economists speak of a «lump fallacy», or «physical fallacy», in which a finite amount of wealth has existed since the beginning of time, like a load of gold, and people have been fighting over how to divide it up ever since. Point four. Among the brain children of the Enlightenment is the realization that wealth is created. Point five. It is created primarily by knowledge and cooperation. Networks of people arrange matter into improbable but useful configurations and combine the fruits of their ingenuity and labor. The corollary, just as radical, is that we can figure out how to make more of it. The endurance of poverty in the transition to modern affluence can be shown in a simple but stunning graph. It plots, for the past 2,000 years, a standard measure of wealth creation, the gross world product, measured in 2011 international dollars. An international dollar is a hypothetical unit of currency equivalent to a US dollar in a particular reference year, adjusted for inflation and for purchasing power parity. The latter compensates for differences in the prices of comparable goods and services in different places, the fact that a haircut, for example, is cheaper in Dhaka than in London. The story of the growth of prosperity in human history depicted in figure 8 to 1 is close to, nothing. 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 Repeat for a few thousand years. Boom. A millennium after the year 1 CE, the world was barely richer than it was at the time of Jesus. It took another half millennium for income to double. Some regions enjoyed spurts now and again, but they did not lead to sustained, cumulative growth. Starting in the 19th century, the increments turned into leaps and bounds. Between 1820 and 1900, the world's income tripled. It tripled again in a bit more than 50 years. It took only 25 years for it to triple again, and another 33 years to triple yet another time. The gross world product today has grown almost a hundredfold since the Industrial Revolution was in place in 1820, and almost 200-fold from the start of the Enlightenment in the 18th century. Debates on economic distribution and growth often contrast dividing a pie with baking a larger one, or as George W. Bush mangled it, making the pie higher. If the pie we were dividing in 1700 was baked in a standard 9-inch pan, then the one we have today would be more than 10 feet in diameter. If we were to surgically carve out the teensiest slice imaginable, say, one that was two inches at its widest point, it would be the size of the entire pie in 1700. Figure 8 to 1. Gross world product, 1 minus 2015. Source. Our world in data. Rosa 2016c. Based on data from the World Bank and from Angus Madison and Madison Project 2014. Indeed, the gross world product is a gross underestimate of the expansion of prosperity. Point six. How does one count units of currency, like pounds or dollars, across the centuries, so they can be plotted in a single line? Is $100 in the year 2000 more or less than $1 in 1800? They're just pieces of paper with numbers on them. Their value depends on what people can buy with them at the time, which changes with inflation and revaluations. The only way to compare a dollar in 1800 with a dollar in 2000 is to look up how many one would have to fork over to buy a standard market basket of goods, a fixed amount of food, clothing, health care, fuel, and so on. That's how the numbers in figure 8 to 1, and in other graphs denominated in dollars or pounds, 
are converted into a single scale such as 2011 international dollars. The problem is that the advance of technology confounds the very idea of an unchanging market basket. To start with, the quality of the goods in the basket improves over time. An item of clothing in 1800 might be a rain cape made of stiff, heavy, and leaky oil cloth. In 2000 it would be a zippered raincoat made of a light, breathable synthetic. Dental care in 1800 meant pliers and wooden dentures, in 2000 it meant Novocaine and implants. It's misleading, then, to say that the $300 it would take to buy a certain amount of clothing in medical care in 2000 can be equated with the $10 it would take to buy, the same amount, in 1800. Also, technology doesn't just improve old things, it invents new ones. How much did it cost in 1800 to purchase a refrigerator, a musical recording, a bicycle, a cell phone, Wikipedia, a photo of your child, a laptop and printer, a contraceptive pill, a dose of antibiotics? The answer is, no amount of money in the world. The combination of better products and new products makes it almost impossible to track material well-being across the decades and centuries. Plunging prices add yet another complication. A refrigerator today costs around $500. How much would someone have to pay you to give up refrigeration? Surely far more than $500. Adam Smith called it the paradox of value. When an important good becomes plentiful, it costs far less than what people are willing to pay for it. The difference is called consumer surplus, and the explosion of this surplus over time is impossible to tabulate. Economists are the first to point out that their measures, like Oscar Wilde's cynic, capture the price of everything but the value of nothing.7. This doesn't mean that comparisons of wealth across times and places in currency adjusted for inflation and purchasing power are meaningless. They are better than ignorance, or guesstimates but it does mean that they shortchange our accounting of progress. A person whose wallet contains the cash equivalent of 11 international dollars today is fantastically richer than her ancestor with the equivalent wallets worth 200 years ago. As we'll see, this also affects our assessment of prosperity in the developing world, this chapter, of income inequality in the developed world, next chapter, and of the future of economic growth, chapter 20. What launched the Great Escape? The most obvious cause was the application of science to the improvement of material life, leading to what the economic historian Joel Mockier calls, the enlightened economy. 8. The machines and factories of the Industrial Revolution, the productive farms of the Agricultural Revolution, and the water pipes of the Public Health Revolution could deliver more clothes, tools, vehicles, books, furniture, calories, clean water, and other things that people want than the craftsmen and farmers of a century before. Many early innovations, such as in steam engines, looms, spinning frames, foundries, and mills, came out of the workshops and backyards of a theoretical tinkerers.9. But trial and error is a profusely branching tree of possibilities, most of which lead nowhere, and the tree can be pruned by the application of science, accelerating the rate of discovery. As Mokir notes, after 1750 the epistemic base of technology slowly began to expand. Not only did new products and techniques emerge, it became better understood why and how the old ones worked, and thus they could be refined, debugged, improved, combined with others in novel ways and adapted to new uses. 10. The invention of the barometer in 1643, which proved the existence of atmospheric pressure, eventually led to the invention of steam engines, known at the time as atmospheric engines. Other two-way streets between science and technology included the application of chemistry, facilitated by the invention of the battery, to synthesize fertilizer, and the application of the germ theory of disease, made possible by the microscope, to keep pathogens out of drinking water and off doctors' hands and instruments. 
The applied scientists would not have been motivated to apply their ingenuity to ease the pains of everyday life, and their gadgets would have remained in their labs and garages, were it not for two other innovations. One was the development of institutions that lubricated the exchange of goods, services, and ideas, the dynamic singled out by Adam Smith as the generator of wealth. The economists Douglas North, John Wallace, and Barry Wangast argue that the most natural way for states to function, both in history and in many parts of the world today, is for elites to agree not to plunder and kill each other, in exchange for which they are awarded a fief, franchise, charter, monopoly, turf, or patronage network that allows them to control some sector of the economy and live off the rents in the economist's sense of income extracted from exclusive access to a resource. Point one one. In 18th century England this cronyism gave way to open economies in which anyone could sell anything to anyone, and their transactions were protected by the rule of law, property rights, enforceable contracts, and institutions like banks, corporations, and government agencies that run by fiduciary duties rather than personal connections. Now an enterprising person could introduce a new kind of product to the market, or undersell other merchants if he could provide a product at lower cost, or accept money now for something he would not deliver until later, or invest in equipment or land that might not return a profit for years. Today I take it for granted that if I want some milk, I can walk into a convenience store and a quart will be on the shelves. The milk won't be diluted or tainted, it will be for sale at a price I can afford, and the owner will let me walk out with it after a swipe of a card, even though we have never met, may never see each other again, and have no friends in common who can testify to our bona fides. A few doors down and I could do the same with a pair of jeans, a power drill, a computer, or a car. A lot of institutions have to be in place for these and the millions of other anonymous transactions that make up a modern economy to be consummated so easily. The third innovation, after science and institutions, was a change in values, an endorsement of what the economic historian Deirdre McCloskey calls bourgeois virtue.12. Aristocratic, religious, and martial cultures have always looked down on commerce as tawdry and venal. But in 18th century England and the Netherlands, commerce came to be seen as moral and uplifting. Voltaire and other Enlightenment philosophers valorized the spirit of commerce for its ability to dissolve sectarian hatreds. Take a view of the Royal Exchange in London, a place more venerable than many courts of justice, where the representatives of all nations meet for the benefit of mankind. They're the Jew. The Mahometan, and the Christian transact together as though, they all professed the same religion, and give the name of infidel to none but bankrupts. There the Presbyterian confides in the Anabaptist, and the churchman depends on the Quaker's word. And all are satisfied. Point one three. Commenting on this passage, the historian Roy Porter noted that, by depicting men content, and content to be content. Differing. But agreeing to differ, the philosoph pointed towards a rethinking of the summum bonum, a shift from God fearingness to a selfhood more psychologically oriented. The Enlightenment thus translated the ultimate question, how can I be saved? into the pragmatic, how can I be happy, thereby heralding a new praxis of personal and social adjustment. 14. This praxis included norms of propriety, thrift, and self-restraint, an orientation toward the future rather than the past, and a conferral of dignity and prestige upon merchants and inventors rather than just on soldiers, priests, and courtiers. Napoleon, that exponent of martial glory, smiffed at England as a nation of shopkeepers. But at the time Britons earned 83% more than Frenchmen and enjoyed a third more calories, and we all know what happened at Waterloo.15. The great escape in Britain and the Netherlands was quickly followed by escapes in the Germanic states, the Nordic countries, and Britain's colonial offshoots in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States. 
In a theory that could only have been thought up by an assimilated German Jew, the sociologist Max Weber proposed in 1905 that capitalism depended on a Protestant ethic. But the Catholic countries of Europe soon zoomed out of poverty too, and a succession of other escapes shown in Figure 8 to 2 have put the light of various theories explaining why Buddhism, Confucianism, Hinduism, or generic Asian, or Latin, values were incompatible with dynamic market economies. Figure 8 to 2, GDP per capita, 1600 2015. Source our World in Data, Rosa 2016C, based on data from the World Bank and from Madison Project 2014. The non-British curves in Figure 8 to 2 tell of a second astonishing chapter in the story of prosperity. Starting in the late 20th century, poor countries have been escaping from poverty in their turn. The Great Escape is becoming the Great Convergence. Point 16. Countries that until recently were miserably poor have become comfortably rich, such as South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore. My Singaporean former mother-in-law recalls a childhood dinner at which her family split an egg four ways. Since 1995, 30 of the world's 109 developing countries, including countries as diverse as Bangladesh, El Salvador, Ethiopia, Georgia, Mongolia, Mozambique, Panama, Rwanda, Uzbekistan, and Vietnam, have enjoyed economic growth rates that amount to a doubling of income every 18 years. Another 40 countries have had rates that would double income every 35 years, which is comparable to the historical growth rate of the United States. 17. It's remarkable enough to see that by 2008 China and India had the same per capita income that Sweden had in 1950 and 1920, respectively, but more remarkable still when we remember how many capitas this income was per 1.3 and 1.2 billion people. By 2008 the world's population, all 6.7 billion of them, had an average income equivalent to that of Western Europe in 1964. And no, it's not just because the rich are getting even richer, though of course they are, a topic we will examine in the next chapter. Extreme poverty is being eradicated, and the world is becoming middle class. 18. Figure 8 to 3, World Income Distribution, 1800, 1975, and 2015. Source. Gapminder, Viola Rosling. The scale is in 2011 international dollars. The statistician Ola Rosling, Hans's son, has displayed the worldwide distribution of income as histograms, in which the height of the curve indicates the proportion of people at a given income level, for three historical periods figure 8 to 3.19. In 1800, at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, most people everywhere were poor. The average income was equivalent to that in the poorest countries in Africa today, about $500 a year in international dollars, and almost 95% of the world lived in what counts today as extreme poverty, less than $1.90 a day. By 1975, Europe and its offshoots had completed the Great Escape, leaving the rest of the world behind, with one-tenth their income, in the lower hump of a camel-shaped curve. 20. In the 21st century the camel has become a dromedary, with a single hump shifted to the right and a much lower tail on the left, the world had become richer and more equal. 21. The slices to the left of the dotted line deserve their own picture. Figure 8 to 4 shows the percentage of the world's population that lives in extreme poverty. Admittedly, any cutoff for that condition must be arbitrary, but the United Nations and the World Bank do their best by combining the national poverty lines from a sample of developing countries, which are in turn based on the income of a typical family that manages to feed itself. In 1996 it was the alliterative, a dollar a day, per person, currently it's set at $1.90 a day in 2011 international 22 cents. Curves with more generous cutoffs are higher and shallower but also skitter downward. 
23. Notice not just the shape of the curve but how low it has sunk, to 10%. In 200 years the rate of extreme poverty in the world has tanked from 90% to 10, with almost half that decline occurring in the last 35 years. Figure 8 to 4, Extreme Poverty Proportion 18-20-2015 Sources. Our World in Data. Rosa and Ortiz Ospina 2017, based on data from Bourguignon and Morrison 2002 18 20 92 averaging their extreme poverty and poverty percentages for commensurability with data on extreme poverty for 1981-2015 from the World Bank 2016 grams. The world's progress can be appreciated in two ways. By one reckoning, the proportions and per capita rates I have been plotting are the morally relevant measure of progress, because they fit with John Rawls's thought experiment for defining a just society, specify a world in which you would agree to be incarnated as a random citizen from behind a veil of ignorance as to that citizen's circumstances. Point two four. A world with a higher percentage of long-lived, Healthy, well fed, well off people is a world in which one would prefer to play the lottery of birth. But by another reckoning, absolute numbers matter, too. Every additional long lived, healthy, well fed, well off person is a sentient being capable of happiness, and the world is a better place for having more of them. Also, an increase in the number of people who can withstand the grind of entropy in the struggle of evolution is a testimonial to the sheer magnitude of the benevolent powers of science, markets, good government, and other modern institutions. In the stacked layer graph in figure 8 to 5, the thickness of the bottom slab represents the number of people living in extreme poverty, the thickness of the top slab represents the number not living in poverty, and the height of the stack represents the population of the world. It shows that the number of poor people declined just as the number of all people exploded, from 3.7 billion in 1970 to 7.3 billion in 2015. Max Rosa points out that if news outlets truly reported the changing state of the world, they could have run the headline number of people in extreme poverty fell by 137,000 since yesterday every day for the last 25 years. We live in a world not just with a smaller proportion of extremely poor people but with a smaller number of them, and with 6.6 .6 billion people who are not extremely poor. Figure 8 to 5, Extreme Poverty, Number 18 20 20 15. Sources Our World in Data, Rosa and Ortiz Ospina 2017, based on data from Bourguignon and Morrison 2002 18 20 19 92, and the World Bank 2016 Grams 1981 2015. Most surprises in history are unpleasant surprises, but this news came as a pleasant shock even to the optimists. In 2000 the United Nations laid out eight Millennium Development Goals, their starting lines backdated to 1990.25 at the time, cynical observers of that underperforming organization dismissed the targets as aspirational boilerplate cut the global poverty rate in half, lifting a billion people out of poverty, in 25 years. Yeah, yeah. But the world reached the goal five years ahead of schedule. Development experts are still rubbing their eyes. Deaton writes, this is perhaps the most important fact about well-being in the world since World War II. 26. The economist Robert Lucas, like Deaton, a Nobel laureate, said, the consequences for human welfare involved, in understanding rapid economic development, are simply staggering. Once one starts to think about them, it is hard to think about anything else. 27. Let's not stop thinking about tomorrow. Though it's always dangerous to extrapolate a historical curve, what happens when we try? If we align a ruler with the World Bank data in figure 8 to 4, we find that it crosses the x-axis indicating a poverty rate of zero in 2026. 
the UN gave itself a cushion in its 2015 Sustainable Development Goals, the successor to its Millennium Development Goals, and set a target of ending extreme poverty for all people everywhere. By 2030.28, ending extreme poverty for all people everywhere. May I live to see the day. Not even Jesus was that optimistic, he told a supplicant, the poor you will always have with you. Of course that day is a ways off. Hundreds of millions of people remain in extreme poverty, and getting to zero will require a greater effort than just extrapolating along a ruler. Though the numbers are dwindling in countries like India and Indonesia, they are increasing in the poorest of the poor countries, like Congo, Haiti, and Sudan, and the last pockets of poverty will be the hardest to eliminate. 29. Also, as we approach the goal we should move the goalposts, since not so extreme poverty is still poverty. In introducing the concept of progress I warned against confusing hard-won headway with a process that magically takes place by itself. The point of calling attention to progress is not self-congratulation but identifying the causes so we can do more of what works. And since we know that something has worked, it's unnecessary to keep depicting the developing world as a basket case to shake people out of their apathy, with the danger that they will think that additional support would just be throwing money down a rat hole. Point three zero. So what is the world doing right? As with most forms of progress, a lot of good things happen at once and reinforce one another, so it's hard to identify a first domino. Cynical explanations, such as that the enrichment is a one-time dividend of a surge in the price of oil and other commodities, or that the statistics are inflated by the rise of populist China, have been examined and dismissed. Radlett and other development experts point to five causes. Point three one. In 1976, Radlett writes, Mao single-handedly and dramatically changed the direction of global poverty with one simple act. He died. 32. Though China's rise is not exclusively responsible for the Great Convergence, the country's sheer bulk is bound to move the totals around, and the explanations for its progress apply elsewhere. The death of Mao Zedong is emblematic of three of the major causes of the Great Convergence. The first is the decline of communism together with intrusive socialism. For reasons we have seen, market economies can generate wealth prodigiously while totalitarian planned economies impose scarcity, stagnation, and often famine. Market economies, in addition to reaping the benefits of specialization and providing incentives for people to produce things that other people want, solve the problem of coordinating the efforts of hundreds of millions of people by using prices to propagate information about need and availability far and wide, a computational problem that no planner is brilliant enough to solve from a central bureau. Point three three. A shift from collectivization, centralized control, government monopolies, and suffocating permit bureaucracies what in India was called, the license raj, to open economies took place on a number of fronts beginning in the 1980s. They included Deng Xiaoping's embrace of capitalism in China, the collapse of the Soviet Union and its domination of Eastern Europe, and the liberalization of the economies of India, Brazil, Vietnam, and other countries. Though intellectuals are apt to do a spit take when they read a defense of capitalism, its economic benefits are so obvious that they don't need to be shown with numbers. They can literally be seen from space. A satellite photograph of Korea showing the capitalist south aglow in light and the communist north a pit of darkness vividly illustrates the contrast in the wealth-generating capability between the two economic systems, holding geography, history, and culture constant. Other matched pairs with an experimental group and a control group lead to the same conclusion. West and East Germany when they were divided by the Iron Curtain. Botswana vs. Zimbabwe under Robert Mugabe. Chile vs. Venezuela under Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro. The latter once wealthy, oil-rich country now suffering from widespread hunger and a critical shortage of medical care. Point three four.
It's important to add that the market economies which blossomed in the more fortunate parts of the developing world were not the laissez-faire anarchies of right-wing fantasies and left-wing nightmares. To varying degrees, their governments invested in education, public health, infrastructure, and agricultural and job training, together with social insurance and poverty reduction programs. Point three five. Raidlet's second explanation of the Great Convergence is leadership. Mao imposed more than communism on China. He was a mercurial megalomaniac who foisted crack-brain schemes on the country, such as the Great Leap Forward with its gargantuan communes, useless backyard smelters, and screwball agronomic practices, and the Cultural Revolution, which turned the younger generation into gangs of thugs who terrorized teachers, managers, and descendants of rich peasants. Point three six. During the decades of stagnation from the 1970s to the early 1990s, many other developing countries were commandeered by psychopathic strongmen with ideological, religious, tribal, paranoid, or self-aggrandizing agendas rather than a mandate to enhance the well-being of their citizens. Depending on their sympathy or antipathy for communism, they were propped up by the Soviet Union or the United States under the principle, he may be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. 37. The 1990s and 2000s saw a spread of democracy chapter 14, and the rise of level-headed, humanistic leaders, not just national statesmen like Nelson Mandela, Corazon Aquino, and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf but local religious and civil society leaders acting to improve the lives of their compatriots. Point three eight. A third cause was the end of the Cold War. It not only pulled the rug out from under a number of tinpot dictators but snuffed out many of the civil wars that had racked developing countries since they attained independence in the 1960s. Civil war is both a humanitarian disaster and an economic one, as facilities are destroyed, resources are diverted, children are kept out of school, and managers and workers are pulled away from work or killed. The economist Paul Collier, who calls war, development in reverse, has estimated that a typical civil war costs a country $50 billion.39. A fourth cause is globalization, in particular the explosion in trade made possible by container ships and jet airplanes and by the liberalization of tariffs and other barriers to investment and trade. Classical economics and common sense agree that a larger trading network should make everyone, on average, better off. As countries specialize in different goods and services, they can produce them more efficiently, and it doesn't cost them much more to offer their wares to billions of people than to thousands. At the same time buyers, shopping for the best price in a global bazaar, can get more of what they want. Common sense is less likely to appreciate a corollary called comparative advantage, which predicts that, on average, everyone is better off when each country sells the goods and services that it can produce most efficiently even if the buyers could produce them still more efficiently themselves. Notwithstanding the horror that the word elicits in many parts of the political spectrum, globalization, development analysts agree, has been a bonanza for the poor. Deaton notes, some argue that globalization is a neoliberal conspiracy designed to enrich a very few at the expense of many. If so, that conspiracy was a disastrous failure, or at least, it helped more than a billion people as an unintended consequence. If only unintended consequences always worked so favorably. 40. To be sure, the industrialization of the developing world, like the Industrial Revolution two centuries before it, has produced working conditions that are harsh by the standards of modern rich countries and have elicited bitter condemnation. The Romantic movement in the 19th century was partly a reaction to the dark satanic mills, as William Blake called them, and since that time a loathing of industry has been a sacred value of C. P. Snow's second culture of literary intellectuals. Point four one. Nothing in Snow's essay enraged his assailant F. R. Leavis as much as this passage. It is all very well for us, 
sitting pretty, to think that material standards of living don't matter all that much. It is all very well for one, as a personal choice, to reject industrialization. Do a modern Walden if you like, and if you go without much food, see most of your children die in infancy, despise the comforts of literacy, accept 20 years off your own life, then I respect you for the strength of your aesthetic revulsion. But I don't respect you in the slightest if, even passively, you try to impose the same choice on others who are not free to choose. In fact, we know what their choice would be. 4. With singular unanimity, in any country where they have had the chance, the poor have walked off the land into the factories as fast as the factories could take them. Point for two. As we have seen, Snow was accurate in his claims about advances in life and health, and he was also right that the appropriate standard in considering the plight of the poor in industrializing countries is the set of alternatives available to them where and when they live. Snow's argument is being echoed 50 years later by development experts such as Raidlett, who observes that, while working on the factory floor is often referred to as sweatshop labor, it is often better than the granddaddy of all sweatshops, working in the fields as an agricultural day laborer. When I lived in Indonesia in the early 1990s, I arrived with a somewhat romanticized view of the beauty of people working in rice paddies, together with reservations about the rapidly growing factory jobs. The longer I was there, the more I recognized how incredibly difficult it is to work in the rice fields. It's a back-breaking grind, with people eking out the barest of livings by bending over for hours in the hot sun to terrace the fields plant the seeds, pull the weeds, transplant the seedlings, chase the pests, and harvest the grain. Standing in the pools of water brings leeches and the constant risk of malaria, encephalitis, and other diseases. And, of course, it is hot, all the time. So, it was not too much of a surprise that when factory jobs opened offering wages of $2 a day, hundreds of people lined up just to get a shot at applying point for three. The benefits of industrial employment can go beyond material living standards. For the women who get these jobs, it can be a liberation. In her article, The Feminist Side of Sweatshops, Chelsea Follett, the managing editor of Human Progress, recounts that factory work in the 19th century offered women an escape from the traditional gender roles of farm and village life, and so was held by some men at the time, sufficient to damn to infamy the most worthy and virtuous girl. The girls themselves did not always see it that way. A textile mill worker in Lowell, Massachusetts, wrote in 1840. We are collected. To get money. As much of it and as fast as we can. Strange would it be, if in money-loving New England, one of the most lucrative female employments should be rejected because it is toilsome, or because some people are prejudiced against it. Yankee girls have too much independence for that point four four. Here again, experiences during the Industrial Revolution prefigure those in the developing world today. Kavita Ramdas, the head of the Global Fund for Women, said in 2001 that in an Indian village, all there is for a woman is to obey her husband and relatives, pound millet, and sing. If she moves to town, she can get a job, start a business, and get education for her children. 45. An analysis in Bangladesh confirmed that the women who worked in the garment industry, as my grandparents did in 1930s Canada, enjoyed rising wages, later marriage, and fewer and better educated children. 46. Over the course of a generation, slums, barrios, and favelas can morph into suburbs, and the working class can become middle class. 47. To appreciate the long-term benefits of industrialization one does not have to accept its cruelties. One can imagine an alternative history of the Industrial Revolution in which modern sensibilities applied earlier and the factories operated without children and with better working conditions for the adults. Today there are doubtless factories in the developing world that could offer as many jobs and still turn a profit while treating their workers more humanely. 
Pressure from trade negotiators and consumer protests has measurably improved working conditions in many places, and it is a natural progression as countries get richer and more integrated into the global community as we will see in chapters 12 and 17 when we look at the history of working conditions in our own society. Point four eight. Progress consists not in accepting every change as part of an indivisible package, as if we had to make a yes or no decision on whether the industrial revolution, or globalization, is a good thing or bad thing, exactly as each has unfolded in every detail. Progress consists of unbundling the features of a social process as much as we can to maximize the human benefits while minimizing the harms. The last, and in many analyzers the most important, contributor to the great convergence is science and technology. Point for nine. Life is getting cheaper, in a good way. Thanks to advances in know how, an hour of labor can buy more food, health, education, clothing, building materials, and small necessities and luxuries than it used to. Not only can people eat cheaper food and take cheaper medicines, but children can wear cheap plastic sandals instead of going barefoot, and adults can hang out together getting their hair done or watching a soccer game using cheap solar panels and appliances. As for good advice on health, farming, and business, it's better than cheap, it's free. Today about half the adults in the world own a smartphone, and there are as many subscriptions as people. In parts of the world without roads, landlines, postal service, newspapers, or banks, mobile phones are more than a way to share gossip and cat photos, they are a major generator of wealth. They allow people to transfer money, order supplies, track the weather and markets, find day labor, get advice on health and farming practices, even obtain a primary education. Point five zero. An analysis by the economist Robert Jensen subtitled, The Micro and Macro Economics of Information, showed how South Indian small fishermen increased their income and lowered the local price of fish by using their mobile phones at sea to find the market which offered the best price that day, sparing them from having to unload their perishable catch on fish-glutted towns while other towns went fishless.51. In this way mobile phones are allowing hundreds of millions of small farmers and fishers to become the omniscient rational actors in the ideal frictionless markets of economics textbooks. According to one estimate, every cell phone adds $3,000 to the annual GDP of a developing country.52. The beneficent power of knowledge has rewritten the rules of global development. Development experts differ on the wisdom of foreign aid. Some argue that it does more harm than good by enriching corrupt governments and competing with local commerce. Point five three. Others cite recent numbers which suggest that intelligently allocated aid has in fact done tremendous good. Point five four. But while they disagree on the effects of donated food and dollars, all agree that donated technology, medicines, electronics, crop varieties, and best practices in agriculture, business, and public health, has been an unalloyed boon. As Jefferson noted, he who receives an idea from me receives instruction without lessening mine. And for all the emphasis I've placed on GDP per capita, the value of knowledge has made that measure less relevant to what we really care about, quality of life. If I had squeezed a line for Africa into the lower right corner of figure 8 to 3, it would look unimpressive. The line would curve upward, to be sure, but without the exponential blast-off of the lines for Europe and Asia. Charles Kenny emphasizes that the actual progress of Africa belies the shallow slope, because health, longevity, and education are so much more affordable than they used to be. Though in general people in richer countries live longer, a relationship called the Preston Curve, after the economist who discovered it the whole curve is being pushed upward, as everyone is living longer regardless of income.55. In the richest country two centuries ago the Netherlands' life expectancy was just 40, and in no country was it above 45. Today, 
Life expectancy in the poorest country in the world, the Central African Republic, is 54, and in no country is it below 45.56. Though it's easy to smear at national income as a shallow and materialistic measure, it correlates with every indicator of human flourishing, as we will repeatedly see in the chapters to come. Most obviously, GDP per capita correlates with longevity, health, and nutrition.57. Less obviously, it correlates with higher ethical values like peace, freedom, human rights, and tolerance.58. Richer countries, on average, fight fewer wars with each other. Chapter 11 are less likely to be riven by civil wars. Chapter 11 are more likely to become and stay democratic. Chapter 14 and have greater respect for human rights. Chapter 14, on average, that is, Arab oil states are rich but repressive. The citizens of richer countries have greater respect for emancipative or liberal values such as women's equality, free speech, gay rights, participatory democracy, and protection of the environment. Chapters 10 and 15. Not surprisingly, as countries get richer, they get happier. Chapter 18. More surprisingly, as countries get richer, they get smarter. Chapter 16.59. In explaining this Somalia to Sweden continuum, with poor violent repressive unhappy countries at one end and rich peaceful liberal happy ones at the other, correlation is not causation, and other factors like education, geography, history, and culture may play roles.60. But when the quants try to tease them apart, they find that economic development does seem to be a major mover of human welfare.61. In an old academic joke, a dean is presiding over a faculty meeting when a genie appears and offers him one of three wishes, money, fame, or wisdom. The dean replies, that's easy. I'm a scholar. I've devoted my life to understanding. Of course I'll take wisdom. The genie waves his hand and vanishes in a puff of smoke. The smoke clears to reveal the dean with his head in his hands, lost in thought. A minute elapses. Ten minutes. Fifteen. Finally a professor calls out. Well. Well. The dean mutters. I should have taken the money. Chapter 9. Inequality. But is it all going to the rich? That's a natural question to ask in developed countries in the second decade of the 21st century, when economic inequality has become an obsession. Pope Francis called it the root of social evil, Barack Obama, the defining challenge of our time. Between 2009 and 2016, the proportion of articles in the New York Times containing the word inequality soared tenfold, reaching 1 in 73.1 The new conventional wisdom is that the richest 1% have skimmed off all the economic growth of recent decades, and everyone else is treading water or slowly sinking. If so, the explosion of wealth documented in the previous chapter would no longer be worth celebrating, since it would have ceased contributing to overall human welfare. Economic inequality has long been a signature issue of the left, and it rose in prominence after the Great Recession began in 2007. It ignited the Occupy Wall Street movement in 2011 and the presidential candidacy of the self-described socialist Bernie Sanders in 2016, who proclaimed that, a nation will not survive morally or economically when so few have so much, while so many have so little. 2. But in that year the revolution devoured its children and propelled the candidacy of Donald Trump, who claimed that the United States had become a third world country, and blamed the declining fortunes of the working class not on Wall Street and the 1% but on immigration and foreign trade. The left and right ends of the political spectrum, incensed by economic inequality for their different reasons, curled around to meet each other, and their shared cynicism about the modern economy helped elect the most radical American president in recent times. Has rising inequality really immiserated the majority of citizens? Economic inequality undoubtedly has increased in most Western countries since its low point around 1980, 
particularly in the United States and other English-speaking countries, and especially in the contrast between the very richest and everyone else. Point three. Economic inequality is usually measured by the Gini coefficient, a number that can vary between zero, when everyone has the same as everyone else, and one, when one person has everything and everyone else has nothing. Gini values generally range from 0.25 for the most egalitarian income distributions, such as in Scandinavia after taxes and benefits, to 0.7 for a highly unequal distribution such as the one in South Africa. In the United States, the Gini index for market income before taxes and benefits rose from 0.44 in 1984 to 0.51 in 2012. Inequality can also be measured by the proportion of total income that is earned by a given fraction quantile of the population. In the United States, the share of income going to the richest 1% grew from 8% in 1980 to 18% in 2015, while the share going to the richest tenth of 1% grew from 2% to 8.4%. There's no question that some of the phenomena falling under the inequality rubric there are many are serious and must be addressed if only to diffuse the destructive agendas they have incited, such as abandoning market economies, technological progress, and foreign trade. Inequality is devilishly complicated to analyze. In a population of 1 million, there are 999,999 ways in which they can be unequal, and the subject has filled many books. I need a chapter on the topic because so many people have been swept up in the dystopian rhetoric and see inequality is a sign that modernity has failed to improve the human condition. As we will see, this is wrong, and for many reasons. The starting point for understanding inequality in the context of human progress is to recognize that income inequality is not a fundamental component of well-being. It is not like health prosperity, knowledge, safety, peace, and the other areas of progress I examine in these chapters. The reason is captured in an old joke from the Soviet Union. Igor and Boris are dirt poor peasants, barely scratching enough crops from their small plots of land to feed their families. The only difference between them is that Boris owns a scrawny goat. One day a fairy appears to Igor and grants him a wish. Igor says, I wish that Boris's goat should die. The point of the joke, of course, is that the two peasants have become more equal but that neither is better off, aside from Igor's indulging his spiteful envy. The point is made with greater nuance by the philosopher Harry Frankfurt in his 2015 book on inequality.5. Frankfurt argues that inequality itself is not morally objectionable, what is objectionable is poverty. If a person lives a long, healthy, pleasurable, and stimulating life, then how much money the Joneses earn, how big their house is, and how many cars they drive are morally irrelevant. Frankfurt writes, from the point of view of morality, it is not important everyone should have the same. What is morally important is that each should have enough. 6. Indeed, a narrow focus on economic inequality can be destructive if it distracts us into killing Boris's goat instead of figuring out how Igor can get one. The confusion of inequality with poverty comes straight out of the lump fallacy. The mindset in which wealth is a finite resource, like an antelope carcass, which has to be divvied up in zero-sum fashion, so that if some people end up with more, others must have less. As we just saw, wealth is not like that. Since the Industrial Revolution, it has expanded exponentially. 7. That means that when the rich get richer, the poor can get richer, too. Even experts repeat the lump fallacy, presumably out of rhetorical zeal rather than conceptual confusion. Thomas Piketty, whose 2014 bestseller Capital in the 21st century became a talisman in the uproar over inequality, wrote, The poorer half of the population are as poor today as they were in the past, with barely 5% of total wealth in 2010, just as in 1910. 8. 
But total wealth today is vastly greater than it was in 1910, so if the poor are half own the same proportion, they are far richer, not, as poor. A more damaging consequence of the lump fallacy is the belief that if some people get richer, they must have stolen more than their share from everyone else. A famous illustration by the philosopher Robert Nosick, updated for the 21st century, shows why this is wrong. Point nine. Among the world's billionaires is J. K. Rowling, author of the Harry Potter novels, which have sold more than 400 million copies and have been adapted into a series of films seen by a similar number of people. Point one zero. Suppose that a billion people have handed over $10 each for the pleasure of a Harry Potter paperback or movie ticket, with a tenth of the proceeds going to Rowling. She has become a billionaire, increasing inequality, but she has made people better off, not worse off which is not to say that every rich person has made people better off. This doesn't mean that Rowling's wealth is just deserts for her effort or skill, or a reward for the literacy and happiness she added to the world, no committee ever judged that she deserved to be that rich. Her wealth arose as a byproduct of the voluntary decisions of billions of book buyers and moviegoers. To be sure, there may be reasons to worry about inequality itself, not just poverty. Perhaps most people are like Igor and their happiness is determined by how they compare with their fellow citizens rather than how well off they are in absolute terms. When the rich get too rich, everyone else feels poor, so inequality lowers well-being even if everyone gets richer. This is an old idea in social psychology, variously called the theory of social comparison, reference groups, status anxiety, or relative deprivation. Point one one. But the idea must be kept in perspective. Imagine Seema, an illiterate woman in a poor country who is village-bound, has lost half her children to disease, and will die at 50, as do most of the people she knows. Now imagine Sally, an educated person in a rich country who has visited several cities and national parks, has seen her children grow up, and will live to 80, but is stuck in the lower middle class. It's conceivable that Sally, demoralized by the conspicuous wealth she will never attain, is not particularly happy, and she might even be unhappier than Seema, who is grateful for small mercies. Yet it would be mad to suppose that Sally is not better off, and positively depraved to conclude that one may as well not try to improve Seema's life because it might improve her neighbor's lives even more and leave her no happier. Point one two. In any case, the thought experiment is moot, because in real life Sally almost certainly is happier. Contrary to an earlier belief that people are so mindful of their richer compatriots that they keep resetting their internal happiness meter to the baseline no matter how well they are doing, we will see in Chapter 18 that richer people and people in richer countries are on average happier than poorer people and people in poorer countries. Point one three. But even if people are happier when they and their countries get richer, might they become more miserable if others around them are still richer than they are, that is, as economic inequality increases? In their well-known book The Spirit Level, the epidemiologists Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett claim that countries with greater income inequality also have higher rates of homicide, imprisonment, teen pregnancy, infant mortality, physical and mental illness, social distrust, obesity, and substance abuse. Point one four. The economic inequality causes the ills, they argue. Unequal societies make people feel that they are pitted in a winner-take-all competition for dominance, and the stress makes them sick and self-destructive. The spirit level theory has been called, the left's new theory of everything, and it is as problematic as any other theory that leaps from a tangle of correlations to a single cause explanation. For one thing, it's not obvious that people are whipped into competitive anxiety by the existence of J. K. Rowling and Sergey Brin as opposed to their own, local rivals for professional, romantic, and social success. Worse. 
Economically egalitarian countries like Sweden and France differ from lopsided countries like Brazil and South Africa in many ways other than their income distribution. The egalitarian countries are, among other things, richer, better educated, better governed, and more culturally homogeneous, so a raw correlation between inequality and happiness or any other social good, may show only that there are many reasons why it's better to live in Denmark than in Uganda. Wilkinson and Pickett's sample was restricted to developed countries, but even within that sample the correlations are evanescent, coming and going with choices about which countries to include.15. Wealthy but unequal countries, such as Singapore and Hong Kong, are often socially healthier than poorer but more equal countries, such as those of ex-communist Eastern Europe. Most damagingly, the sociologists Jonathan Curley and Mariah Evans have snipped the causal link joining inequality to happiness in a study of 200,000 people in 68 societies over three decades.16. We will examine how happiness and life satisfaction are measured in Chapter 18. Kelly and Evans held constant the major factors that are known to affect happiness, including GDP per capita, age, sex, education, marital status, and religious attendance, and found that the theory that inequality causes unhappiness, comes to shipwreck on the rock of the facts. In developing countries, inequality is not dispiriting but hardening. People in the more unequal societies are happier. The authors suggest that whatever envy, status anxiety, or relative deprivation people may feel in poor, unequal countries is swamped by hope. Inequality is seen as a harbinger of opportunity, a sign that education and other routes to upward mobility might pay off for them and their children. Among developed countries other than formerly communist ones, inequality made no difference one way or another. In formerly communist countries, the effects were also equivocal. Inequality hurt the aging generation that grew up under communism, but helped or made no difference to the younger generations. The fickle effects of inequality on well-being bring up another common confusion in these discussions, the conflation of inequality with unfairness. Many studies in psychology have shown that people, including young children, prefer windfalls to be split evenly among participants, even if everyone ends up with less overall. That led some psychologists to posit a syndrome called an equity aversion, an apparent desire to spread the wealth. But in their recent article, Why People Prefer Unequal Societies, the psychologists Christina Starmans, Mark Sheskin, and Paul Bloom took another look at the studies and found that people prefer unequal distributions, both among fellow participants in the lab and among citizens in their country, as long as they sense that the allocation is fair, that the bonuses go to harder workers, more generous helpers, or even the lucky winners of an impartial lottery.17. There is no evidence so far, the authors conclude, that children or adults possess any general aversion to inequality. People are content with economic inequality as long as they feel that the country is meritocratic, and they get angry when they feel it isn't. Narratives about the causes of inequality loom larger in people's minds than the existence of inequality. That creates an opening for politicians to rouse the rabble by singling out cheaters who take more than their fair share. Welfare queens, immigrants, foreign countries, bankers, or the rich, sometimes identified with ethnic minorities.18. In addition to effects on individual psychology, inequality has been linked to several kinds of society-wide dysfunction, including economic stagnation, financial instability, intergenerational immobility, and political influence peddling. These harms must be taken seriously, but here too the leap from correlation to causation has been contested.19. Either way, I suspect that it's less effective to aim at the Gini index as a deeply buried root cause of many social ills than to zero in on solutions to each problem. 
investment in research and infrastructure to escape economic stagnation, regulation of the finance sector to reduce instability, broader access to education and job training to facilitate economic mobility, electoral transparency and finance reform to eliminate illicit influence, and so on. The influence of money on politics is particularly pernicious because it can distort every government policy, but it's not the same issue as income inequality. After all, in the absence of electoral reform the richest donors can get the ear of politicians whether they earn 2% of national income or 8% of it.20. Economic inequality, then, is not itself a dimension of human well-being, and it should not be confused with unfairness or with poverty. Let's now turn from the moral significance of inequality to the question of why it has changed over time. The simplest narrative of the history of inequality is that it comes with modernity. We must have begun in a state of original equality, because when there is no wealth, everyone has equal shares of nothing, and then, when wealth is created, some can have more of it than others. Inequality, in this story, started at zero, and as wealth increased over time, inequality grew with it. But the story is not quite right. Hunter-gatherers are by all appearances highly egalitarian, a fact that inspired Marx and Engels's theory of primitive communism. But ethnographers point out that the image of forager egalitarianism is misleading. For one thing, the hunter-gatherer bands that are still around for us to study are not representative of an ancestral way of life, because they have been pushed into marginal lands and lead nomadic lives that make the accumulation of wealth impossible, if for no other reason than that it would be a nuisance to carry around. But sedentary hunter-gatherers, such as the natives of the Pacific Northwest, which is flush with salmon, berries, and fur-bearing animals, were florid in egalitarians, and developed a hereditary nobility who kept slaves, hoarded luxuries, and flaunted their wealth in gaudy potlatches. Also, while nomadic hunter-gatherers share meat, since hunting is largely a matter of luck and sharing a windfall ensures everyone against days in which they come home empty-handed, they are less likely to share plant foods, since gathering is a matter of effort, and indiscriminate sharing would allow free riding point to one. Some degree of inequality is universal across societies, as is an awareness of inequality point to two. A recent survey of inequality in the forms of wealth that are possible for hunter-gatherers houses, boats, and hunting and foraging returns found that they were, far from a state of primitive communism, the Guinness averaged 0.33, close to the value for disposable income in the United States in 2012.23. What happens when a society starts to generate substantial wealth? An increase in absolute inequality, the difference between the richest and poorest, is almost a mathematical necessity. In the absence of an income distribution authority that parcels out identical shares, some people are bound to take greater advantage of the new opportunities than others, whether by luck, skill, or effort, and they will reap disproportionate rewards. An increase in relative inequality, measured by the Gini or income shares, is not mathematically necessary, but it is highly likely. According to a famous conjecture by the economist Simon Kuznets, as countries get richer they should get less equal, because some people leave farming for higher paying lines of work while the rest stay in rural squalor. But eventually a rising tide lifts all the boats. As more of the population gets swept into the modern economy, inequality should decline, tracing out an inverted U. This hypothetical arc of inequality over time is called the Kuznets curve.24. In the preceding chapter we saw hints of a Kuznets curve for inequality between countries. As the Industrial Revolution gathered steam, European countries made a great escape from universal poverty, leaving the other countries behind. As Deaton observes, a better world makes for a world of differences, escapes make for inequality. 25. Then, as globalization proceeded and wealth generating know how spread, poor countries started catching up in a great convergence. 
We saw hints of a drop in global inequality in the blast-off of GDP in Asian countries figure eight to two in the morphing of the world income distribution from snail to two-humped camel to one-humped dromedary figure eight to three and in the plunging proportion figure eight to four and number figure eight to five of people living in extreme poverty. To confirm that these gains really constitute a decline in inequality, that poor countries are getting richer faster than the rich countries are getting richer, we need a single measure that combines them, an international genie, which treats each country like a person. Figure 9 to 1 shows that the international genie rose from a low of 0.16 in 1820, when all countries were poor, to a high of 0.56 in 1970, when some were rich. And then, as Kuznets predicted, it plateaued and began to droop in the 1980s.26. But an international genie is a bit misleading, because it counts an improvement in the living standards of a billion Chinese as equivalent to an improvement in the standards of, say, 4 million Panamanians. Figure 9 to 1 also shows an international genie calculated by the economist Branko Milanovic in which every country counts in proportion to its population, making the human impact of the drop in inequality more apparent. Figure 9 to 1. International Inequality, 1820-2013. Sources. International Inequality. OECD Clio Infra Project, Mozos et al. 2014, data of for market household income across countries. Population weighted international inequality, Milanovic 2012, data for 2012 and 2013 provided by Branko Milanovic, personal communication. Still, an international genie treats all the Chinese as if they earned the same amount, all the Americans as if they earned the American average, and so on, and as a result it underestimates inequality across the human race. A global genie, in which every person counts the same, regardless of country, is harder to calculate, because it requires mixing the incomes from disparate countries into a single bowl, but two estimates are shown in figure 9-2. The lines float at different heights because they were calibrated in dollars adjusted for purchasing parity in different years, but their slopes trace out a kind of Kuznets curve. After the Industrial Revolution, global inequality rose steadily until around 1980, then started to fall. The international and global genie curves show that despite the anxiety about rising inequality within Western countries, inequality in the world is declining. That's a circuitous way to state the progress, though, what's significant about the decline in inequality is that it's a decline in poverty. Figure 9-2. Global Inequality, 1820-2011. Source. Milanovic 2016, Fig. 3.1. The left-hand curve shows 1990 international dollars of disposable income per capita. The right-hand curve shows 2005 international dollars, and combines household surveys of per capita disposable income and consumption. The version of inequality that has generated the recent alarm is the inequality within developed countries like the United States and the United Kingdom. The long view of these countries is shown in figure 9 to 3. Until recently, both countries traveled a Kuznets arc. Inequality rose during the Industrial Revolution and then began to fall, first gradually in the late 19th century, then steeply in the middle decades of the 20th. But then, starting around 1980, inequality bounced into a decidedly UN Kuznetsian rise. Let's examine each segment in turn. Figure 9 to 3. Inequality, UK and US, 1688-2013. Source. Milanovic 2016, Fig. 2.1. Disposable income per capita. The rise and fall in inequality in the 19th century reflects Kuznets's expanding economy, which gradually pulls more people into urban, skilled, and thus higher paying occupations. But the 20th century plunge, which has been called the Great Leveling or the Great Compression, had more sudden causes. 
The plunge overlaps the two world wars, and that is no coincidence. Major wars often level the income distribution point to seven. Wars destroy wealth generating capital, inflate away the assets of creditors, and induce the rich to put up with higher taxes, which the government redistributes into the paychecks of soldiers and munition workers, in turn increasing the demand for labor in the rest of the economy. Wars are just one kind of catastrophe that can generate equality by the logic of Igor and Boris. The historian Walter Scheidel identifies four horsemen of leveling, mass mobilization warfare, transformative revolution, state collapse, and lethal pandemics. In addition to obliterating wealth and, in the communist revolutions, the people who owned it, the four horsemen reduce inequality by killing large numbers of workers, driving up the wages of those who survive. Scheidel concludes, all of us who prize greater economic equality would do well to remember that with the rarest of exceptions it was only ever brought forth in sorrow. Be careful what you wish for. 28. Scheidel's warning applies to the long run of history. But modernity has brought a more benign way to reduce inequality. As we have seen, a market economy is the best poverty reduction program we know of for an entire country. It is ill-equipped, however, to provide for individuals within that country who have nothing to exchange. The young, the old, the sick, the unlucky, and others whose skills and labor are not valuable enough to others for them to earn a decent living in return. Another way of putting it is that a market economy maximizes the average, but we also care about the variance and the range. As the circle of sympathy in a country expands to encompass the poor, and as people want to ensure themselves should they ever become poor they increasingly allocate a portion of their pooled resources, that is, government funds, to alleviating that poverty. Those resources have to come from somewhere. They may come from a corporate or sales tax, or a sovereign wealth fund, but in most countries they largely come from a graduated income tax, in which richer citizens pay at a higher rate because they don't feel the loss as sharply. The net result is, redistribution, but that is something of a misnomer, because the goal is to raise the bottom, not lower the top, even if in practice the top is lowered. Those who condemn modern capitalist societies for callousness toward the poor are probably unaware of how little the pre-capitalist societies of the past spent on poor relief. It's not just that they had less to spend in absolute terms, they spent a smaller proportion of their wealth. A much smaller proportion. From the Renaissance through the early 20th century, European countries spent an average of 1.5% of their GDP on poor relief, education, and other social transfers. In many countries and periods, they spent nothing at all. 0.29. In another example of progress, sometimes called the egalitarian revolution, modern societies now devote a substantial chunk of their wealth to health, education, pensions, and income support. 0. Figure 9 to 4 shows that social spending took off in the middle decades of the 20th century in the United States, with the New Deal in the 1930s, in other developed countries, with the rise of the welfare state after World War II. Social spending now takes up a median of 22% of their GDP.31. Figure 9 to 4. Social spending, OECD countries, 1880-2016. Source. Our World in Data, Ortiz Ospina and Rosa 2016b, based on data from Linda 2004 and OECD 1985, 2014, 2017. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development includes 35 democratic states with market economies. The explosion in social spending has redefined the mission of government. From warring and policing to also nurturing. 32. Governments underwent this transformation for several reasons. Social spending inoculates citizens against the appeal of communism and fascism. Some of the benefits, like universal education and public health, are public goods that accrue to everyone, not just the direct beneficiaries. 
Many of the programs indemnify citizens against misfortunes for which they can't or won't insure themselves hence the euphemism, social safety net. And assistance to the media swages the modern conscience, which cannot bear the thought of the little match girl freezing to death, Jean Valjean imprisoned for stealing bread to save his starving sister, or the Jodes burying grandpa by the side of Route 66. Since there's no point in everyone sending money to the government and getting it right back, minus the bureaucracy's cut, social spending is designed to help people who have less money, with the bill footed by people who have more money. This is the principle known as redistribution, the welfare state, social democracy, or socialism, misleadingly, because free market capitalism is compatible with any amount of social spending. Whether or not the social spending is designed to reduce inequality, that is one of its effects, and the rise in social expenditures from the 1930s through the 1970s explains part of the decline in the Gini. Social spending demonstrates an uncanny aspect of progress that we'll encounter again in subsequent chapters. Point three three. Though I am skittish about any notion of historical inevitability, cosmic forces, or mystical arcs of justice, some kinds of social change really do seem to be carried along by an inexorable tectonic force. As they proceed, certain factions oppose them hammer and tongs, but resistance turns out to be futile. Social spending is an example. The United States is famously resistant to anything smacking of redistribution. Yet it allocates 19% of its GDP to social services, and despite the best efforts of conservatives and libertarians the spending has continued to grow. The most recent expansions are a prescription drug benefit introduced by George W. Bush and the eponymous health insurance plan known as Obamacare introduced by his successor. Indeed, social spending in the United States is even higher than it appears, because many Americans are forced to pay for health, retirement, and disability benefits through their employers rather than the government. When this privately administered social spending is added to the public portion, the United States vaults from 24th into second place among the 35 OECD countries, just behind France.34. For all their protestations against big government and high taxes, people like social spending. Social security has been called the third rail of American politics, because if politicians touch it they die. According to legend, an irate constituent at a town hall meeting warned his representative, keep your government hands off my Medicare, referring to the government health insurance program for seniors.35. No sooner did Obamacare pass than the Republican Party made it a sacred cause to repeal it, but each of their assaults on it after gaining control of the presidency in 2017 was beaten back by angry citizens at town hall meetings and legislators afraid of their ire. In Canada the top two national pastimes, after hockey, are complaining about their health care system and boasting about their health care system. Developing countries today, like developed countries a century ago, stint on social spending. Indonesia, for example, spends 2% of its GDP, India 2.5%, and China 7%. But as they get richer they become more munificent, a phenomenon called Wagner's Law.36. Between 1985 and 2012 Mexico quintupled its proportion of social spending, and Brazil's now stands at 16.37. Wagner's law appears to be not a cautionary tale about overweening government and bureaucratic bloat but a manifestation of progress. The economist Leandro Prados de la Rescogera found a strong correlation between the percentage of GDP that an OECD country allocated to social transfers as it developed between 1880 and 2000 and its score on a composite measure of prosperity, health, and education.38. And tellingly, the number of libertarian paradises in the world, developed countries without substantial social spending, is 0.39. The correlation between social spending and social well-being holds only up to a point. 
the curve levels off starting at around 25% and may even drop off at higher proportions. Social spending, like everything, has downsides. As with all insurance, it can create a moral hazard, in which the insured slack off or take foolish risks, counting on the insurer to bail them out if they fail. And since the premiums have to cover the payouts, if the actuaries get the numbers wrong or the numbers change so that more money is taken out than put in, the system can collapse. In reality social spending is never exactly like insurance but is a combination of insurance, investment, and charity. Its success thus depends on the degree to which the citizens of a country sense they are part of one community, and that fellow feeling can be strained when the beneficiaries are disproportionately immigrants or ethnic minorities. Point for zero. These tensions are inherent to social spending and will always be politically contentious. Though there is no correct amount, all developed states have decided that the benefits of social transfers outweigh the costs and have settled on moderately large amounts, cushioned by their massive wealth. Let's complete our tour of the history of inequality by turning to the final segment in Figure 9 to 3, the rise of inequality in wealthy nations that began around 1980. This is the development that inspired the claim that life has gotten worse for everyone but the richest. The rebound defies the Kuznets curve, in which inequality was supposed to have settled into a low equilibrium. Many explanations have been proffered for this surprise. Point for one. Wartime restrictions on economic competition may have been sticky, outlasting World War II, but they finally dissipated, freeing the rich to get richer from their investment income and opening up an arena of dynamic economic competition with winner-take-all payoffs. The ideological shift associated with Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher slowed the movement toward greater social spending financed by taxes on the rich while eroding social norms against extravagant salaries and conspicuous wealth. As more people stayed single or got divorced, and at the same time more power couples pulled two fat paychecks, the variance in income from household to household was bound to increase, even if the paychecks had stayed the same. A second industrial revolution, driven by electronic technologies, replayed the Kuznets' rise by creating a demand for highly skilled professionals, who pulled away from the less educated at the same time that the jobs requiring less education were eliminated by automation. Globalization allowed workers in China, India, and elsewhere to underbid their American competitors in a worldwide labor market, and the domestic companies that failed to take advantage of these offshoring opportunities were outcompeted on price. At the same time, the intellectual output of the most successful analysts, entrepreneurs, investors, and creators was increasingly available to a gargantuan worldwide market. The Pontiac worker is laid off, while J. K. Rowling becomes a billionaire. Milanovic has combined the two inequality trends of the past 30 years, declining inequality worldwide, increasing inequality within rich countries, into a single graph which pleasingly takes the shape of an elephant figure 9 to 5. This growth incidence curve sorts the world's population into 20 numerical bins or quantiles, from poorest to richest, and plots how much each bin gained or lost in real income per capita between 1988 just before the fall of the Berlin Wall, and 2008 just before the Great Recession. Figure 9 to 5, Income Gains, 1988-2008 Source. Milanovic 2016, Fig. 1.3. The cliché about globalization is that it creates winners and losers, and the elephant curve displays them as peaks and valleys. It reveals that the winners include most of humanity. The elephant's bulk, its body and head, which includes about seven-tenths of the world's population, consists of the emerging global middle class, mainly in Asia. Over this period they saw cumulative gains of 40 to 60 percent in their real incomes. The nostrils at the tip of the trunk consist of the world's richest 1 percent, who also saw their incomes soar. 
The rest of the trunk tip, which includes the next 4% down, didn't do badly either. Where the bend of the trunk hovers over the floor around the 85th percentile we see globalizations, losers, the lower middle classes of the rich world, who gained less than 10%. These are the focus of the new concern about inequality, the hollowed-out middle class, the Trump supporters, the people globalization left behind. I couldn't resist plotting the most recognizable elephant in Milanovic's herd, because it serves as a vivid mnemonic for the effects of globalization, and it rounds out a nice menagerie with the camel and dromedary in figure 8 to 3. But the curve makes the world look more unequal than it really is, for two reasons. One is that the financial crisis of 2008, which postdated the graph, had a strangely equalizing effect on the world. The Great Recession, Milanovic points out, was really a recession in North Atlantic countries. The incomes of the world's richest 1% were trimmed, but the incomes of workers elsewhere soared. In China, they doubled. Three years after the crisis we still see an elephant, but it has lowered the tip of its trunk while arching its back twice as high point for two. The other elephant distorter is a conceptual point that bedevils many discussions of inequality. Whom are we talking about when we say, the bottom fifth, or, the top one percent? Most income distributions use what economists call anonymous data, they track statistical ranges, not actual people. Point four three. Suppose I told you that the age of the median American declined from 30 in 1950 to 28 in 1970. If your first thought is, wow, how did that guy get two years younger? Then you have confused the two. The median is a rank, not a person. Readers commit the same fallacy when they read that, the top 1% in 2008, had incomes that were 50% higher than, the top 1% in 1988, and conclude that a bunch of rich people got half again richer. People move in and out of income brackets, shuffling the order, so we're not necessarily talking about the same individuals. The same is true for, the bottom fifth, and every other statistical bin. Non-anonymous or longitudinal data, which track people over time, are unavailable in most countries, so Milanovic did the next best thing and tracked individual quantiles in particular countries, so that, say, poor Indians in 1988 were no longer being compared with poor Ghanaians in 2008.44 he still got an elephantoid, but with a much higher tail and haunches, because the poorer classes of so many countries rose out of extreme poverty. The pattern remains. Globalization helped the lower and middle classes of poor countries, and the upper class of rich countries, much more than it helped the lower middle class of rich countries, but the differences are less extreme. Now that we have run through the history of inequality and seen the forces that push it around, we can evaluate the claim that the growing inequality of the past three decades means that the world is getting worse that only the rich have prospered, while everyone else is stagnating or suffering. The rich certainly have prospered more than anyone else, perhaps more than they should have, but the claim about everyone else is not accurate, for a number of reasons. Most obviously, it's false for the world as a whole. The majority of the human race has become much better off. The two-humped camel has become a one-humped dromedary. The elephant has a body the size of, well, an elephant. Extreme poverty has plummeted and may disappear. And both international and global inequality coefficients are in decline. Now, it's true that the world's poor have gotten richer in part at the expense of the American lower middle class, and if I were an American politician I would not publicly say that the trade-off was worth it. But as citizens of the world considering humanity as a whole, we have to say that the trade-off is worth it. But even in the lower and lower middle classes of rich countries, moderate income gains are not the same as a decline in living standards. Today's discussions of inequality often compare the present era unfavorably with a golden age of well-paying, dignified, blue-collar jobs that have been made obsolete by automation and globalization. 
This idyllic image is belied by contemporary depictions of the harshness of working class life in that era, both in journalistic exposes such as Michael Harrington's 1962 The Other America and in realistic films such as On the Waterfront, Blue Collar, Coal Miner's Daughter, and Norma Ray. The historian Stephanie Kuntz, a debunker of 1950s nostalgia, puts some numbers to the depictions. A full 25% of Americans, 40 to 50 million people, were poor in the mid-1950s, and in the absence of food stamps and housing programs, this poverty was searing. Even at the end of the 1950s, a third of American children were poor. 60% of Americans over 65 had incomes below $1,000 in 1958, considerably below the $3,000 to $10,000 level considered to represent middle class status. A majority of elders also lacked medical insurance. Only half the population had savings in 1959, one quarter of the population had no liquid assets at all. Even when we consider only native-born, white families, one-third could not get by on the income of the household head.45. How do we reconcile the obvious improvements in living standards in recent decades with the conventional wisdom of economic stagnation? Economists point to four ways in which inequality statistics can paint a misleading picture of the way people live their lives, each depending on a distinction we have examined. The first is the difference between relative and absolute prosperity. Just as not all children can be above average, it's not a sign of stagnation if the proportion of income earned by the bottom fifth does not increase over time. What's relevant to well-being is how much people earn, not how high they rank. A recent study by the economist Stephen Rose divided the American population into classes using fixed milestones rather than quantiles. Poor. Was defined as an income of $0.30,000 in 2014 dollars, for a family of three. Lower middle class, as $30,000 $50,000, and so on. Point four six. The study found that in absolute terms, Americans have been moving on up. Between 1979 and 2014, the percentage of poor Americans dropped from 24 to 20, the percentage in the lower middle class dropped from 24 to 17, and the percentage in the middle class shrank from 32 to 30. Where did they go? Many ended up in the upper middle class, $100,000 $350,000 which grew from 13 to 30 percent of the population, and in the upper class, which grew from 0.1 percent to 2 percent. The middle class is being hollowed out in part because so many Americans are becoming affluent. Inequality undoubtedly increased, the rich got richer faster than the poor and middle class got richer, but everyone on average got richer. The second confusion is the one between anonymous and longitudinal data. If, say the bottom fifth of the American population gained no ground in 20 years, it does not mean that Joe the plumber got the same paycheck in 1988 that he did in 2008, or one that's a bit higher, owing to cost of living increases. People earn more as they get older and gain experience, or switch from a lower paying job to a higher paying one, so Joe may have moved from the bottom fifth into, say, the middle fifth, while a younger man or woman or an immigrant took his place at the bottom. The turnover is by no means small. A recent study using longitudinal data showed that half of Americans will find themselves among the top tenth of income earners for at least one year of their working lives, and that one in nine will find themselves in the top one percent though most don't stay there for long. Point four seven. This may be one of the reasons that economic opinions are subject to the optimism gap, the, I'm okay, they're not, bias, a majority of Americans believe that the standard of living of the middle class has declined in recent years but that their own standard of living has improved. Point four eight. A third reason that rising inequality has not made the lower classes worse off is that low incomes have been mitigated by social transfers. For all its individualist ideology, the United States has a lot of redistribution. 
The income tax is still graduated, and low incomes are buffered by a hidden welfare state that includes unemployment insurance, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, temporary assistance for needy families, food stamps, and the earned income tax credit, a kind of negative income tax in which the government boosts the income of low earners. Put them together and America becomes far less unequal. In 2013 the Gini Index for American Market Income before taxes and transfers was a high point 53. For disposable income after taxes and transfers it was a moderate point 38.49. The United States has not gone as far as countries like Germany and Finland, which start off with a similar market income distribution but level it more aggressively, pushing their Guinness down into the high twos and sidestepping most of the post-1980s inequality rise. Whether or not the generous European welfare state is sustainable over the long run and transplantable to the United States, some kind of welfare state may be found in all developed countries, and it reduces inequality even when it is hidden. Point five zero. These transfers have not just reduced income inequality in itself a dubious accomplishment but boosted the incomes of the non-rich, a real one. An analysis by the economist Gary Bertless has shown that between 1979 and 2010 the disposable incomes of the lowest four income quintiles grew by 49, 37, 36, and 45 percent, respectively 0.51. And that was before the long-delayed recovery from the Great Recession. Between 2014 and 2016, median wages leapt to an all-time high 0.52. Even more significant is what has happened at the bottom of the scale. Both the left and the right have long expressed cynicism about anti-poverty programs, as in Ronald Reagan's famous quip, some years ago, the federal government declared war on poverty, and poverty won. In reality, poverty is losing. The sociologist Christopher Jenks has calculated that when the benefits from the hidden welfare state are added up, and the cost of living is estimated in a way that takes into account the improving quality and falling price of consumer goods. The poverty rate has fallen in the past 50 years by more than three quarters, and in 2013 stood at 4.8%.53. Three other analyses have come to the same conclusion. Data from one of them, by the economists Bruce Meyer and James Sullivan, are shown in the upper line in figure 9 to 6. The progress stagnated around the time of the Great Recession, but it picked up in 2015 and 2016, not shown in the graph when middle class income reached a record high and the poverty rate showed its largest drop since 1999.54 and in yet another unsung accomplishment, the poorest of the poor, the unsheltered homeless, fell in number between 2007 and 2015 by almost a third, despite the Great Recession. Point five five. Figure 9 to 6. Poverty, U.S., 1960-2016. Sources. Meyer and Sullivan 2017. Disposable income, refers to their, after-tax money income, including credits, adjusted for inflation using the bias-corrected CPIURS, and representing a family with two adults and two children. Consumption, refers to data from the BLS Consumer Expenditure Survey on food, housing, vehicles, appliances, furnishings, clothing, jewelry, insurance, and other expenses. Poverty, corresponds to the U.S. Census definition for 1980, adjusted for inflation, anchoring the poverty line in other years would result in different absolute numbers but the same trends. C. Meyer and Sullivan 2011, 2012, and 2016 for details. The lower line in figure 9 to 6 highlights the fourth way in which inequality measures understate the progress of the lower and middle classes in rich countries. 56. Income is just a means to an end. A way of paying for things that people need, want, and like, or as economists gracelessly call it, consumption. 
When poverty is defined in terms of what people consume rather than what they earn, we find that the American poverty rate has declined by 90% since 1960, from 30% of the population to just 3%. The two forces that have famously increased inequality in income have at the same time decreased inequality in what matters. The first, globalization, may produce winners and losers in income, but in consumption it makes almost everyone a winner. Asian factories, container ships, and efficient retailing bring goods to the masses that were formerly luxuries for the rich. In 2005, The Economist Jason Furman estimated that Walmart saved the typical American family $2,300 a year. 57. The second force, technology, continually revolutionizes the meaning of income, as we saw in the discussion of the paradox of value in Chapter 8. A dollar today, no matter how heroically adjusted for inflation, buys far more betterment of life than a dollar yesterday. It buys things that didn't exist, like refrigeration, electricity, toilets, vaccinations, telephones, contraception, and air travel, and it transforms things that do exist, such as a party line patched by a switchboard operator to a smartphone with unlimited talk time. Together, technology and globalization have transformed what it means to be a poor person, at least in developed countries. The old stereotype of poverty was an emaciated pauper in rags. Today, the poor are likely to be as overweight as their employers, and dressed in the same fleece, sneakers, and jeans. The poor used to be called the have-nots. In 2011, more than 95% of American households below the poverty line had electricity, running water, flush toilets, a refrigerator, a stove, and a color TV.58. A century and a half before, the Rothschilds, Astors, and Vanderbilts had none of these things. Almost half of the households below the poverty line had a dishwasher, 60% had a computer, around two-thirds had a washing machine and a clothes dryer, and more than 80% had an air conditioner, a video recorder, and a cell phone. In the golden age of economic equality in which I grew up, middle class, haves, had few or none of these things. As a result, the most precious resources of all, time, freedom, and worthy experiences, arising across the board, a topic we will explore in Chapter 17. The rich have gotten richer, but their lives haven't gotten that much better. Warren Buffett may have more air conditioners than most people, or better ones, but by historical standards the fact that a majority of poor Americans even have an air conditioner is astonishing. When the Gini index is calculated over consumption rather than income, it has remained shallow or flat. 59. Inequality in self-reported happiness in the American population has actually declined. 60. And though I find it distasteful, even grotesque, to celebrate declining Guinness for life, health, and education, as if killing off the healthiest and keeping the smartest out of school would be good for humanity, they have in fact declined for the right reasons. The lives of the poor are improving more rapidly than the lives of the rich. 61. To acknowledge that the lives of the lower and middle classes of developed countries have improved in recent decades is not to deny the formidable problems facing 21st century economies. Though disposable income has increased, the pace of the increase is slow, and the resulting lack of consumer demand may be dragging down the economy as a whole. 62. The hardships faced by one sector of the population, middle aged, less educated, non urban white Americans, are real and tragic manifested in higher rates of drug overdose, Chapter 12, and suicide, Chapter 18. Advances in robotics threaten to make millions of additional jobs obsolete. Truck drivers, for example, make up the most common occupation in a majority of states, and self-driving vehicles may send them the way of scriveners, wheelwrights, and switchboard operators. Education, a major driver of economic mobility, is not keeping up with the demands of modern economies. 
Tertiary education has soared in cost defying the expensification of almost every other good, and in poor American neighborhoods, primary and secondary education are unconscionably substandard. Many parts of the American tax system are regressive, and money buys too much political influence. Perhaps most damaging, the impression that the modern economy has left most people behind encourages Luddite and beggar thy neighbor policies that would make everyone worse off. Still, a narrow focus on income inequality and a nostalgia for the mid-20th century Great Compression are misplaced. The modern world can continue to improve even if the Gini index or top income shares stay high, as they may well do, because the forces that lifted them are not going away. Americans cannot be forced to buy Pontiacs instead of Priuses. The Harry Potter books will not be kept out of the hands of the world's children just because they turn J. K. Rolling into a billionaire. It makes little sense to make tens of millions of poor Americans pay more for clothing to save tens of thousands of jobs in the apparel industry. 63. Nor does it make sense, in the long term, to have people do boring and dangerous jobs that could be carried out more effectively by machines just to give them remunerable work. 64. Rather than tilting at inequality per se it may be more constructive to target the specific problems lumped with it. 65. An obvious priority is to boost the rate of economic growth, since it would increase everyone's slice of the pie and provide more pie to redistribute. 66. The trends of the past century, and a survey of the world's countries, point to governments playing an increasing role in both. They are uniquely suited to invest in education, basic research, and infrastructure, to underwrite health and retirement benefits relieving American corporations of their innovating mandate to provide social services, and to supplement incomes to a level above their market price, which for millions of people may decline even as overall wealth rises. 0.67. The next step in the historic trend toward greater social spending may be a universal basic income, or its close relative, a negative income tax. The idea has been brooded for decades, and its day may be coming. 68. Despite its socialist aroma, the idea has been championed by economists such as Milton Friedman, politicians such as Richard Nixon, and states such as Alaska that are associated with the political right, and today analysts across the political spectrum are toying with it. Though implementing a universal basic income is far from easy, the numbers have to add up, and incentives for education, work, and risk-taking have to be maintained, its promise cannot be ignored. It could rationalize the kludgy patchwork of the hidden welfare state, and it could turn the slow-motion disaster of robots replacing workers into a horn of plenty. Many of the jobs that robots will take over are jobs that people don't particularly enjoy, and the dividend in productivity, safety, and leisure could be a boon to humanity as long as it is widely shared. The specter of anime and meaninglessness is probably exaggerated, according to studies of regions that have experimented with a guaranteed income, and it could be met with public jobs that markets won't support and robots can't do, or with new opportunities in meaningful volunteering and other forms of effective altruism. 69. The net effect might be to reduce inequality, but that would be a side effect of raising everyone's standard of living, particularly that of the economically vulnerable. Income inequality, in sum, is not a counterexample to human progress, and we are not living in a dystopia of falling incomes that has reversed the centuries-long rise in prosperity. Nor does it call for smashing the robots, raising the drawbridge, switching to socialism, or bringing back the 50s. Let me sum up my complicated story on a complicated topic. Inequality is not the same as poverty, and it is not a fundamental dimension of human flourishing. In comparisons of well-being across countries, it pales in importance next to overall wealth. An increase in inequality is not necessarily bad. As societies escape from universal poverty, they are bound to become more unequal, and the uneven surge may be repeated when a society discovers new sources of wealth. 
Nor is a decrease in inequality always good. The most effective levelers of economic disparities are epidemics, massive wars, violent revolutions, and state collapse. For all that, the long-term trend in history since the Enlightenment is for everyone's fortunes to rise. In addition to generating massive amounts of wealth, modern societies have devoted an increasing proportion of that wealth to benefiting the less well-off. As globalization and technology have lifted billions out of poverty and created a global middle class, international and global inequality have decreased, at the same time that they enrich elites whose analytical, creative, or financial impact has global reach. The fortunes of the lower classes in developed countries have not improved nearly as much, but they have improved, often because their members rise into the upper classes. The improvements are enhanced by social spending, and by the falling cost and rising quality of the things people want. In some ways the world has become less equal, but in more ways the world's people have become better off. Chapter 10. The Environment. But is progress sustainable? A common response to the good news about our health, wealth, and sustenance is that it cannot continue. As we infest the world with our teeming numbers, guzzle the Earth's bounty heedless of its finitude, and foul our nests with pollution and waste, we are hastening an environmental day of reckoning. If overpopulation, resource depletion, and pollution don't finish us off, then climate change will. As in the chapter on inequality, I won't pretend that all the trends are positive or that the problems facing us are minor. But I will present a way of thinking about these problems that differs from the lugubrious conventional wisdom and offers a constructive alternative to the radicalism or fatalism it encourages. The key idea is that environmental problems, like other problems, are solvable, given the right knowledge. To be sure, the very idea that there are environmental problems cannot be taken for granted. From the vantage point of an individual, the Earth seems infinite, and our effects on it inconsequential. From the vantage points of science, the view is more troubling. The microscopic vantage point reveals pollutants that insidiously poison us and the species we admire and depend on. The macroscopic one reveals effects on ecosystems that may be imperceptible one action at a time but add up to tragic despoliation. Beginning in the 1960s, the environmental movement grew out of scientific knowledge, from ecology, public health, and earth and atmospheric sciences, and a romantic reverence for nature. The movement made the health of the planet a permanent priority on humanity's agenda, and as we shall see, it deserves credit for substantial achievements, another form of human progress. Ironically, many voices in the traditional environmental movement refuse to acknowledge that progress, or even that human progress is a worthy aspiration. In this chapter one will present a newer conception of environmentalism which shares the goal of protecting the air and water, species, and ecosystems but is grounded in enlightenment optimism rather than romantic declinism. Starting in the 1970s, the mainstream environmental movement latched onto a quasi-religious ideology, greenism, which can be found in the manifestos of activists as diverse as Al Gore, the Unabomber, and Pope Francis.1. Green ideology begins with an image of the Earth as a pristine ingenue which has been defiled by human rapacity. As Francis put it in his 2015 encyclical Laudato C. Si, Praise be to you, our common home is like a sister with whom we share our life. Who now cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted on her? The harm, according to this narrative, has been inexorably worsening. The earth, our home, is beginning to look more and more like an immense pile of filth. The root cause is the enlightenment commitment to reason, science, and progress. Scientific and technological progress cannot be equated with the progress of humanity in history, wrote Francis. The way to a better future lies elsewhere, namely in an appreciation of the mysterious network of relations between things, and, of course, the treasure of Christian spiritual experience. 
Unless we repent our sins by degrowth, deindustrialization, and a rejection of the false gods of science, technology, and progress, humanity will face a ghastly reckoning in an environmental judgment day. As with many apocalyptic movements, greenism is laced with misanthropy, including an indifference to starvation, an indulgence in ghoulish fantasies of a depopulated planet, and Nazi-like comparisons of human beings to vermin, pathogens, and cancer. For example, Paul Watson of the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society wrote, We need to radically and intelligently reduce human populations to fewer than one billion. Curing a body of cancer requires radical and invasive therapy, and therefore, curing the biosphere of the human virus will also require a radical and invasive approach. 2. Recently an alternative approach to environmental protection has been championed by John Asafua J., Jesse Orzubel, Andrew Barmford, Stuart Brand, Ruth DeFries, Nancy Knowlton, Ted Nordhorse, Michael Schellenberger, and others. It has been called ecomodernism, ecopragmatism, earth optimism, and the blue-green or turquoise movement, though we can also think of it as enlightenment environmentalism or humanistic environmentalism. Point 3. Ecomodernism begins with the realization that some degree of pollution is an inescapable consequence of the second law of thermodynamics. When people use energy to create a zone of structure in their bodies and homes, they must increase entropy elsewhere in the environment in the form of waste, pollution, and other forms of disorder. The human species has always been ingenious at doing this, that's what differentiates us from other mammals, and it has never lived in harmony with the environment. When native peoples first set foot in an ecosystem, they typically hunted large animals to extinction, and often burned and cleared vast swaths of forest. Point four. A dirty secret of the conservation movement is that wilderness preserves are set up only after indigenous peoples have been decimated or forcibly removed from them, including the national parks in the United States and the Serengeti in East Africa. Point five. As the environmental historian William Cronin writes, wilderness is not a pristine sanctuary, it is itself a product of civilization. When humans took up farming, they became more disruptive still. According to the paleoclimatologist William Ruddiman, the adoption of wet rice cultivation in Asia some 5,000 years ago may have released so much methane into the atmosphere from rotting vegetation as to have changed the climate. A good case can be made, he suggests, that, the people in the Iron Age and even the Late Stone Age had a much greater per capita impact on the Earth's landscape than the average modern-day person. 6. And as Brand has pointed out Chapter 7 Natural Farming is a contradiction in terms. Whenever he hears the words natural food, he is tempted to rail. No product of agriculture is the slightest bit natural to an ecologist. You take a nice complex ecosystem, chop it into rectangles, clear it to the ground, and hammer it into perpetual early succession. You bust its sod, flatten it flat, and drench it with vast quantities of constant water. Then you populate it with uniform monocrops of profoundly damaged plants incapable of living on their own. Every food plant is a pathetic narrow specialist in one skill, inbred for thousands of years to a state of genetic idiocy. Those plants are so fragile, they had to domesticate humans just to take endless care of them. 7. A second realization of the ecomodernist movement is that industrialization has been good for humanity. 8. It has fed billions, doubled lifespans, slashed extreme poverty, and by replacing muscle with machinery, made it easier to end slavery, emancipate women, and educate children chapters 7, 15, and 17. It has allowed people to read at night, live where they want, stay warm in winter, see the world, and multiply human contact. Any costs in pollution and habitat loss have to be weighed against these gifts. As The Economist Robert Frank has put it, there is an optimal amount of pollution in the environment, just as there is an optimal amount of dirt in your house. 
Cleaner is better, but not at the expense of everything else in life. The third premise is that the trade-off that pits human well-being against environmental damage can be renegotiated by technology. How to enjoy more calories, lumens, BTUs, bits, and miles with less pollution and land is itself a technological problem, and one that the world is increasingly solving. Economists speak of the environmental Kuznets curve, a counterpart to the U-shaped arc for inequality as a function of economic growth. As countries first develop, they prioritize growth over environmental purity. But as they get richer, their thoughts turn to the environment. Point nine: If people can afford electricity only at the cost of some smog, they'll live with the smog. But when they can afford both electricity and clean air, they'll spring for the clean air. This can happen all the faster as technology makes cars and factories and power plants cleaner, and thus makes clean air more affordable. Economic growth bends the environmental Kuznets curve by advances not just in technology but in values. Some environmental concerns are entirely practical. People complain about smog in their city, or green space getting paved over. But other concerns are more spiritual. The fate of the black rhinoceros and the well-being of our descendants in the year 2525 are significant moral concerns, but worrying about them now is something of a luxury. As societies get richer and people no longer think about putting food on the table or a roof over their heads, their values climb a hierarchy of needs, and the scope of their concern expands in space and time. Ronald Inglehart and Christian Welzel, using data from the World Values Survey, have found that people with stronger emancipative values, tolerance, equality, freedom of thought and speech, which tend to go with affluence and education, are also more likely to recycle and to pressure governments and businesses into protecting the environment. Point one zero. Eco-pessimists commonly dismiss this entire way of thinking as the faith that technology will save us. In fact it is a skepticism that the status quo will doom us, that knowledge will be frozen in its current state and people will robotically persist in their current behavior regardless of circumstances. Indeed, a naive faith in stasis has repeatedly led to prophecies of environmental doomsdays that never happened. The first is the population bomb, which, as we saw in Chapter 7, diffused itself. When countries get richer and better educated, they pass through what demographers call the demographic transition. Point one one. First, death rates decline as nutrition and health improve. This does swell the population, but that is hardly something to bewail. As Johann Norberg notes, it happens not because people in poor countries start breeding like rabbits but because they stop dying like flies. In any case, the increase is temporary, birth rates peak and then decline, for at least two reasons. Parents no longer breed large broods as insurance against some of their children dying, and women, when they become better educated, marry later and delay having children. Figure 10 to 1 shows that the world population growth rate peaked at 2.1% a year in 1962, fell to 1.2% 1 by 2010, and will probably fall to less than 0.5% by 2050 and be close to zero around 2070, when the population is projected to level off and then decline. Fertility rates have fallen most noticeably in developed regions like Europe and Japan, but they can suddenly collapse, often to demographers surprise, in other parts of the world. Despite the widespread belief that Muslim societies are resistant to the social changes that have transformed the West and will be indefinitely rocked by youth quakes, Muslim countries have seen a 40% decline in fertility over the past three decades, including a 70% drop in Iran and 60% drops in Bangladesh and in seven Arab countries. Point one two. Figure 10 to 1. Population and population growth, 1750-2015 and projected to 2100. Sources. Our World in Data, Ortiz Ospina and Rosa 2016D. 
1750-2015, United Nations Population Division and History Database of the Global Environment Hyde PBL Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency undated. Post-2015 Projections, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis Medium projection aggregate of country specific estimates, taking education into account. Lutz, Butts, and Samir 2014. The other scare from the 1960s was that the world would run out of resources. But resources just refused to run out. The 1980s came and went without the famines that were supposed to starve tens of millions of Americans and billions of people worldwide. Then the year 1992 passed and, contrary to projections from the 1972 bestseller The Limits to Growth and similar philippics, the world did not exhaust its aluminum, copper, chromium, gold, nickel, tin, tungsten, or zinc. In 1980 Paul Ehrlich famously bet the economist Julian Simon that five of these metals would become scarcer and hence more expensive by the end of the decade. He lost all five bets. Indeed, most metals and minerals are cheaper today than they were in 1960. 13. From the 1970s to the early 2000s news magazines periodically illustrated cover stories on the world's oil supply with a gas gauge pointing to empty. In 2013 The Atlantic ran a cover story about the fracking revolution entitled, We Will Never Run Out of Oil. And then there are rare earths like yttrium, scandium, europium, and lanthanum, which you may remember from the periodic table in your chemistry classroom or from the Tom Lehrer song, The Elements. These metals are a critical component of magnets, fluorescent lights, video screens, catalysts, lasers, capacitors, optical glass, and other high-tech applications. When they started running out, we were warned, there would be critical shortages, a collapse of the technology industry, and perhaps war with China, the source of 95% of the world's supply. That's what led to the great European crisis of the late 20th century, when the world ran out of the critical ingredient in the red phosphor dots in the cathode ray tubes in color televisions and computer monitors and society was divided between the haves, who hoarded the last working color TVs, and the angry have-nots, who were forced to make do with black and white. What? You never heard of it? Among the reasons there was no such crisis was that cathode ray tubes were superseded by liquid crystal displays made of common elements.14. And the rare earths war. In reality, when China squeezed its exports in 2010 not because of shortages but as a geopolitical and mercantilist weapon, other countries started extracting rare earths from their own mines recycling them from industrial waste, and re-engineering products so they no longer needed them. Point one five. When predictions of apocalyptic resource shortages repeatedly fail to come true, one has to conclude either that humanity has miraculously escaped from certain death again and again like a Hollywood action hero or that there is a flaw in the thinking that predicts apocalyptic resource shortages. The flaw has been pointed out many times. Point one six. Humanity does not suck resources from the earth like a straw in a milkshake until a gurgle tells it that the container is empty. Instead, as the most easily extracted supply of a resource becomes scarcer, its price rises, encouraging people to conserve it, get at the less accessible deposits, or find cheaper and more plentiful substitutes. Indeed, it's a fallacy to think that people need resources in the first place. Point one seven. They need ways of growing food, moving around, lighting their homes, displaying information, and other sources of well-being. They satisfy these needs with ideas, with recipes, formulas, techniques, blueprints, and algorithms for manipulating the physical world to give them what they want. The human mind, with its recursive combinatorial power, can explore an infinite space of ideas, and is not limited by the quantity of any particular kind of stuff in the ground. When one idea no longer works, another can take its place. This doesn't defy the laws of probability but obeys them.
Why should the laws of nature have allowed exactly one physically possible way of satisfying a human desire, no more and no less? 18. Admittedly, this way of thinking does not sit well with the ethic of sustainability. In Figure 10 2, the cartoonist Randall Munro illustrates what's wrong with this vogue word and sacred value. The doctrine of sustainability assumes that the current rate of use of a resource may be extrapolated into the future until it rams into a ceiling. The implication is that we must switch to a renewable resource that can be replenished at the rate we use it, indefinitely. In reality, societies have always abandoned a resource for a better one long before the old one was exhausted. It's often said that the Stone Age did not end because the world ran out of stones, and that has been true of energy as well. Plenty of wood and hay remain to be exploited when the world shifted to coal, or Zubel notes. Coal abounded when oil rose. Oil abounds now as methane, natural gas rises. 19. As we will see, gas in turn may be replaced by energy sources still lower in carbon well before the last cubic foot goes up in a blue flame. Figure 10 to 2. Sustainability, 1955-2109. Source. Randall Munro, XKCD. Credit. Randall Munro, XKCD.com. The supply of food. 2 has grown exponentially, as we saw in Chapter 7, even though no single method of growing it has ever been sustainable. In The Big Ratchet, How Humanity Thrives in the Face of Natural Crisis, the geographer Ruth de Vries describes the sequences, ratchet hatchet pivot. People discover a way of growing more food, and the population ratchets upward. The method fails to keep up with the demand or develops unpleasant side effects, and the hatchet falls. People then pivot to a new method. At various times, farmers have pivoted to slash and burn horticulture, night soil, a euphemism for human feces, crop rotation, guano, saltpeter, ground up bison bones, chemical fertilizer, hybrid crops, pesticides, and the Green Revolution.20. Future pivots may include genetically modified organisms, hydroponics, aeroponics, urban vertical farms, robotic harvesting, meat cultured in vitro, artificial intelligence algorithms fed by GPS and biosensors, the recovery of energy and fertilizer from sewage, aquaculture with fish that eat tofu instead of other fish, and who knows what else, as long as people are allowed to indulge their ingenuity.21. Though water is one resource that people will never pivot away from, farmers could save massive amounts if they switch to Israeli-style precision farming. And if the world develops abundant carbon-free energy sources, a topic we will explore later, it could get what it needs by desalinating seawater.22. Not only have the disasters prophesied by 1970s greenism failed to take place, but improvements that it deemed impossible have taken place. As the world has gotten richer and crested the environmental curve, nature has begun to rebound. Point two three. Pope Francis's immense pile of filth is the vision of someone who has woken up thinking it's 1965, the era of belching smokestacks, waterfalls of sewage, rivers catching fire, and jokes about New Yorkers not liking to breathe air they can't see. Figure 10 to 3 shows that since 1970, when the Environmental Protection Agency was established, the United States has slashed its emissions of five air pollutants by almost two thirds. Over the same period, the population grew by more than 40%, and those people drove twice as many miles and became two and a half times richer. Energy use has leveled off, and even carbon dioxide emissions have turned a corner, a point to which we will return. The declines don't just reflect an offshoring of heavy industry to the developing world, because the bulk of energy use and emissions comes from transportation, heating, and electricity generation, which cannot be outsourced. Rather, they mainly reflect gains in efficiency and emission control.
These diverging curves refute both the orthodox green claim that only degrowth can curb pollution and the orthodox right-wing claim that environmental protection must sabotage economic growth and people's standard of living. Figure 10–3, Pollution, Energy, and Growth, U.S., 1970–2015. Sources U.S. Environmental Protection Agency 2016, based on the following sources. GDP, Bureau of Economic Analysis. Vehicle miles traveled. Federal Highway Administration. Population. U.S. Census Bureau. Energy consumption. U.S. Department of Energy. CO2. U.S. Greenhouse Gas Inventory Report. Emissions carbon monoxide, oxides of nitrogen, particulate matter smaller than 10 micrometers, sulfur dioxide, and volatile organic compounds, EPA. Many of the improvements can be seen with the naked eye. Cities are less often shrouded in purple-brown haze, and London no longer has the fog, actually coal smoke, that was immortalized in Impressionist paintings, Gothic novels, the Gershwin Song, and the brand of raincoats. Urban waterways that had been left for dead, including Puget Sound, Chesapeake Bay, Boston Harbor, Lake Erie, and the Hudson, Potomac, Chicago, Charles, Seine, Rhine, and Thames Rivers, the last described by Disraeli as a Stygian pool reeking with ineffable and intolerable horrors, have been recolonized by fish, birds, marine mammals, and sometimes swimmers. Suburbanites are seeing wolves, foxes, bears, bobcats, badgers, deer, ospreys, wild turkeys, and bald eagles. As agriculture becomes more efficient Chapter 7 farmland returns to temperate forest, as any hiker knows who has stumbled upon a stone wall incongruously running through a New England woodland. Though tropical forests are still, alarmingly, being cut down, between the middle of the 20th century and the turn of the 21st the rate fell by two-thirds figure 10 to 4.24. Deforestation of the world's largest tropical forest, the Amazon, peaked in 1995, and from 2004 to 2013 the rate fell by four-fifths.25. The time-lagged decline of deforestation in the tropics is one sign that environmental protection is spreading from developed countries to the rest of the world. The world's progress can be tracked in a report card called the Environmental Performance Index, a composite of indicators of the quality of air, water, forests, fisheries, farms, and natural habitats. Out of 180 countries that have been tracked for a decade or more, all but two show an improvement. 26. The wealthier the country, on average, the cleaner its environment, the Nordic countries were cleanest. Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and several sub Saharan African countries, the most compromised. Two of the deadliest forms of pollution, contaminated drinking water and indoor cooking smoke, are afflictions of poor countries. 27. But as poor countries have gotten richer in recent decades, they are escaping these blights. The proportion of the world's population that drinks tainted water has fallen by five-eighths, the proportion breathing cooking smoke by a third. 28. As Indira Gandhi said, poverty is the greatest polluter. 29. Figure 10 to 4. Deforestation, 1700 2010. Source. United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization 2012, p. 9. The epitome of environmental insults is the oil spill from tanker ships, which coats pristine beaches with toxic black sludge and fouls the plumage of seabirds and the fur of otters and seals. The most notorious accidents, such as the breakup of the Torrey Canyon in 1967 and the Exxon Valdez in 1989, linger in our collective memory, and few people are aware that seaborne oil transport has become vastly safer. Figure 10 to 5 shows that the annual number of oil spills has fallen from more than 100 in 1973 to just 5 in 2016, and the number of major spills fell from 32 in 1978 to 1 in 2016. 
The graph also shows that even as less oil was spilled, more oil was shipped. The crossing curves provide additional evidence that environmental protection is compatible with economic growth. It's no mystery that oil companies should want to reduce tanker accidents, because their interests and those of the environment coincide. Oil spills are a public relations disaster, especially when the name of the company is emblazoned on a cracked up ship, bring on huge fines, and of course waste valuable oil. More interesting is the fact that the companies have largely succeeded. Technologies follow a learning curve and become less hazardous over time as the boffins design out the most dangerous vulnerabilities, a point we'll return to in Chapter 12. But people remember the accidents and are unaware of the incremental improvements. The improvements in different technologies unfold on different timetables. In 2010, when seaborne oil spills had fallen to an all-time low, the third worst spill from stationary rigs took place. The Deepwater Horizon accident in the Gulf of Mexico led in turn to new regulations for blowout preventers, well design, monitoring, and containment. Point three zero. Figure 10 to 5. Oil spills, 1970-2016. Source. Our World in Data, Rosa 2016R, based on data, updated, from the International Tanker Owners Pollution Federation. Oil spills include all those that result in the loss of at least 7 metric tons of oil. Oil shipped consists of, total crude oil, petroleum product, and gas loaded. In another advance, entire swaths of land and ocean have been protected from human use altogether. Conservation experts are unanimous in their assessment that the protected areas are still inadequate, but the momentum is impressive. Figure 10 to 6 shows that the proportion of the Earth's land set aside as national parks, wildlife reserves, and other protected areas has grown from 8.2% in 1990 to 14.8% in 2014, an area double the size of the United States. Marine conservation areas have grown as well, more than doubling during this period and now protecting more than 12% of the world's oceans. Figure 10 to 6, Protected Areas, 1990-2014. Source. World Bank 2016 H in 2017, based on data from the United Nations Environment Program and the World Conservation Monitoring Center, compiled by the World Resources Institute. Thanks to habitat protection and targeted conservation efforts, many beloved species have been pulled from the brink of extinction including albatrosses, condors, manatees, oryxes, pandas, rhinoceroses, Tasmanian devils, and tigers. According to the ecologist Stuart Pym, the overall rate of extinctions has been reduced by 75%.31. Though many species remain in precarious straits, a number of ecologists and paleontologists believe that the claim that humans are causing a mass extinction like the Permian and Cretaceous is hyperbolic. As Brand notes, no end of specific wildlife problems remain to be solved, but describing them too often as extinction crises has led to a general panic that nature is extremely fragile or already hopelessly broken. That is not remotely the case. Nature as a whole is exactly as robust as it ever was, maybe more so. Working with that robustness is how conservation's goals get reached. 32. Other improvements are global in scope. The 1963 treaty banning atmospheric nuclear testing eliminated the most terrifying form of pollution of all, radioactive fallout, and proved that the world's nations could agree on measures to protect the planet even in the absence of a world government. Global cooperation has dealt with several other challenges since. International treaties on the reduction of sulfur emissions and other forms of long-range transboundary air pollution, signed in the 1980s and 1990s have helped to eliminate the scare of acid rain. Point three three. Thanks to the 1987 ban on chlorofluorocarbons ratified by 197 countries, the ozone layer is expected to heal by the middle of the 21st century. Point three four. 
These successes, as we will see, set the stage for the historic Paris Agreement on Climate Change in 2015. Like all demonstrations of progress, reports on the improving state of the environment are often met with a combination of anger and illogic. The fact that many measures of environmental quality are improving does not mean that everything is okay, that the environment got better by itself, or that we can just sit back and relax. For the cleaner environment we enjoy today we must thank the arguments, activism, legislation, regulations, treaties, and technological ingenuity of the people who sought to improve it in the past. Point three five. We'll need more of each to sustain the progress we've made, prevent reversals particularly under the Trump presidency and extend it to the wicked problems that still face us, such as the health of the oceans and, as we shall see, atmospheric greenhouse gases. But for many reasons, it's time to retire the morality play in which modern humans are a vile race of despoilers and plunderers who will hasten the apocalypse unless they undo the industrial revolution, renounce technology, and return to an ascetic harmony with nature. Instead, we can treat environmental protection as a problem to be solved. How can people live safe, comfortable, and stimulating lives with the least possible pollution and loss of natural habitats? Far from licensing complacency, our progress so far at solving this problem emboldens us to strive for more. It also points to the forces that pushed this progress along. One key is to decouple productivity from resources, to get more human benefit from less matter and energy. This puts a premium on density. Point three six. As agriculture becomes more intensive by growing crops that are bred or engineered to produce more protein, calories, and fiber with less land, water, and fertilizer, farmland is spared, and it can morph back to natural habitats. Ecomodernists point out that organic farming, which needs far more land to produce a kilogram of food, is neither green nor sustainable. As people move to cities, they not only free up land in the countryside but need fewer resources for commuting, building, and heating, because one man's ceiling is another man's floor. As trees are harvested from dense plantations, which have five to ten times the yield of natural forests, forest land is spared, together with its feathered, furry, and scaly inhabitants. All these processes are helped along by another friend of the Earth, dematerialization. Progress in technology allows us to do more with less. An aluminum soda can use to weigh three ounces, today it weighs less than half an ounce. Mobile phones don't need miles of telephone poles and wires. The digital revolution, by replacing atoms with bits, is dematerializing the world in front of our eyes. The cubic yards of vinyl that used to be my music collection gave way to cubic inches of compact discs and then to the nothingness of MP3s. The river of newsprint flowing through my apartment has been stanched by an iPad. With a terabyte of storage on my laptop I no longer buy paper by the ten ream box. And just think of all the plastic, metal, and paper that no longer go into the 40-odd consumer products that can be replaced by a single smartphone, including a telephone, answering machine, phone book, camera, camcorder, tape recorder, radio, alarm clock, calculator, dictionary, Rolodex, calendar, street maps, flashlight, fax, and compass, even a metronome outdoor thermometer, and spirit level. Digital technology is also dematerializing the world by enabling the sharing economy, so that cars, tools, and bedrooms needn't be made in huge numbers that sit around unused most of the time. The advertising analyst Rory Sutherland has noted that dematerialization is also being helped along by changes in the criteria of social status. Point three seven. The most expensive London real estate today would have seemed impossibly cramped to wealthy Victorians, but the city centre is now more fashionable than the suburbs. Social media have encouraged younger people to show off their experiences rather than their cars and wardrobes, 
and hipsterization leads them to distinguish themselves by their tastes in beer, coffee, and music. The era of the Beach Boys and American graffiti is over. Half of American 18-year-olds do not have a driver's license. Point three eight. The expression, peak oil, which became popular after the energy crises of the 1970s, refers to the year that the world would reach its maximum extraction of petroleum. Orzubel notes that because of the demographic transition, densification, and dematerialization, we may have reached peak children, peak farmland, peak timber, peak paper, and peak car. Indeed, we may be reaching peak stuff. Of a hundred commodities Orzubel plotted, 36 have peaked in absolute use in the United States, and another 53 may be poised to drop, including water, nitrogen, and electricity, leaving only 11 that are still growing. Britons, too, have reached peak stuff, having reduced their annual use of material from 15.1 metric tons per person in 2001 to 10.3 metric tons in 2013.39. These remarkable trends required no coercion, legislation, or moralization. They spontaneously unfolded as people made choices about how to live their lives. The trends certainly don't show that environmental legislation is dispensable. By all accounts, environmental protection agencies, mandated energy standards, endangered species protection, and national and international clean air and water acts have had enormously beneficial effects. Point for zero. But they suggest that the tide of modernity does not sweep humanity headlong toward ever more unsustainable use of resources. Something in the nature of technology, particularly information technology, works to decouple human flourishing from the exploitation of physical stuff. Just as we must not accept the narrative that humanity inexorably despoils every part of the environment, we must not accept the narrative that every part of the environment will rebound under our current practices. An enlightened environmentalism must face the facts, hopeful or alarming, and one set of facts is unquestionably alarming. The effect of greenhouse gases on the Earth's climate point for one. Whenever we burn wood, coal, oil, or gas, the carbon in the fuel is oxidized to form carbon dioxide CO2, which wafts into the atmosphere. Though some of the CO2 dissolves in the ocean, chemically combines with rocks, or is taken up by photosynthesizing plants, these natural sinks cannot keep up with the 38 billion tons we dump into the atmosphere each year. As gigatons of carbon laid down during the Carboniferous period have gone up in smoke, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere has risen from about 270 parts per million before the Industrial Revolution to more than 400 parts today. Since CO2, like the glass in a greenhouse, traps heat radiating from the Earth's surface, the global average temperature has risen as well, by about 0.8 degrees Celsius 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit, and 2016 was the hottest year on record, with 2015 coming in second and 2014 coming in third. The atmosphere has also been warmed by the clearing of carbon-eating forests and by the release of methane, an even more potent greenhouse gas, from leaky gas wells, melting permafrost, and the orifices at both ends of cattle. It could become warmer still in a runaway feedback loop if white, heat-reflecting snow and ice are replaced by dark, heat-absorbing land and water, if the melting of permafrost accelerates, and if more water vapor, yet another greenhouse gas, is sent into the air. If the emission of greenhouse gases continues, the Earth's average temperature will rise to at least 1.5 degrees Celsius 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, above the pre-industrial level by the end of the 21st century, and perhaps to 4 degrees Celsius 7.2 degrees Fahrenheit, above that level or more. That will cause more frequent and more severe heat waves, more floods in wet regions, more droughts in dry regions, heavier storms, more severe hurricanes, lower crop yields in warm regions, the extinction of more species, the loss of coral reefs because the oceans will be both warmer and more acidic, 
and an average rise in sea level of between 0.7 and 1.2 meters (2 and 4 feet) from both the melting of land ice and the expansion of seawater. Sea level has already risen almost 8 inches since 1870, and the rate of the rise appears to be accelerating. Low-lying areas would be flooded. Island nations would disappear beneath the waves, large stretches of farmland would no longer be arable, and millions of people would be displaced. The effects could get still worse in the 22nd century and beyond, and in theory could trigger upheavals such as a diversion of the Gulf Stream, which would turn Europe into Siberia, or a collapse of Antarctic ice sheets. A rise of 2 degrees Celsius is considered the most that the world could reasonably adapt to, and a rise of 4 degrees Celsius, in the words of a 2012 World Bank report, simply must not be allowed to occur. 42. To keep the rise to 2 degrees Celsius or less, the world would, at a minimum, have to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by half or more by the middle of the 21st century and eliminate them altogether before the turn of the 22nd.43. The challenge is daunting. Fossil fuels provide 86% of the world's energy, powering almost every car, truck, train, plane, ship, tractor, furnace, and factory on the planet, together with most of its electricity plants.44. Humanity has never faced a problem like it. One response to the prospect of climate change is to deny that it is occurring or that human activity is the cause. It's completely appropriate, of course, to challenge the hypothesis of anthropogenic climate change on scientific grounds, particularly given the extreme measures it calls for if it is true. The great virtue of science is that a true hypothesis will, in the long run, withstand attempts to falsify it. Anthropogenic climate change is the most vigorously challenged scientific hypothesis in history. By now, all the major challenges, such as that global temperatures have stopped rising, that they only seem to be rising because they were measured in urban heat islands, or that they really are rising but only because the sun is getting hotter, have been refuted, and even many skeptics have been convinced. Point four five. A recent survey found that exactly 4 out of 69,406 authors of peer-reviewed articles in the scientific literature rejected the hypothesis of anthropogenic global warming, and that the peer-reviewed literature contains no convincing evidence against the hypothesis. 46. Nonetheless, a movement within the American political right, heavily underwritten by fossil fuel interests, has prosecuted a fanatical and mendacious campaign to deny that greenhouse gases are warming the planet. Point four seven. In doing so they have advanced the conspiracy theory that the scientific community is fatally infected with political correctness and ideologically committed to a government takeover of the economy. As someone who considers himself something of a watchdog for politically correct dogma in academia, I can state that this is nonsense, physical scientists have no such agenda, and the evidence speaks for itself. Point four eight. And it's precisely because of challenges like this that scholars in all fields have a duty to secure the credibility of the academy by not enforcing political orthodoxies. To be sure, there are judicious climate change skeptics, sometimes called lukewarmers, who accept the mainstream science but accentuate the positive point for nine. They favor the fringe of the envelope of possibilities with the slowest temperature rise. Note that the worst case scenarios with runaway feedback are hypothetical, point out that moderately higher temperatures and CO2 have benefits in crop yields that should be traded off against their costs, and argue that if countries are allowed to get as rich as possible without growth sapping restrictions on fossil fuels, they will be better equipped to adapt to the climate change that does occur. But as the economist William Nordhorst points out, this is a rash gamble in what he calls the climate casino.50.
If the status quo presents, say, an even chance that the world will get significantly worse, and a 5% chance that it will pass a tipping point and face a catastrophe, it would be prudent to take preventive action even if the catastrophic outcome is not certain, just as we buy fire extinguishers and insurance for our houses and don't keep open cans of gasoline in our garages. Since dealing with climate change will be a multi-decade effort, there's plenty of time to back off if temperature, sea level, and ocean acidity happily stop rising. Another response to climate change, from the far left, seems designed to vindicate the conspiracy theories of the far right. According to the Climate Justice movement popularized by the journalist Naomi Klein in her 2014 bestseller This Changes Everything, Capitalism vs. the Climate, we should not treat the threat of climate change as a challenge to prevent climate change. No. We should treat it as an opportunity to abolish free markets, restructure the global economy, and remake our political system. Point five one. In one of the more surreal episodes in the history of environmental politics, Klein joined the infamous David and Charles Koch, the billionaire oil industrialists and bankrollers of climate change denial, in helping to defeat a 2016 Washington state ballot initiative that would have implemented the country's first carbon tax, the policy measure which almost every analyst endorses as a prerequisite to dealing with climate change. Point five two. Why? Because the measure was right-wing friendly, and it did not make the polluters pay, and put their immoral profits to work repairing the damage they have knowingly created. In a 2015 interview Klein even opposed analyzing climate change quantitatively. We're not going to win this as bean counters. We can't beat the bean counters at their own game. We're going to win this because this is an issue of values, human rights, right and wrong. We just have this brief period where we also have to have some nice stats that we can wield, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that what actually moves people's hearts are the arguments based on the value of life. Point five three. Blowing off quantitative analysis as being counting is not just anti-intellectual but works against values, human rights, right and wrong. Someone who values human life will favor the policies that have the greatest chance of saving people from being displaced or starved while furnishing them with the means to live healthy and fulfilled lives. Point five four. In a universe governed by the laws of nature rather than magic and deviltry, that requires bean counting. Even when it comes to the purely rhetorical challenge of moving people's hearts, efficacy matters, people are likelier to accept the fact of global warming when they are told that the problem is solvable by innovations in policy and technology than when they are given dire warnings about how awful it will be. Point five five. Another common sentiment about how to prevent climate change is expressed in this letter, of a kind I receive every now and again. Dear Professor Pinker, we need to do something about global warming. Why don't the Nobel Prize winning scientists sign a petition? Why don't they tell the blunt truth, that the politicians are pigs who don't care how many people get killed in floods and droughts? Why don't you and some friends start a movement on the internet to get people to sign a pledge that they will make real sacrifices to fight global warming? Because that's the problem. Nobody wants to make any sacrifices. People should pledge to never fly in airplanes except in dire emergencies, because airplanes burn so much fuel. People should pledge to eat no meat on at least three days per week, because meat production adds so much carbon to the atmosphere. People should pledge to buy no jewelry, ever, because refining gold and silver is so energy intensive. We should abolish artistic pottery, because it burns so much carbon. The potters in university art departments are just going to have to accept the fact that we can't go on like this. Forgive the bean counting, but even if everyone gave up their jewelry, it would not make a scratch in the world's emission of greenhouse gases, which are dominated by heavy industry 29% buildings, 18% transport, 15% land use change, 15%, and the energy needed to supply energy 13%.
Livestock is responsible for 5.5%, mostly methane rather than CO2, and aviation for 1.5%. 56. Of course my correspondent suggested foregoing jewellery and pottery not because of the effect but because of the sacrifice, and it's no surprise that she singled out jewellery, the quintessential luxury. I bring up her ingenuous suggestion to illustrate two psychological impediments we face in dealing with climate change. The first is cognitive. People have trouble thinking in scale. They don't differentiate among actions that would reduce CO2 emissions by thousands of tons, millions of tons, and billions of tons. 57. Nor do they distinguish among level, rate, acceleration, and higher order derivatives, between actions that would affect the rate of increase in CO2 emissions, affect the rate of CO2 emissions, affect the level of CO2 in the atmosphere, and affect global temperatures which will rise even if the level of CO2 remains constant. Only the last of these matters, but if one doesn't think in scale and in orders of change, one can be satisfied with policies that accomplish nothing. The other impediment is moralistic. As I mentioned in Chapter 2, the human moral sense is not particularly moral, it encourages dehumanization politicians are pigs, and punitive aggression make the polluters pay. Also, by conflating profligacy with evil and asceticism with virtue, the moral sense can sanctify pointless displays of sacrifice. 58. In many cultures people flaunt their righteousness with vows of fasting, chastity, self-abnegation, bonfires of the vanities, and animal, or sometimes human, sacrifice. Even in modern societies, according to studies I've done with the psychologists Jason Mimiro, Max Grasno, and Rhea Howard, people esteem others according to how much time or money they forfeit in their altruistic acts rather than by how much good they accomplish. 59. Much of the public chatter about mitigating climate change involves voluntary sacrifices like recycling, reducing food miles, unplugging charges, and so on. I myself have posed for posters in several of these campaigns led by Harvard students. 60. But however virtuous these displays may feel, they are a distraction from the gargantuan challenge facing us. The problem is that carbon emissions are a classic public goods game, also known as a tragedy of the commons. People benefit from everyone else's sacrifices and suffer from their own, so everyone has an incentive to be a free rider and let everyone else make the sacrifice, and everyone suffers. A standard remedy for public goods dilemmas is a coercive authority that can punish free riders. But any government with the totalitarian power to abolish artistic pottery is unlikely to restrict that power to maximizing the common good. One can, alternatively, daydream that moral suasion is potent enough to induce everyone to make the necessary sacrifices. But while humans do have public sentiments, it's unwise to let the fate of the planet hinge on the hope that billions of people will simultaneously volunteer to act against their interests. Most important, the sacrifice needed to bring carbon emissions down by half and then to zero is far greater than foregoing jewelry. It would require foregoing electricity, heating, cement, steel, paper, travel, and affordable food and clothing. Climate justice warriors, indulging the fantasy that the developing world will do just that, advocate a regime of sustainable development. As Schellenberger and Ted Nordhorst satirize it, that consists of small co ops in the Amazon forest where peasant farmers and Indians would pick nuts and berries to sell to Ben and Jerry's for their rainforest crunch flavor. 61. They would be allowed solar panels that could light an LED or charge a cell phone, but nothing more. Needless to say, the people who actually live in those countries have a different idea. Escaping from poverty requires abundant energy. The proprietor of human progress, Marion Tupi, points out that in 1962 Botswana and Burundi were equally destitute, with an annual per capita income of $70, and neither emitted much CO2. 
By 2010, Botswanans earned $7,650 a year, 32 times as much as the still poor Burundians, and they emitted 89 times as much CO2.62. Faced with such facts, climate justice warriors reply that rather than enriching poor nations, we should impoverish rich ones, switching back, for example, to labor-intensive agriculture, to which an appropriate reply is, you first. Schellenberger and Nordhaus note how far progressive politics has moved from the days in which rural electrification and economic development were among its signature projects. In the name of democracy it now offers the global poor not what they want, cheap electricity, but more of what they don't want, namely intermittent and expensive power. 63. Economic progress is an imperative in rich and poor countries alike precisely because it will be needed to adapt to the climate change that does occur. Thanks in good part to prosperity, humanity has been getting healthier chapters 5 and 6 better fed chapter 7 more peaceful chapter 11, and better protected from natural hazards and disasters chapter 12. These advances have made humanity more resilient to natural and human-made threats. Disease outbreaks don't become pandemics, crop failures in one region are alleviated by surpluses in another, local skirmishes are diffused before they erupt into war, populations are better protected against storms, floods, and droughts. Part of our response to climate change must be to ensure that these gains in resilience continue to outpace the threats that a warming planet will throw at it. Every year that developing countries get richer, they will have more resources for building seawalls and reservoirs, improving public health services, and moving people away from rising seas. For that reason they must not be kept in energy poverty, but neither does it make sense for them to raise incomes with massive coal burning that will overwhelm everyone later with weather disasters. Point six four. How, then, should we deal with climate change? Deal with it we must. I agree with Pope Francis and the climate justice warriors that preventing climate change is a moral issue because it has the potential to harm billions, particularly the world's poor. But morality is different from moralizing, and is often poorly served by it. The Pope's encyclical backfired, decreasing concern about climate change among the conservative Catholics who were aware of it. 65. It may be satisfying to demonize the fossil fuel corporations that sell us the energy we want, or to signal our virtue by making conspicuous sacrifices, but these indulgences won't prevent destructive climate change. The enlightened response to climate change is to figure out how to get the most energy with the least emission of greenhouse gases. There is, to be sure, a tragic view of modernity in which this is impossible. Industrial society, powered by flaming carbon, contains the fuel of its own destruction. But the tragic view is incorrect. Orzubel notes that the modern world has been progressively decarbonizing. The hydrocarbons in the stuff we burn are composed of hydrogen and carbon, which release energy as they combine with oxygen to form H2O and CO2. The oldest hydrocarbon fuel, dry wood, has a ratio of combustible carbon atoms to hydrogen atoms of about 10 to 1.66 The coal which replaced it during the Industrial Revolution has an average carbon to hydrogen ratio of 2 to 1.67 A petroleum fuel such as kerosene may have a ratio of 1 to 2. Natural gas is composed mainly of methane, whose chemical formula is CH4, with a ratio of 1 to 4.68 So as the industrial world climbed an energy ladder from wood to coal to oil to gas, the last transition accelerated in the 21st century by the abundance of shale gas from fracking. The ratio of carbon to hydrogen in its energy source steadily fell, and so did the amount of carbon that had to be burned to release a unit of energy, from 30 kg of carbon per gigajoule in 1850 to about 15 today. 69. Figure 10 to 7 shows that carbon emissions follow a Kuznets arc, 
when rich countries such as the United States and the United Kingdom first industrialized, they emitted more and more CO2 to produce a dollar of GDP, but they turned a corner in the 1950s and since then have been emitting less and less. China and India are following suit, cresting in the late 1970s and mid-1990s, respectively. China flew off the charts in the late 1950s because of Mao's boneheaded schemes like backyard iron smelters with copious emissions and zero economic output. Carbon intensity for the world as a whole has been declining for half a century. 0. Figure 10 to 7, carbon intensity CO2 emissions per dollar of GDP 1820-2014. Source Ritchie and Rosa 2017, based on data from the Carbon Dioxide Information Analysis Center. GDP is in 2011 international dollars. For the years before 1990, GDP comes from Madison Project 2014. Decarbonization is a natural consequence of people's preferences. Carbon blackens miners' lungs, endangers urban air, and threatens climate change, Orzubel explains. Hydrogen is as innocent as an element can be, ending combustion as water. 71. People want their energy dense and clean, and as they move into cities, they accept only electricity and gas, delivered right to their bedside and stovetop. Remarkably, this natural development has brought the world to peak coal and maybe even peak carbon. As figure 10 to 8 shows, global emissions plateaued from 2014 to 2015 and declined among the top three emitters, namely China, the European Union, and the United States. As we saw for the United States in figure 10 to 3, carbon emissions plateaued while prosperity rose. Between 2014 and 2016, the gross world product grew by 3% annually. 72. Some of the carbon was reduced by the growth of wind and solar power, but most of it, particularly in the United States, was reduced by the replacement of C137H9709 and S coal with CH4 gas. Figure 10 to 8, CO2 emissions, 1960-2015. Sources. Our World in Data, Ritchie and Rosa 2017 and, based on data from the Carbon Dioxide Information Analysis Center, and Le Courier et al. 2016. International Air and Sea, refers to aviation and sea transport, it corresponds to, bunker fuels, in the original sources. Other, refers to the difference between estimated global CO2 emissions and the sum of the regional and national totals, it corresponds to the statistical difference component. The long sweep of decarbonization shows that economic growth is not synonymous with burning carbon. Some optimists believe that if the trend is allowed to evolve into its next phase, from low-carbon natural gas to zero-carbon nuclear energy, a process abbreviated as N2N, the climate will have a soft landing. But only the sunniest believe this will happen by itself. Annual CO2 emissions may have leveled off for the time being at around 36 billion tons, but that's still a lot of CO2 added to the atmosphere every year, and there is no sign of the precipitous plunge we would need to stave off the harmful outcomes. Instead, decarbonization needs to be helped along with pushes from policy and technology, an idea called deep decarbonization.73. It begins with carbon pricing, charging people and companies for the damage they do when they dump their carbon into the atmosphere, either as a tax on carbon or as a national cap with tradable credits. Economists across the political spectrum endorse carbon pricing because it combines the unique advantages of governments and markets. 74. No one owns the atmosphere, so people, and companies, have no reason to stint on emissions that allow each of them to enjoy their energy while harming everyone else. A perverse outcome that economists call a negative externality, another name for the collective costs in a public goods game, or the damage to the commons in the tragedy of the commons. A carbon tax, which only governments can impose, internalizes, 
The public costs, forcing people to factor the harm into every carbon-emitting decision they make. Having billions of people decide how best to conserve, given their values and the information conveyed by prices, is bound to be more efficient and humane than having government analysts try to divine the optimal mixture from their desks. The potters don't have to hide their kilns from the carbon police, they can do their part in saving the planet by taking shorter showers, foregoing Sunday drives, and switching from beef to eggplant. Parents don't have to calculate whether diaper services, with their trucks and laundries, emit more carbon than the makers of disposable diapers, the difference will be folded into the prices, and each company has an incentive to lower its emissions to compete with the other. Inventors and entrepreneurs can take risks on carbon-free energy sources that would compete against fossil fuels on a level playing field rather than the tilted one we have now, in which the fossils get to spew their waste into the atmosphere for free. Without carbon pricing, fossil fuels, which are uniquely abundant, portable, and energy-dense, have too great an advantage over the alternatives. Carbon taxes, to be sure, hit the poor in a way that concerns the left, and they transfer money from the private to the public sector in a way that annoys the right. But these effects can be neutralized by adjusting sales, payroll, income, and other taxes and transfers. As Al Gore put it, tax what you burn, not what you earn. And if the tax starts slow and increases steeply and predictably over time, people can factor the increase into their long-term purchases and investments, and by favoring low-carbon technologies as they evolve, escape most of the tax altogether. 75. A second key to deep decarbonization brings up an inconvenient truth for the traditional green movement. Nuclear power is the world's most abundant and scalable carbon-free energy source. 76. Although renewable energy sources, particularly solar and wind, have become drastically cheaper, and their share of the world's energy has more than tripled in the past five years, that share is still a paltry 1.5%, and there are limits on how high it can go. 77. The wind is often becalmed, and the sun sets every night and may be clouded over. But people need energy around the clock, rain or shine. Batteries that could store and release large amounts of energy from renewables will help, but ones that could work on the scale of cities are years away. Also, wind and solar sprawl over vast acreage, defying the densification process that is friendliest to the environment. The energy analyst Robert Bryce estimates that simply keeping up with the world's increase in energy use would require turning an area the size of Germany into wind farms every year. 78. To satisfy the world's needs with renewables by 2050 would require tiling windmills and solar panels over an area the size of the United States, including Alaska plus Mexico, Central America, and the inhabited portion of Canada. 79. Nuclear energy, in contrast, represents the ultimate in density, because, in a nuclear reaction, E equals mc2, you get an immense amount of energy proportional to the speed of light squared, from a small bit of mass. Mining the uranium for nuclear energy leaves a far smaller environmental scar than mining coal, oil, or gas and the power plants themselves take up about one five hundredth of the land needed by wind or solar. 80. Nuclear energy is available around the clock, and it can be plugged into power grids that provide concentrated energy where it is needed. It has a lower carbon footprint than solar, hydro, and biomass, and it's safer than them, too. The 60 years with nuclear power have seen 31 deaths in the 1986 Chernobyl disaster, the result of extraordinary Soviet-era bungling, together with a few thousand early deaths from cancer above the 100,000 natural cancer deaths in the exposed population. 81. The other two famous accidents, at Three Mile Island in 1979 and Fukushima in 2011, killed no one. Yet vast numbers of people are killed day in, day out by the pollution from burning combustibles and by accidents in mining and transporting them, none of which make headlines. 
Compared with nuclear power, natural gas kills 38 times as many people per kilowatt hour of electricity generated, biomass 63 times as many, petroleum 243 times as many, and coal 387 times as many, perhaps a million deaths a year. 82. Nordhaus and Schellenberger summarized the calculations of an increasing number of climate scientists. There is no credible path to reducing global carbon emissions without an enormous expansion of nuclear power. It is the only low carbon technology we have today with the demonstrated capability to generate large quantities of centrally generated electric power. 83. The Deep Carbonization Pathways Project, a consortium of research teams that have worked out roadmaps for countries to reduce their emissions enough to meet the 2 degrees Celsius target, estimates that the United States will have to get between 30 and 60 percent of its electricity from nuclear power by 2050 1.5 to 3 times the current fraction, at the same time that it generates far more of that electricity to take over from fossil fuels in heating homes, powering vehicles, and producing steel, cement, and fertilizer. 84. In one scenario, this would require quadrupling its nuclear capacity. Similar expansions would be necessary in China, Russia, and other countries. 85. Unfortunately, the use of nuclear power has been shrinking just when it should be growing. In the United States, 11 nuclear reactors have recently been closed or are threatened with closure, which would cancel the entire carbon savings from the expanded use of solar and wind. Germany, which has relied on nuclear energy for much of its electricity, is shutting down its plants as well, increasing its carbon emissions from the coal-fired plants that replace them, and France and Japan may follow its lead. Why are Western countries going the wrong way? Nuclear power presses a number of psychological buttons, fear of poisoning, ease of imagining catastrophes, distrust of the unfamiliar and the man-made, and the dread has been amplified by the traditional green movement and its dubiously, progressive, supporters. 86. One commentator blames global warming on the Doobie Brothers, Bonnie Raitt, and the other rock stars whose 1979 No Nukes concert and film galvanized baby boomer sentiment against nuclear power. Sample lyrics of the closing anthem, Just give me the warm power of the sun. But won't you take all your atomic poison power away? 87 Some of the blame might go to Jane Fonda, Michael Douglas, and the producers of the 1979 disaster film The China Syndrome, so named because the melted-down nuclear reactor core would supposedly sink through the Earth's crust all the way to China, after making, an area the size of Pennsylvania, uninhabitable. In a devilish coincidence, the Three Mile Island plant in central Pennsylvania suffered its partial meltdown two weeks after the movie's release, creating widespread panic and making the very idea of nuclear power as radioactive as its uranium fuel. It's often said that with climate change, those who know the most are the most frightened, but with nuclear power, those who know the most are the least frightened. 88. As with oil tankers, cars, planes, buildings, and factories, Chapter 12, engineers have learned from the accidents and near misses and have progressively squeezed more safety out of nuclear reactors, reducing the risks of accidents and contamination far below those of fossil fuels. The advantage even extends to radioactivity, which is a natural property of the fly ash and flue gases emitted by burning coal. Still, nuclear power is expensive, mainly because it must clear crippling regulatory hurdles while its competitors have been given easy passage. Also, in the United States, nuclear power plants are now being built, after a lengthy hiatus, by private companies using idiosyncratic designs, so they have not climbed the engineer's learning curve and settled on the best practices in design, fabrication, and construction. Sweden, France, and South Korea, in contrast, have built standardized reactors by the dozen and now enjoy cheap electricity with substantially lower carbon emissions. 
As Ivan Selim, former commissioner of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, put it, the French have two kinds of reactors and hundreds of kinds of cheese, whereas in the United States the figures are reversed. 89. For nuclear power to play a transformative role in decarbonization it will eventually have to leap past the second-generation technology of light water reactors. The first generation consisted of prototypes from the 1950s and early 1960s. Soon to come online are a few generation 3 reactors, which evolved from the current designs with improvements in safety and efficiency but so far have been plagued by financial and construction snafus. Generation IV reactors comprise a half dozen new designs which promise to make nuclear plants a mass produced commodity rather than finicky limited editions. Point nine zero. One type might be cranked out on an assembly line like jet engines fitted into shipping containers, transported by rail, and installed on barges anchored offshore cities. This would allow them to clear the NIMBY hurdle, ride out storms or tsunamis, and be towed away at the end of their useful lives for decommissioning. Depending on the design, they could be buried and operated underground, cooled by inert gas or molten salt that needn't be pressurized refueled continuously with a stream of pebbles rather than shut down for the replacement of fuel rods, equipped to co-generate hydrogen the cleanest of fuels, and designed to shut themselves off without power or human intervention if they overheat. Some would be fueled by relatively abundant thorium, and others by uranium extracted from seawater, from dismantled nuclear weapons the ultimate beating of swords into plowshares, from the waste of existing reactors, or even from their own waste. The closest we will ever get to a perpetual motion machine, capable of powering the world for thousands of years. Even nuclear fusion, long derided as the energy source that is, 30 years away and always will be, really maybe 30 years away, or less, this time.91. The benefits of advanced nuclear energy are incalculable. Most climate change efforts call for policy reforms, such as carbon pricing, which remain contentious and will be hard to implement worldwide even in the rosiest scenarios. An energy source that is cheaper, denser, and cleaner than fossil fuels would sell itself requiring no Herculean political will or international cooperation. Point nine two. It would not just mitigate climate change but furnish manifold other gifts. People in the developing world could skip the middle rungs in the energy ladder, bringing their standard of living up to that of the West without choking on coal smoke. Affordable desalination of seawater, an energy ravenous process, could irrigate farms, supply drinking water, and, by reducing the need for both surface water and hydropower, allow dams to be dismantled, restoring the flow of rivers to lakes and seas and revivifying entire ecosystems. The team that brings clean and abundant energy to the world will benefit humanity more than all of history's saints, heroes, prophets, martyrs, and laureates combined. Breakthroughs in energy may come from startups founded by idealistic inventors, from the skunk works of energy companies, or from the vanity projects of tech billionaires, especially if they have a diversified portfolio of safe bets and crazy moonshots. Point nine three. But research and development will also need a boost from governments, because these global public goods are too great a risk with too little reward for private companies. Governments must play a role because, as Brand points out, infrastructure is one of the things we hire governments to handle, especially energy infrastructure, which requires no end of legislation, bonds, rights of way, regulations, subsidies, research, and public-private contracts with detailed oversight. 94. This includes a regulatory environment that is suited to 21st century challenges rather than to 1970s era technophobia and nuclear dread. Some fourth-generation nuclear technologies are shovel-ready, but a trust in regulatory green tape and may never see the light of day, at least not in the United States. 95. China, Russia, India, and Indonesia, which are hungry for energy, sick of smog, 
and free from American squeamishness and political gridlock, may take the lead. Whoever does it, and whichever fuel they use, the success of deep decarbonization will hinge on technological progress. Why assume that the know-how of 2018 is the best the world can do? Decarbonization will need breakthroughs not just in nuclear power but on other technological frontiers, batteries to store the intermittent energy from renewables, internet-like smart grids that distribute electricity from scattered sources to scattered users at scattered times, technologies that electrify and decarbonize industrial processes such as the production of cement, fertilizer, and steel, liquid biofuels for heavy trucks and planes that need dense, portable energy, and methods of capturing and storing CO2. The last of these is critical for a simple reason. Even if greenhouse gas emissions are halved by 2050 and zeroed by 2075, the world would still be on course for risky warming, because the CO2 already emitted will remain in the atmosphere for a very long time. It's not enough to stop thickening the greenhouse, at some point we have to dismantle it. The basic technology is more than a billion years old. Plants suck carbon out of the air as they use the energy in sunlight to combine CO2 with H2O and make sugars, like C6H12O6, cellulose, a chain of C6H1O5 units, and lignin, a chain of units like C10H1404, the latter two make up most of the biomass in wooden stems. The obvious way to remove CO2 from the air, then, is to recruit as many carbon-hungry plants as we can to help us. We can do this by encouraging the transition from deforestation to reforestation and afforestation planting new forests by reversing tillage and wetland destruction, and by restoring coastal and marine habitats. And to reduce the amount of carbon that returns to the atmosphere when dead plants rot, we could encourage building with wood and other plant products, or cook the biomass into non-rotting charcoal and bury it as a soil amendment called Bioca.96. Other ideas for carbon capture span a broad range of flakiness, at least by the standards of current technology. The more speculative end shades into geoengineering, and includes plans to disperse pulverized rock that takes up CO2 as it weathers, to add alkali to clouds or the oceans to dissolve more CO2 in water, and to fertilize the ocean with iron to accelerate photosynthesis by plankton.97. The more proven end consists of technologies that can scrub CO2 from the smokestacks of fossil fuel plants and pump it into nooks and crannies in the Earth's crust. Skimming the sparse 400 parts per million directly from the atmosphere is theoretically possible but prohibitively inefficient, though that could change if nuclear power became cheap enough. The technologies can be retrofitted into existing factories and power plants, and though they are themselves energy-hungry, they could slash carbon emissions from the vast energy infrastructure that is already in place resulting in so-called clean coal. The technologies can also be fitted onto gasification plants that convert coal into liquid fuels, which may still be needed for planes and heavy trucks. The geophysicist Daniel Schrag points out that the gasification process already has to separate CO2 from the gas stream, so sequestering that CO2 to protect the atmosphere is a modest incremental expense, and it would yield liquid fuel with a smaller carbon footprint than that of petroleum.98. Better still, if the coal feedstock is supplemented with biomass including grasses, agricultural waste, forest cuttings, municipal garbage, and perhaps someday genetically engineered plants or algae, it could be carbon neutral. Best of all, if the feedstock consisted exclusively of biomass, it would be carbon negative. The plants pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, and when their biomass is used for energy via combustion, fermentation, or gasification, the carbon capture process keeps it out. The combination, sometimes called BECCS, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, has been called climate change's savior technology.99. Will any of this happen? 
The obstacles are unnerving. They include the world's growing thirst for energy, the convenience of fossil fuels with their vast infrastructure, the denial of the problem by energy corporations and the political right, the hostility to technological solutions from traditional greens and the climate justice left, and the tragedy of the carbon commons. For all that, preventing climate change is an idea whose time has come. One indication is a trio of headlines that appeared in Time magazine within a three-week span in 2015. China shows it's serious about climate change, Walmart, McDonald's, and 79 others commit to fight global warming, and Americans' denial of climate change hits record low. In the same season the New York Times reported, poll finds global consensus on a need to tackle climate change. In all but one of the 40 countries surveyed Pakistan, a majority of respondents were in favor of limiting greenhouse gas emissions, including 69% of the Americans.100. The global consensus is not just hot air. In December 2015, 195 countries signed a historic agreement that committed them to keeping the global temperature rise to, well below, 2 degrees Celsius with a target of 1.5 degrees Celsius, and to setting aside $100 billion annually in climate mitigation financing for developing countries which had been a sticking point in prior, unsuccessful attempts at a global consensus.101. In October 2016, 115 of the signatories ratified the agreement, putting it into force. Most of the signatories submitted detailed plans on how they would pursue these goals through 2025, and all promised to update their plans every five years with stepped-up efforts. Without this ratcheting, the current plans are inadequate. They would allow the world's temperature to rise by 2.7 degrees Celsius, and would reduce the chance of a dangerous 4 degrees Celsius rise in 2100 by only 75%, which is still too close for comfort. But the public commitments, combined with contagious technological advances, could push the ratchet upward, in which case the Paris Agreement would substantially reduce the likelihood of a 2 degrees Celsius rise and essentially eliminate the possibility of a 4 degrees Celsius rise.102. This game plan faced a setback in 2017 when Donald Trump, who had notoriously called climate change a Chinese hoax, announced that the United States would withdraw from the agreement. Even if the withdrawal takes place in November 2020, the earliest possible date, the decarbonization driven by technology and economics will continue, and climate change policies will be advanced by cities, states, business and tech leaders, and the world's other countries, which have declared the deal, irreversible, and may pressure the United States to keep its word by imposing carbon tariffs on American exports and other sanctions.103. Even with fair winds and following seas, the effort needed to prevent climate change is immense, and we have no guarantee that the necessary transformations in technology and politics will be in place soon enough to slow down global warming before it causes extensive harm. This brings us to a last-ditch protective measure, lowering the world's temperature by reducing the amount of solar radiation that reaches the lower atmosphere and Earth's surface.104. A fleet of airplanes could spray a fine mist of sulfates, calcite, or nanoparticles into the stratosphere, spreading a thin veil that would reflect back just enough sunlight to prevent dangerous warming.105. This would mimic the effects of a volcanic eruption such as that of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, which spewed so much sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere that the planet cooled down by half a degree Celsius about one degree Fahrenheit, for two years. Or a fleet of cloud ships could spray a fine mist of seawater into the air. As the water evaporated, salt crystals would waft into the clouds and water vapor would condense around them, forming droplets that would widen the clouds and reflect more sunlight back into space. These measures are relatively inexpensive, require no exotic new technologies, and could bring global temperatures down quickly. 
Other ideas for manipulating the atmosphere and oceans have been bruited about as well, though research on all of them is in its infancy. The very idea of climate engineering sounds like the crazed scheme of a mad scientist, and it once was close to taboo. Critics see it as a Promethean folly that could have unintended consequences such as disrupting rainfall patterns and damaging the ozone layer. Since the effects of any measure applied to the entire planet are uneven from place to place, climate engineering raises the question of whose hand should be on the world's thermostat. As with a bickering couple, if one country lowered the temperature at the expense of another, it could set off a war. Once the world depended on climate engineering, then if for any reason it slacked off, temperatures in the carbon soaked atmosphere would soar far more quickly than people could adapt. The mere mention of an escape hatch for the climate crisis creates a moral hazard, tempting countries to shirk their duty to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the accumulated CO2 in the atmosphere would continue to dissolve in seawater, slowly turning the oceans into carbonic acid. For all these reasons, no responsible person could maintain that we can just keep pumping carbon into the air and slather sunscreen onto the stratosphere to compensate. But in a 2013 book the physicist David Keith makes a case for a form of climate engineering that is moderate, responsive, and temporary. Moderate, means that the amounts of sulfate or calcite would be just enough to reduce the rate of warming, not cancel it altogether. Moderation is a virtue because small manipulations are less likely to bring unwelcome surprises. Responsive, means that any manipulation would be careful, gradual, closely monitored, constantly adjusted, and, if indicated, halted altogether. And, temporary, means that the program would be designed only to give humanity breathing space until it eliminates greenhouse gas emissions and brings the CO2 in the atmosphere back to pre-industrial levels. In response to the fear that the world would become addicted to climate engineering forever, Keith remarks, is it plausible that we will not figure out how to pull, say, 5 gigatons of carbon per year out of the air by 2075? I don't buy it. 106. Though Keith is among the world's foremost climate engineers, he cannot be accused of being carried away by innovation thrill. A similarly thoughtful case may be found in the journalist Oliver Morton's 2015 book The Planet Remade, which presents the historical, political, and moral dimensions of climate engineering alongside the technical state of the art. Morton shows that humanity has been disrupting global cycles of water, nitrogen, and carbon for more than a century, so it's too late to preserve a primeval Earth system. And given the enormity of the climate change problem, it's unwise to assume we will solve it quickly or easily. Research into how we might minimize the harm to millions of people before the solutions are completely in place only seems prudent, and Morton lays out scenarios of how a program of moderate and temporary climate engineering might be implemented even in a world that falls short of ideal global governance. The legal scholar Dan Kahn has shown that far from creating a moral hazard, providing information about climate engineering makes people more concerned about climate change and less biased by their political ideology. 107. Despite a half century of panic, humanity is not on an irrevocable path to ecological suicide. The fear of resource shortages is misconceived. So is the misanthropic environmentalism that sees modern humans as vile despoilers of a pristine planet. An enlightened environmentalism recognizes that humans need to use energy to lift themselves out of the poverty to which entropy and evolution consign them. It seeks the means to do so with the least harm to the planet and the living world. History suggests that this modern, pragmatic, and humanistic environmentalism can work. As the world gets richer and more tech-savvy, it dematerializes, decarbonizes, and densifies, sparing land and species. As people get richer and better educated, they care more about the environment, figure out ways to protect it, and are better able to pay the costs. 
Many parts of the environment are rebounding, emboldening us to deal with the admittedly severe problems that remain. First among them is the emission of greenhouse gases and the threat they pose of dangerous climate change. People sometimes ask me whether I think that humanity will rise to the challenge or whether we will sit back and let disaster unfold. For what it's worth, I think we'll rise to the challenge, but it's vital to understand the nature of this optimism. The economist Paul Roma distinguishes between complacent optimism, the feeling of a child waiting for presents on Christmas morning, and conditional optimism, the feeling of a child who wants a treehouse and realizes that if he gets some wooden nails and persuades other kids to help him, he can build 1.108. We cannot be complacently optimistic about climate change, but we can be conditionally optimistic. We have some practicable ways to prevent the harms and we have the means to learn more. Problems are solvable. That does not mean that they will solve themselves, but it does mean that we can solve them if we sustain the benevolent forces of modernity that have allowed us to solve problems so far, including societal prosperity, wisely regulated markets, international governance, and investments in science and technology.